Do you mind having him send it to you? That'd be great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here nice and early. And um, we're excited to get started with our first session. My name is Amber Taylor, and I'm the moderator for, for this first session this morning. Um, we're going to get started, actually, with um, an opening prayer, and then I'll give a couple of announcements and introduce our presenters this morning, and we'll get going. Our prayer is going to be given by Hannah Young. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for our many blessings and for gathering here and for the conference organizers for all the work that they've put into making this uh, run successfully and smoothly. And we're grateful for our presenters as well for their preparation. Um, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you. Um, first, the first announcement is, is the most exciting announcement. It's that um, it starts with an unfortunate part, which is that Brett uh, Dowdle won't be able to be here today. Um, his wife very early this morning gave birth. Um, so we're very excited for him and, and, and very much congratulate him. Um, but <laughs> we were able to get a hold of him. Jordan, who is presenting, um, was able to get a hold of him and see if he could send him a, a copy of his paper. So assuming that that goes through all right, um, we'll have Jordan read his paper. We just won't be able to ask him uh, questions in the question and answer session. Um, so that's the first announcement. Second announcement. We're beginning the sessions with a prayer, but after, the, after this session, um, we're just going to go straight into the break, and then um, you can, uh, after the 15-minute break, go to whichever of the concurrent sessions you'd like to go to after that. So don't sit and wait in the awkward silence for a closing prayer. You can go ahead and, and go, grab your, um, go grab your break snacks and drinks and whatever else. All right, so let me... Um, Get started with some uh, information on our presenters this morning. We'll start with Jeff Turner, and he's a PhD candidate at the University of Utah studying immigration, religion, and, and the American West. He's also been active in the digital humanities and recently worked on two digital history projects, um, the Century of Black Mormons and Utah Historical Markers. In addition, he worked on a project called Native Places Atlas, which provides a digital map of Utah onto which native peoples can provide names um, for places. I think these are really cool projects. And uh, yeah, well done. Um, he will be presenting a paper called Polygamy, Religious Freedom, and Immigration Law. And in that paper, he looks at this question of um, religious freedom and, and immigration law through the experience of Herminia, am I saying that right? Herminia Walzer, um, when she came as a, as a convert to the church, um, at the border was asked the question about her uh, perspective on polygamy. It became an issue and, and her response to that. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, Brett, who isn't with us, <laughs> is, um, is a historian for the Joseph Smith Papers Project at the Church History Department, just across the street. He has been a volume editor on Joseph Smith Papers Documents Volume 11, or excuse me, 8, 11, and 15. He holds a PhD in American History from Texas Christian University and a BA and MA in History from Brigham Young University. He and his family live in Orem, Utah, his growing family. Um, and his paper, should we be so uh, honored to hear it, um, is uh, entitled um, Combating the Other Relic, Anti-Polygamy and the Formation of the Republican Party, 1854 to 1857, in which he um, explores the way that the Republican Party has been influenced by the question of um, combating uh, polygamy in the latter half of the 19th century. And then last but certainly not least, we'll have Jordan, Walk or Jordan Watkins. He's an, a he's an assistant professor of church history and doctrine at um, Brigham Young University. And he received his PhD in American history from the University of, La of Nevada, Las Vegas. He's a historian of American intellectual, religious, and legal history. His recent book, Slave and Sacred Slavery and Sacred Texts, The Bible, the Constitution, and America's Confrontation with History, um, was published by Cambridge University in 2021 and examines the way in which antebellum biblical and constitutional debates over slavery awoke Americans to the historical distance separating them from their hallowed biblical and revolutionary pasts. His paper, George Tickner Curtis's Defense of Dred Scott and Lorenzo Snow, looks at the ways, um, looks at the, at the way that uh, 
Greg or George Tickner Curtis, um, who was the person who, who defended uh, Dred Scott several de decades or a couple decades earlier, um, shows how his approach to that defense also um, sheds light on his defense of um, of polygamy and a greater understanding of of that. And I will here turn the time over to Jeff. Oh, excuse me. After that, we'll have a question. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> we'll just have a, a question and answer session. And I'll ask our, um, our those who have questions to line up at the mics here. Um, and then we will um, field the questions right up here. Sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Thank you, Amber. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Just as a, another slight announcement, we're going to try and get uh, Brett's paper on a laptop, so we might take a minute after my presentation. Um, so we'll just get rolling. Do you believe in polygamy or the practice of polygamy? This is the question that Swiss migrant Herminia Walzer faced at America's border in 1908. Herminia responded, quote, no, that is the only doctrine of the church that I don't agree with and with which a woman can't easily agree. After identifying as Roman Catholic, the, the inspectors asked if she, quote, intends to forsake that religion to become a Mormon. Herminia responded that she, quote, came to the United States so as to find out whether it is really worthwhile to give up my Roman Catholic church for a Mormon one. She migrated to discover for herself whether Mormons still practice polygamy in Utah, and if not, then she implied that she might join. The board moved, quote, that this alien be discharged as she, being a Roman Catholic, comes here to investigate the Mormon religion, not saying definitely whether or not she will embrace that religion and not believing in polygamy or the practice of polygamy. The only problem, though, was that Latter-day Saint missionaries had baptized Hermidia Walzer months earlier. Walzer was already Mormon and had lied to the inspectors about not being so. Herminia's experience at the border be brings together diverse strands of legal and religious histories in one moment. By the 1880s, the United States federal government had legislated against Mormon polygamy, consolidated control over immigration, and expanded federal power at the border. They fully federalized immigration control in the 1891 Immigration Act, which added polygamist as an excludable category of migrants. In 1907, the federal government revised the category by adding, quote, or persons who admit their belief in the practice of polygamy. And in doing so challenged the 1879 distinction between legislating against religious belief and religious practice from United States v. Reynolds. By 1908, Mormons had ad adapted to these border mechanisms and facilitated the flow of migrants through the border. My presentation discusses the question that Herminia Walzer faced in 1908. It details the origins and development of the polygamy question in immigration law, where migrant rights differed from constitutional ones in subtle but important ways. It also offers some responses to this question from Muslim migrants in California and Mormon right migrants in Boston just after the turn of the 20th century. These were moments <clears throat> of institutional inquiry and religious expression. In studying questions and answers, we can better understand the relationships between immigration law, religious freedom, and individual rights. In doing so, we might make sense of Herminia Walzer's strategy of passing and the ways that her story is fundamentally entangled with the religious strangers who encounter the same mechanism at the other end of a continent. So let's turn to the origins of a question. In the beginning was the Ebert Circular. Failure to control polygamy on American soil prompted United States Secretary of State William Everts to identify the foreign roots of Mormon polygamy in European converts. In 1879, Everts sent a message to foreign countries aimed at preventing Mormon migration. The circular urged foreign governments to, quote, take such steps as may be compatible with their laws and usages to check the organization of these criminal enterprises by agents who are thus operating beyond the reach of the law of the United States. Since states controlled immigration policies at the time, the circular presented a viable solution for the Secretary of State to deal with Mormon immigration as a foreign policy problem. Other scholars, such as Artis E. Partial, have argued that the circular had a lasting impact throughout the rest of the 1880s on Mormon proselytizing abroad. <clears throat> I argue that the circular echoed the ways that the federal government turned to other resources in order to stem Mormon migration. So let me describe one example. In 1887, the Swiss government communicated with the United States Secretary of State over Mormon migration. 
Byrne police officers thoroughly investigated Mormon emigration and determined that, quote, Mormon emissaries are in every sense emigration agents. And the emigrants are obtained, uh, obtained by them are all destined for the United States. The Swiss police's investigation described comprehensive surveillance of local community members, critical discussion of a variety of polarized newspaper depictions of Swiss Mormon migrants after their arrival in the United States, engagement with Mormon mission print culture, which means that some Swiss dudes got their hands on some Western Americana, it's pretty cool, and a determination that Switzerland had insufficient legal mechanisms to prevent Mormon emigration. They reported these findings to Secretary of State Thomas Bayard. Significantly, Bayard responded by suggesting Swiss officials could use the 1885 alien contract labor law to determine Mormon emigration. The law made assisting or funding migrants for the promise of labor or service of any kind illegal. Bayard believed that Mormon emigrants who use church money, quote, come within the letter of this law. Given missionaries' involvement in emigration, there, quote, can be but little doubt that they may, do make agreements, express or implied, to labor or give service upon arrival in the territory of Utah as a way of guaranteeing funding for the help of immigrating. Baird's communication came the same year that Congress disincorporated the Perpetual Emigrating Fund under the Edmunds-Tucker Act, and these efforts point towards stemming polygamy through preventing migration. By the end of 1887, Baird's pointing toward the alien contract labor law meant, uh, suggested that stemming Mormon migration um, meant incorporating the Mormon question within broader efforts to centralize immigration laws under federal control. On December 12th of that year, Senator Thomas Palmer of Michigan proposed an immigration bill similar to the 1882 Immigration Act, but added a list of identities for exclusion. One excluded identity was, quote, any believer or professed believer in the Mormon religion who sails to satisfy the consul upon examination that he or she intends to and will conform to and obey the laws of the United States. Palmer's bill made its way to the Committee on Foreign Relations, but did not return for debate. It was the only bill before the middle months of 1888 to include Mormons within federal immigration law, and the only to do so by religious name. In 1888, Congress mandated the creation of the Ford Commission, a congressional investigatory body that would submit a report detailing immigration practice under the 1882 Immigration Act. And this is pretty, pretty common. After the Ford Committee, there are tons of investigations, most famously uh, the 19, 1907 to 1911 Dillingham Commission. Um, but Congress is super interested in producing knowledge about immigration and their, their policies at the border. <clears throat> In the Ford Commission report, Congress heard testimony from immigration inspectors indicating that they had little means of policing polygamists and thereby could not stop Mormon migration. In the wake of the report, the majority of immigration bills proposed during 50th, the 50th Congress from 1887 to 1889 contained polygamist as an excludable category. Subsequent bills did not name Mormons explicitly, likely due to a potential conflict with the establishment, establishment clause of the First Amendment. Nevertheless, Mormon migration became a consistent part of proposed immigration legislation through the language of polygamy. Debate and disagreement over other parts of Im major immigration bills, though, prevented enemy immigration acts from being passed <clears throat> excuse me, until the next meeting of Congress when the 1891 Immigration Act passed and banned polygamists from entering the country for the first time. So stepping back, in this moment, Federal immigration law and the polygamy question inhabited some odd legal space. Historian Lucy Sawyer has argued that immigrants didn't possess the same rights as citizens in terms of due process. Historian Julia Rose Kraut has argued that the Bureau of Immigration and Federal Courts interpreted exclusion based on ideology as, quote, an immigration issue rather than as a First Amendment issue. Since foreign migrants didn't possess adequate rights to due process, and since courts interpreted ideological exclusion as an immigration issue, exclusions and deportations based on belief were insulated, quote, from substantial judicial review and constitutional protections under the Fifth Amendment. As a result, immigration proceedings punished foreigners in the United States for their beliefs, associations, and expressions through the expulsion or threat of expulsion. Polygamy presents a unique opportunity to understand the role of religious freedom within this odd space of policing belief at the border. 
Religious studies scholars Tisa Wenger has argued that religious freedom within American empire presented both a rhetoric that undergirded imperial expansion and also provided means for civil civilizational protect protection under the First Amendment. Borders, as historian Paul Kramer has argued, became reflections of the ways that nation states could protect citizens' rights while preventing the entry of immoral global subjects as demonstrations of a nation's own power in a globalizing world. And historian Julian Lim argues that polygamy and immigration law shows the importance of religion within this context and highlights the complicated nexus of belief, empire, religion, race, and sexuality. I think that these historiographies should speak to one another. The, procliv the proclivity to police belief within immigration law demonstrates limits of religious freedom there. Inspectors' questions and migrant responses, I think, reveal how both utilized logics of religion and empire to navigate their encounters with each other at the border. By focusing on a question about polygamy at the border, we can see how inspectors made religion legible as undesirable, and how migrants constructed or hid their religious selves as strategies of passing through the border. In short, I think we can see odd permutations, and maybe violations, though I'm not, I'm not a law, I'm not a lawyer, not a legal historian technically, uh, I just read some stuff. Um, maybe violations of the establishment and free exercise closet, clauses at the edges of an American nation. So back, back to the question. In 1907, the language of this polygamy question changed, from, changed to the form that Herminia Walzer encountered one year later. Reports since the 1891 Immigration Act had consistently revealed the clause's ineff inefficacy at excluding polygamists. The problem had to do with proof. Senator William Dillingham reported that even though immigration inspectors could technically exclude polygamists, their experience, quote, has been that while polygamists are debarred from under the present law, they were compelled to admit persons who could not be proven to be polygamists, but who freely admitted their belief in the practice of polygamy. If officers could not prove who was actively practicing polygamy, or actively prove who was and who was not actively practicing polygamy, then the question about polygamy had to change. Senator Dillingham noted, this amendment was added at the suggestion of those officers. The revised clause added a question about, quote, belief in the practice of polygamy, rather than just being a polygamist. Getting to this language, though, was a small process of revision. The original amendment in 1907 added, quote, being a believer in polygamy rather than, quote, belief in the practice of polygamy. Senator George Sutherland of Utah asked whether uh, it was the intention um, by that to provide a person who entertains a mere belief in polygamy may be excluded, or whether it was applied to one who is violating the law and who believes in the practice of polygamy. The difference to Sutherland was about, quote, mere abstract belief. Senator William Dillingham responded, I did not know what was in the mind of the House when they passed the bill, so punting a little bit, but that he thought it referred to belief in the practice of polygamy. Sutherland suggested that the Senate revise the amendment to reflect that language, otherwise the amendment is, quote, going too far. The Senate agreed to the language change from a believer in polygamy to belief in the practice of polygamy, and the House shortly agreed afterward. When immigrant inspectors stopped Herminia Walzer in Boston in 1908, they asked an entire shipload of Mormon and non-Mormon migrants. Also, there's a, great question, or there's a great story about how that came to be, so happy to deal with that in Q&A if we have time. Um, but they asked an entire shipload of Mormon and non-Mormon migrants this revised question about their beliefs in polygamy, sometimes in Mormonism, and sometimes in religion broadly. Mormon responses to the polygamy question highlighted mostly historical distance. One of Walzer's shipmates, for example, responded to the polygamy question with, quote, no, sir, we don't believe in it. When inspectors asked about believing in the practice of polygamy, he continued, no, it has not been practiced for about 18 years. Another said, no, not one of the whole gang believes in polygamy. That is a fairy tale of former years. When they asked how long ago since um, the church cast aside the practice of plural wives. The migrant responded, 18 years ago, because it wasn't legal. For many Mormons who landed in Boston in 1908, the polygamy question prompted responses that positioned their church's relationship with polygamy through historical distance, identified Mormonism as mo a modernly monogamous religion, 
and position themselves as potentially desirable citizens. Questions in Boston in 1908, though, extended beyond polygamy toward religious belief. Inspectors asked questions like, what do you believe as to the Mormon faith? Responses varied. One migrant gave, quote, the real truth. There are many churches, but there is not one of them the real church um, as her belief in Mormonism. Another stated, quote, I believe the only Bible as it is, I believe only the Bible as it is written. Others, though, spoke religious belief into their migratory journeys in Utah, similar to 19th century rhetorics of the gathering. I just came on, an, on account of my belief. One of our articles of faith is that we believe this little literal gathering, or the little gathering shall go to Zion and live on the Mormon continent. That's the reason most of us come out, for the gospel's sake. And, well, I wanted to be in the promised land. That is why I came here. Since Herminia traveled as a single woman, hiding her Mormon identity likely offered a sense of security against the popular trope that missionaries seduced gullible women. At the very least, it prompted different questions from inspectors who asked about her encounters with missionaries and why she thought Mormons were so successful at proselytizing. And she gives some pretty, pretty interesting example, examples in response to that. But again, for Q&A, if, if you're curious. Muslim migrants in the West, though, encountered different iterations of the polygamy question. Some inspectors there equated believing in Islam with believing in polygamy, regardless of migrant responses. This assumption resulted in hundreds of deportations across multiple ports of entry, including every mi Indian migrant in Seattle in 1910. It also caused international uproar from representatives of the Ottoman government. In 1913, Commissioner General of Immigration, Anthony Caminetti, issued a statement in which he specifically advised immigrant inspectors to ask about polygamous belief without asking about whether a migrant was Muslim. Inspectors in San Francisco, however, did not abide by this directive. In 1914, for example, they asked Munshi Khan if he, quote, believed in the Quran. He responded, yes. The inspector's subsequent, subsequent question connected Islam with polygamy. The Quran teaches that it is right for a man to have more than one wife. Do you, do you believe in those teachings? Khan's response dictated both that polygamy, quote, is not compulsory according to the Quran, and also that he, quote, didn't believe in it. In response to the same question in the same year, uh, a different migrant, Maoshi Khan, responded, quote, I'm not even married. How would I get more than one wife? <laughs> when inspectors prompted hi the hypothetical of having multiple wives, if he were, quote, well fixed, Maoshi Khan responded with a simple no. Where Mormon responses created distance between a religion's past history and its present practice, Muslim responses to questions about the Quran and polygamy created distance between religious text and belief. All but two Mormon migrants passed through the border in Boston in 1908, whereas, as best as my research shows, about one in 10 Muslim migrants were excluded because of polygamy, regardless of their answers to the question, um, though a higher ratio were excluded for, for other discriminatory prejudice-based um, justifications. These moments highlight different access to the protections and restrictions inherent in the establishment and free exercise clauses of the First Amendment. For mostly white Mormons arriving in the East, the polygamy question prompted responses about historical distance and expressive belief. For Muslim migrants of color, inspectors sometimes embedded polygamy with Muslim identity through religious text. Responses also expressed belief, but failed to overcome the religious racial prejudice that American imperial expansion had augmented. In the limited rights space of immigration law, an unusual question about marital belief carried the religious roots from which it was born and reveals the different accesses to religious freedom that Herminia and her Muslim contemporaries encountered on different ends of the same country. Thank you all for listening. OK. Um, so. Yesterday, I became a dad, um, and, uh, and thought I maybe wasn't going to be here presenting, but M Maddie, my wife, told me that I should present. And I show up and find out that Brett's wife has had a child, and I'm presenting two papers. So um, I apologize to Brett. This probably, I probably won't do it justice, but I will give it a shot. So this is Brett's paper, um, Combating the Other Relic. 
On March 20th, 1854, a small group of disgruntled politicians assembled in a little white schoolhouse in Ripon, Wisconsin, to establish a new political party which would come to be known as the Republican Party. Little more than two years later, this handful of northern politicians would begin to enact policies that would shape Utah for the remainder of the 19th century. While for mo most Americans, the Republican Party would become the party of Lincoln, for most 19th century Latter-day Saints, it would become the party of Justin S. Morrill, Shelby M. Cullum, and George F. Ed Edmonds, names that would elicit anger and at times even terror within Latter-day Saint memory. But in 1854, few saints could have predicted just how significant an effect that small gathering of politicians in Ripon, Wisconsin would have upon their lives. The story of how the Utah question came within the crosshairs of the nascent Republican Party by 1856 is an intriguing one that highlights events both within Utah and upon the national stage. When plural marriage was included alongside, alongside slavery in the 1856 Republican Party platform, it signaled an identity for the early Republican Party as a party of national ideological reconstruction. Years before the Republicans would pass their first pieces of re reconstructive legislation in 1862, they had begun to signal that the aims of their party would be to identify and ideologically reconstruct those who fell beyond the pale of 19th century American citizenship. Republicans not only used Utah to posit themselves in, new, in direct opposition to the key democratic principle of popular sovereignty, but they ironically found ready evidence for the need to focus the nation upon Utah in the lives and experiences of democratic appointees to Utah. On September 9, 1850, Congress passed a piece of legislation which, among other things, established the landlocked regions of the Great Basin as the territory of Utah. The Latter-day Saint settlements in the territory represented important way stations along the overland trail to the newly established gold fields in California. Likely in an effort to appease the saints, U.S. President Millard Fillmore agreed that the territorial government would be composed of both Latter-day Saints and other appointees from outside the territory. While Brigham Young was appointed to be the territory's first governor, the justices on the territorial Supreme Court tended to be individuals who were chosen from outside the Latter-day Saint populace. Throughout the 1850s, this dynamic led to frequent disputes between federally appointed judges and young. The first of these showdowns occurred in September 1851, not long after the first federal justices arrived in the Great Salt Lake City. During a meeting of the Saints on September 8, 1851, Young introduced Justice Perry Brokus to the congregation. Following Young's introduction, Brokus spoke to the gathering and chastised them on a variety of matters. His comments included an appeal to, the, to Utah's women to become virtuous. Within days of the sermon, Brokus and some of the other appointees left Utah, journeying toward Washington, D.C., where they began to warn of the fanaticism of the people and of the uh, violence of feelings toward the Gentiles among Latter-day Saints. Soon after arriving in Washington, D.C., the officials, dubbed runaways by the Saints, authored a scathing report on the extraordinary state of affairs in Utah. Among other things, the officials argued that Latter-day Saint leaders were usurping and exercising the functions of legislation and the judicial business of the territory, organizing and commanding the military, disposing of the public lands upon its own terms, coining money, and, perhaps most problematic of all, were openly sanctioning and defending the practice of polygamy, or pl plurality of wives. In addition to precipitating the formal announcement of plural marriage, this conflict helped to set the tone for decades of antipathy between Latter-day Saints and the federally appointed officers who were sent to Utah. Comparatively speaking, the years that followed from 1833 to 1855 were relatively calm ones for, uh, for Utah. Events of these years, however, proved monumental to the formation of Utah history and in the development of the Republican crusade against polygamy. Among the problems that continued to materialize during the time was the ongoing struggle to determine ultimate sovereignty in the territory. During a June 1853 sermon, Brigham Young remarked, I have no fears whatever of Franklin Pierce excusing me from office, 
and saying that another man shall be the governor of this territory. We have got a territorial government, and I am and will be governor, and no power can hinder it until the Lord Almighty says, Brigham, you need not be governor any longer, and then I am willing to yield to another governor. More than a year later, the sermon began to raise red flags in the eastern states, and at that, that very time, at the very time where Frank, U.S. President Franklin Pierce began vigorously trying to find a suitable replacement for Young. Accordingly, Young's remarks stoked national fears about the Latter-day Saint community and whether it would submit to federal authority. The Savannah Daily Morning News warned that any replacement for Young would likely be welcomed to the territory by Judge Lynch. And both the, uh, both the Washington, D.C. Evening Star and Missouri's Glasgow Weekly Times theorized that a new governor could only be installed in Utah if sent along with a complementary military force. Around the same time as these questions about the governorship of Utah were beginning to take hold, Pierce was issuing appointments for three new justices on Utah's territorial Supreme Court. While Pierce found a chief justice for Utah's territorial Supreme Court relatively quickly, appointing John F. Kinney of Iowa in the, to the position in late December 1853, filling the posts of the associate justices proved to be more difficult. In October 1853, Attorney General Caleb Cushing had appointed John W. Underwood of Georgia and George Edmonds of Illinois to the positions. While Underwood quickly declined the appointment, Edmonds seemed to be a favorable appointment for Utah. A resident of Quincy, Illinois, Edmonds had a close association with both Emma Smith and John Bernheisel. While Edmonds planned to arrive in Utah and begin his duties during the spring of 1854, his failing health prevented him from making the journey and forced his resignation by October 1854. In hopes of securing an appointee that would be favorable to the saints, Bernheisel suggested the names of saints Seth M. Blair, Zerubbabel Snow, William Appleby, along with James W. Woods, brother-in-law to Daniel H. Wells. Despite some initial favorability toward the suggestion of Appleby in particular, however, Pierce ultimately declined to appoint any of Bernheisel's recommendations. Selecting his own replacements for Underwood and Edmonds, Pierce appointed Iowa politician George Stiles and Illinois judge William Drummond to the Utah court. Drummond and Stiles were intriguing choices. Stiles had served as the Nauvoo City attorney and had become a Latter-day Saint in August 1844 with Brigham Young performing his baptism. His early church devotion had even included taking a plural wife on January 19, 1846. Subsequent to that marriage, however, his first wife, Sophia Schofield, promptly divorced Stiles, making it highly unlikely that Pierce knew anything of Stiles' earlier practice of polygamy. While not a Latter-day Saint, Drummond similarly had close connections with Utah. In 1830, he had married Jemima McClellan in Kentucky. During the 1830s and 40s, four of her siblings became Latter-day Saints. According to one sibling, Jemima similarly expressed an interest in the church, but was prevented from joining it by her husband. Perhaps due to Drummond's familial connections to the saints, John Bernheisel at first described him as a pleasantly, gentlemanly man while the Chicago Weekly Times described him as a gentleman of the highest manners, strict integrity, and high legal and literary attainments. Accordingly, on the surface, these appointments seemed as if they would prove to be highly beneficial to Utah. But while these appointments may have seemed favorable, these appointees would further undermine both federal and public perceptions of Utah, ultimately igniting the 1857-58 Utah War. At the, at the same time as these appointments were being made, events were taking place on the national level that would have a dramatic impact on Utah. During May 1854, Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, establishing the territories of Kansas and Nebraska. More significantly, the act established the political doctrine of popular sovereignty, allowing both territories to use the popular vote to determine whether they were free or slave territories. The language of the act declared the new territories perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. Although the Kansas-Nebraska Act related to the organization and regulation of those two territories, it had broader implications that did not escape the notice of many within the United States, including Latter-day Saints. 
With regards to the question of slavery, the act made it possible for all new territories to become open to the institution of slavery, obliterating earlier agreements which would have limited slavery to territories and states that fell south of Missouri's southern border. Furthermore, as historian Brent Rogers has skillfully demonstrated, Latter-day Saints saw within the language of the legislation a larger political doctrine that could be utilized to justify their own peculiar institution of polygamy. For instance, during an interview with Pierce, John Taylor noted that Young was the governor of choice among the residents of Utah, and that the people considered and that the people considered according to certain popular doctrines that their wishes ought to be somewhat consulted in relation to who governed them. Taylor believed that the Democrats were obligated to defend the saints upon the doctrine of polygamy in order to defend the doctrine of popular sovereignty. The Latter-day Saint efforts to appropriate the doctrine of popular sovereignty, however, were not the only way that the Kansas-Nebraska Act affected Utah and the Latter-day Saints. Even before it was signed into law, the Kansas-Nebraska Act out outraged anti-slavery Northerners from a broad range of political parties. In response to the bill, anti-slavery Northerners combined to establish the Republican Party. While anti-slavery would be the main focus of the party for the first decade of its existence, in both ideology and practice, it became the party of reconstructive reform. This broader reconstructive purpose of the party influenced its response to questions surrounding the settlement of the West, national education, immigration, and plural marriage. In each case, their aim was to systematize and codify the boundaries of Americanism and national citizenship. Less than two and a half years after the party's founding, it would become clear that Latter-day Saints did not fall within the pale of American citizenship that the Republican Party would come to adhere to in the 19th century. As Latter-day Saints took up the position that popular sovereignty could protect a territory's decision to practice polygamy as much as it could to protect a territory's decision to allow slavery, Utah came squarely within the crosshairs of the newly organized Republican Party. Ironically, it would be the efforts of Pierce's three Democratic appointees to the Utah Territorial Supreme Court that would provide the Republicans with much of the fodder that would fuel the 1850s beginnings of a Republican crusade against Utah that would last until 1890. Although each of Pierce's judicial appointments to Utah would influence the prevailing opinions about the territory during their terms of service, no individual would be more influential, influential in shaping public opinion about Utah than was William Drummond. As previous, previously mentioned, Drummond was married to Jemima McClellan, a close relative of some Latter-day Saints who had immigrated to Utah. Despite this marriage, however, Drummond made the journey to Utah with a woman who went by the name of Ada Carroll a prominent prostitute that had made the acquaintance that had made the acquaintance he had made the, the acquaintance of in Washington DC and then referred to her as his wife during his time in the territory an inconsistency which would be noted by latter-day saints throughout his time in utah drummond became a prominent critic of the community writing letters with damning critiques to both newspapers and politicians back in the states Soon after his arrival in the territory, he wrote a letter to the Chicago Daily Times in which he stated that far too many of the Latter-day Saints were basely corrupt, an allusion to the practice of polygamy. Within months of his arrival, Drummond was calling upon U.S. Attorney General Caleb Cushing to ban all future appointments of Latter-day Saints to positions within the territory, stating that this was necessary because such a state of things does not exist on the face of the earth as exist in this territory. In particular, he urged Young's immediate replacement as governor. Drummond's actions ran counter to the notions of popular sovereignty and the desire of Utahns to be governed by political officers of their own choosing. Accordingly, Heber C. Kimball and others soon began to worry that Drummond was quickly becoming a bitter enemy of their community. Issuing a public rebuke, Young directed a public address toward Drummond and the other judges, stating that the role of the territory's governing officers was only to act for the people and do what we wish to have done. He emphasized that the judges are not here as kings and monarchs, but rather were subject to keep the laws of the territory as well as other citizens. 
Privately, Young was even more critical, stating that Drummond often and in various ways transcended his authority. The judge was, in Young's estimation, proud as a peacock and ignorant as a jackass. <laughs> Days after Young's public remarks, the Salt Lake Probate Court began issuing a litany of charges against both Drummond and Kinney. Although the charges were dismissed less than a week later, both the charges and Young's remarks emphasized a significant power struggle in the territory between the sovereignty of the federal government and that of the territorial citizens. Responding to this power struggle, Drummond and other officials wrote to Pierce and Cushing, describing Young as one of the most terrible tyrants ever on earth and as a hostile and bitter assailant of the present administration. They further argued that unless all Latter-day Saints were removed from political office, federal officials would find themselves in danger of violence at the hands of assassins. In spite of the growing questions surrounding federal sovereignty in Utah, Latter-day Saint leaders remained optimistic about the prospects of Utah receiving statehood in 1856. They were convinced that the territory's petition would receive a favorable reception throughout the country and especially among Democrats. Indeed, given the increasingly problematic nature, nature of the nation's sectional divisions and the ascendancy of the Republican Party as a legitimate competitor, admission of the heavenly, heavily democratic Utah as a state made logical sense for Democrats. Furthermore, Utah presented a more stable option than the conflict-ridden territory of Kansas, a contrast that was noted by the New York Herald in early June 1856. Just weeks after the Herald's article was published, however, the Latter-day Saint hopes for Utah statehood had come crashing down, as John A. Willis, a Republican from San, Francis San Francisco, urged his party to include a firm statement against polygamy in its first national platform. Willis later recalled that the opportunity to publish the party's first political platform had presented a unique opportunity to make war upon polygamy and at the same time strengthen the case against slavery as much as possible by associating the two together. By linking polygamy and to slavery as the twin relics of barbarism, the Republicans tapped into a deep undercurrent of national unease about the circumstances in Utah and dealt a stunning blow to the doctrine of popular sovereignty, which had undergirded democratic power in the 1850s. Despite hopes that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to defend popular sovereignty and deny Utah's rights to the institution of plural marriage at the same time, Utah's delegation to appeal for statehood noted an immediate shift in public opinions with regards to the territory's admission. For instance, George A. Smith recalled an almost instantaneous change in his interactions with Congressman Mordecai Oliver of Missouri. The day before news of the platform had reached them, Oliver spoke very favorably of our admission and pronounced it good. The following day, Oliver and other representatives had become very distant and began to raise objections to the admission of Utah. By the time Smith had arrived in Washington, D.C., Bernheisel advised him to forgo submitting the petition, fearing that bringing further attention to Utah in the wake of the Republican platform would be doing more hurt than good. Despite his reluctance to accept Bernheisel's recommendation, Smith soon found that all those who had once supported statehood were now reluctant to show any support for the measure, fearing that it would lead to a political grave. By the end of 1856, George A. Smith and John Taylor had both found that they received nearly as much opposition from the Democrats as from the Republicans on the topic of Utah's admission to the Union. Perhaps, perhaps unaware of the wording of the Republican uh, platform, Drummond added further credence to the Republican attack upon polygamy while presiding over a court in the furthest reaches of Utah territory at Carson Valley. During a session of the court, Drummond called upon the grand jury, jury to cast off all priestly yokes of oppression and studiously and honestly do their duty without fear, favor, or affection in prosecuting those who practiced plural marriage. Likely unaware that he was doing so, Drummond invoked the language of Republic, 
of the Republican platform in calling for a remedy for the correction of that crying and most loathsome, barbarous, cruel, black, and degrading evil. Shortly after issuing this charge, Drummond abandoned his post in Utah, traveling to California and from thence back to the eastern states where he would carry on a vicious public campaign against the Utah states in the newspapers. Although doing so in the form of confidential letters to government officials, Kinney similarly wrote scathing critiques of Utah and would heighten federal concerns over the territory. And even Stiles, despite being a Latter-day Saint, would run afoul of the Utah community, culminating in his excommunication for adultery in December 1856, his return to the States in 1857, and yet another scathing denunciation of the circumstances in Utah. Each of these critiques further strengthened the ways in which the 1856 Republican platform resonated with the American public. By calling for the eradication of both slavery and polygamy in the territories, the Republican national platform had redefined American politics and had ushered in an era of reconstructive policies and measures. Whereas America had previously been defined by political compromises, one of which had brought about the notion of popular sovereignty, the Republican platform of 1856 eschewed the policy of compromise and took an unabashed stance against compromises of any kind upon the topics of slavery and polygamy. By labeling these two institutions as barbaric, the Republicans declared not only their vocal opposition to slavery and polygamy, but they declare without equivocation that those institutions were by nature un-American and undermine the principles upon which the nation was founded. This shift from principles of compromise toward an insistence upon abolition of barbaric practices had far-reaching effects for the nation as a whole and for Utah in particular. By June 1856, the 19th century destinies of Utah territory had been immeasurably altered by the combined efforts of a then obscure political party and the unwitting cooperation it received from Democratic political appointees in Utah. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> Maybe I'll just claim Brett's paper. I thought that was good. Learned a lot as I read it. Okay. Um, so, my paper is now titled, We Cannot Legislate Against an Idea, George Tickner Curtis and the Freedom of Religious Conscience. In 1886, George Tickner Curtis defended Lorenzo Snow in the United States Supreme Court. Snow, a Latter-day Saint apostle, had been convicted of unlawful cohabitation, and his attorney, Franklin Richards, had won an appeal before the Supreme Court. Richards enlisted the help of Curtis, who drew upon a half century of legal experience in arguing that Snow's convictions infringed on his religious freedoms and violated the First Amendment. Curtis's legal experience ran through the central crisis of antebellum America and the most notorious Supreme Court case in American history. During the early 1850s, Curtis played a prominent role in the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Law and, Later in that decade, he served as co-counsel for Dred Scott, a black man suing for his freedom. An understanding of Curtis's involvement in these situations and in Snow's later cases requires attending to Curtis's embrace of the American constitutional order and the social order that the Constitution created. The constitutional order consisted of a federalism that protected state sovereignty while also granting the central government certain designated powers. Curtis believed the Union's success depended upon this balance. He embraced the Union from among New England elites, and thus he had good reasons to combat ideas and actions that threatened the existing social order. Curtis viewed abolitionism as a danger to that order, but he also worried about Southern overreach. He believed that Northerners should keep their commitment to the Fugitive Slave Clause and its later iterations, and that Supreme Court justices should respect legal precedent regarding Congress's power to prohibit slavery in the territories. 
Curtis also identified less obvious threats to the social order, including the tyranny of a Protestant majority. In addressing this threat, Curtis participated in a conservative approach to reform, one that allowed social elites to control progress. This involved a notion of deference to men with legal training and experience, such as himself. As Curtis put it in an 1841 speech, trust in the gradual expansion and perfection of society in the light of religion, letters, truth, and law. In this way, Curtis found room to defend marginalized groups. Curtis received the best available legal training. Owing to the work and sacrifice of his widowed mother, Lewis Robbins, and the assistance of his uncle, George Tickner, George and his brother, Benjamin, attended Harvard Law School, where they learned from Joseph Story, a sitting Supreme Court justice. Story turned the law school into a viable institution. His expertise in constitutional law and his unionism shaped the views of the Curtis brothers. These brothers also received an education in religion. In the memoir of his brother, George noted the Unitarian influences which surrounded Benjamin's youth. George himself embraced the Unitarian appeal to religious understanding, which William Ellery Channing had described as charitable judgment, especially towards those who differ in religious opinions. In August of 1834, while George Curtis was enrolled at Harvard Law School in Cambridge, a Protestant mob burned a Catholic convent in Charlestown. In an 1842 pamphlet, Curtis brought his religious sensibilities and regional pride to bear on this question. He viewed the attack as a blot on a place where people, presumably, respect the rights of conscience and property. Curtis believed the state's failure to indemnify the diocese stemmed from anti-Catholicism, which made it impossible, he said, to hear with impartiality any cause or claim in which Catholics are interested. Curtis had identified the tyranny of, of the religious majority. He dismissed fears that Catholicism threatened to overtake Protestantism or that it was hostile to our Republican institutions. If citizens set aside these suspicions, he suggested, they would perceive the impolicy, the absurdity, and the danger of denying such protection and reparation because the particular form of religion is one which the majority of the people do not desire to have propagated. Curtis urged his readers to remember that there is but one savior for both Protestants and Catholics. He believed that treating Catholics as Christians and fellow citizens was crucial to securing the public peace, which he described as infinitely important. Curtis's concern with securing the public peace and protecting the right of property extended to the issue of slavery. During the early 1850s, both Curtis brothers played prominent roles in enforcing the fugitive slave law in Boston, where George was a U.S. commissioner and Benjamin was a state representative. The brothers faced off against Theodore Parker and the Boston Vigilance Committee, who sometimes succeeded in rescuing fugitives with the help of sympathetic crowds. These rescues only deepened the Curtis's commitment to challenge perceived threats to the safety and peace of the Union. In late May 1854, abolitionists attempted to rescue Anthony Burns while he was imprisoned in a Boston courthouse. This resulted in the death of a U.S. Marshal. President Franklin Pierce sent federal troops to maintain order, and Burns was returned to slavery. Soon after, Benjamin Curtis, now a Supreme Court justice, issued an indictment against Theodore Parker for his, his purported involvement in the attempted rescue. The indictment failed to produce convictions, but it did draw a published response from Parker, who criticized the Curtis brothers as pro-slavery pawns. Parker continued his attack in his sermons, where he also took aim at Boston's clergymen. He noted that only a few ministers have been faithful to the spirit of the Bible and to their own conscience. Ezra Gannett, the minister of George Curtis, felt the sting of Parker's words. Distraught, Gannett delivered a sermon in which he urged Northerners not to fold our arms and close our lips in patient acquiescence to the fugitive slave law. Feeling betrayed, George Curtis responded to Gannett in print, lecturing him on the Constitution and obedience to, to the new legislation. 
He registered his faith in law, writing that no excitements, no public meetings, no mobs are necessary to prompt the members of that profession to their duty. Curtis believed that questions about slavery's constitutionality should be left to calm, cool legal deliberation rather than be subject to the inflamed influence of public excitement, which figures such as Parker had fueled. While Boston abolitionists presented the most clear and present threat to the Union, Curtis also worried about overclaiming pro-slavery politicians. This threat emerged in Dred Scott, a case involving a black man who had sued for his freedom on the basis that his prior owner had taken him into territories made free by Congressional Act. Considering the prospect of a sweeping pro-slavery decision, Montgomery Blair, the counsel for Dred Scott, enlisted George Curtis's help on the question of congressional power. As Curtis later noted, in December of 1856, three days before argument, Blair requested me to assist him. I told him that I thought I knew enough of the constitutional history of the country to maintain the affirmative of the proposition that Congress could prohibit the existence of slavery in any territory. Curtis did just that, but his argument failed to convince Chief Justice Roger Taney, who ruled that Scott was not a citizen and could not sue, and proceeded to dismiss the long-standing assumption that Congress had power to prohibit slavery in the territories. In Justice Benjamin Curtis's dissenting opinion, he echoed his brother George's argument on congressional power. Near the close of his opinion, Benjamin censured what he viewed as a decision resulting from volatile, abstract political reasoning. He faulted the court for being politically motivated and for issuing a ruling that deviated from practices consistent with original meanings. The Curtis brothers did not acknowledge their how that their own political leanings informed their interpretations. George explained that his brother could be found on either side of the debate due to his constitutional commitments. He wrote that Benjamin made great efforts to convince his fellow citizens that the slaveholding states and their people had every right to the full and faithful execution of that constitutional stipulation which required the extradition of fugitive slaves. But when the demands of the slave interest claimed a position which he believed neither the Constitution nor the system of union had given to it, his mind was found to be just as capable of an un unbiased and impartial examination of those demands. In George's view, allegiance to the Constitution and the union required that he and his brother take objective stances against legal constructions resulting from both popular and political excitement. In the late 1850s, George Curtis continued to address con congressional power. He criticized Democrats for contending that Congress had no territorial power over slavery, and Republicans for arguing that Congress had power to prohibit, but not allow slavery in the territories. Curtis, a former Whig, framed his politics in constitutional terms, focusing on the powers the Constitution did and did not grant to the branches of government. In 1862, George Curtis moved to New York and became a Democrat. On constitutional grounds, he and his brother opposed Lincoln's wartime policies and later the legislation of the radical Republicans. George's constitutional commitments and political affiliation set the stage for his later involvement in Snow's cases. In November of 1885, federal officers descended upon Brigham City carrying a warrant for the arrest of Lorenzo Snow. A few years before, Congress had passed a bill authored by Republican Senator George F. Edmonds that had made unlawful cohabitation a misdemeanor. It was left to Charles Zane, the Chief Justice of the Territorial Court, to determine what constituted unlawful cohabitation. Several polygamists attempted to conform to the law by living with one wife. Snow lived only with Minnie, the youngest of his seven wives. In September of 1885, Zane instructed grand juries that they could indict men for segregated periods of cohabitation. That same month, federal officers arrested Snow on three counts. In the trials that followed, the court admitted any testimony tending to show that the defendant held out to the world or said that these ladies were his wives 
or claim them as such during the indictment. On this basis of evidence, Snow was convicted on all counts and sentenced to three consecutive six-month terms and three fines of $300. Franklin Richards eventually succeeded in appealing Snow's cases to the Supreme Court. In April 1886, just weeks before trial, Richards asked George Curtis if he would serve as associate counsel. Curtis said he felt a strong sympathy for Richards and accepted his invitation. Extant records do not shed further light on Curtis's motivation. Perhaps he saw Snow's case as a chance to combat the latest threat to the constitutional order, this time in the form of a Protestant religious majority and an allied Republican congressman, two forces that Curtis had challenged in the past. Curtis's concerns about popular religious prejudice and partisan political influence, along with his constitutional expertise, may explain his decision, decision to accept an unpopular rule. In late April, Curtis argued a very grave constitutional question before the court. He focused on the free exercise clause. Since the ratification of the Bill of Rights, the court had not had occasion to interpret this clause. This changed in the late 1870s with a case involving George Reynolds, who had been charged with bigamy under the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act. The court ruled that while Congress could not legislate against religious opinion, it could legislate against actions which were in violation of social duties or subversive of good order. On this basis, it up upheld anti-polygamy legislation as constitutional. Protestant moral reasoning backed and informed this decision, which tied Christian monogamy to democracy and polygamy to despotism. Curtis knew that polygamy tapped into Protestant Americans' fundamental beliefs about religion, civilization, and the nation. He thus acknowledged those beliefs and then asked the court to consider the saints' beliefs. Curtis observed that we can do no good unless we can rise to that condition of mind which enables us to stand in the inner circle of their feelings and convictions, and so far to treat them as our equals, equals before the law, equals before the God who made us all. In this remarkable statement, Curtis pled with the court and the American public to engage in an exercise of religious understanding. Curtis believed that there was room in the constitutional order for the saints' beliefs. He noted that the right of religious liberty is embedded in our fundamental law, and we have not yet reached a condition of things in which belief, when so held and so professed and carried out in innocent conduct, is to be touched by the hand of criminal law. Curtis held that Snow had been convicted for professing belief. The prosecution had procured testimony that Snow had introduced two women as his wives while under arrest. Curtis clarified that Snow spoke of the women as his wives, meaning that by the religious law of his church, he was bound to them in a spiritual and religious tie that did not necessarily signify the enjoyment of carnal relation. Curtis used Joseph Smith's 1843 revelation to show that the saints believed in eternal marriage. And in light of this belief, Curtis argued, Snow could not be convicted of unlawful cohabitation by his language without, convict, without violating his rights of conscience. In Reynolds, the court had distinguished between belief and action, and now Curtis drew those lines more carefully. He stated that the free exercise clause protected the holding of religious beliefs and their avowal, such as Snow's use of the term wife. Curtis insisted that we cannot legislate against an idea. We cannot legislate against a thought or an expression of it. We cannot force belief out of the human soul. Moving from thoughts and expressions to actions, Curtis noted that if the expression of a religious belief connects itself with external acts, we must discriminate between those acts which are plainly dictated by the belief and are not per se injurious to the public welfare and those which are so injurious. 
Curtis allowed that polygamy and cohabitation properly defined were injurious, but deemed visits of sympathy, contributing to support, providing the means of subsistence for women and children in sickness or in health, in sorrow or in joy, as acts which are not, per se, injurious to the public good. He argued that we cannot define these acts as unlawful cohabitation without violating the rights of conscience. Curtis buttressed this careful legal argument with a narration of the saint's history, including Smith's murder by lawless popular violence. He believed that prejudice had obscured the saint's history, belief, and culture, and had directed some to try to extend the kingdom of Christ by persecution and to propagate a religion of love by the gospel of hate. Curtis, who recognized the close ties between Protestantism and anti-polygamy legislation, closed his argument with an appeal to Christian sentiment. These arguments had little effect. On May 10th, the court ruled that because the Edmonds Act had not made a provision for the court to grant a writ of error, it did not have jurisdiction in Snow's cases. Curtis went back to work. In letters to Democrats, including the Attorney General, two members of the House Committee on the Judiciary, and the Secretary of the Interior, he proposed legislation that would grant the Supreme Court appellate jurisdiction. Curtis also sought a hearing in the Court of Public Opinion. In a May letter to John Taylor, President of the Church, Franklin Richards noted that Judge Curtis and others insist that our only salvation lies in the creation of a favorable public opinion. The next day, Curtis wrote to Taylor again, noting that, uh, uh, excuse me, the next day Richards wrote to Taylor again, noting that Curtis has written several good articles about us and is evidently trying to do all the good that he can. His labors are in the fullest sense canamore. He firmly believes that we are oppressed and persecuted and earnestly desires to help emancipate us from our bondage. Richards continued, there seems to be a providence in his employment and I believe the Lord has a hand in preparing him to do our work. In July, Curtis wrote directly to church president John Taylor, stating, I do indeed take a strong interest in, con in what concerns your religious and civil rights, but it is a difficult thing to make the people or the public men understand where the line is to be drawn between what the civil power can constitutionally do and what it cannot. In his response, Taylor registered the saints' resolve to contend for their rights, both for themselves and for humanity, that the principles of civil and religious liberty may be fully maintained in the great American continent. Curtis used some of Taylor's response in his open letter to the Secretary of the Interior, and there he noted that he agreed with Taylor that the saints will be forced to become the champions of civil and religious liberty in this country if there is not a change of policy. And yet, Curtis also knew that his voice may be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Curtis was right. Most of his efforts proved ineffective, but he did win some victories. In October, after Snow had served out his first sentence, Richards and Curtis petitioned the district court for a writ of habeas corpus. The court denied the petition. The next month, Richards and Curtis again won an appeal before the Supreme Court, and this time, the court ruled in their favor. In February of 1887, the court decided that Snow's cohabitation was continuous, and his crime could not be divided up into segregated periods. Snow went free. Less than a month later, the Edmonds-Tucker Act became law. It did not grant the Supreme Court appellate jurisdiction. Instead, it required prospective voters, jurors, and public officials to take an anti-polygamy oath. Curtis had made a valiant argument, but the concept of religious freedom remained severely limited. In an era when Protestant Americans deemed Mormonism to be a belief system beyond the pale, the saints could not become champions of civil and religious liberty. Sympathy had eroded, despite Curtis's best efforts. But Curtis continued crying in the wilderness, though he did require payment for his tears. In an April 1887 letter to Richards, Curtis explained his request for an increase in annual pay. I incur a great deal of a certain kind of abuse and also of misrepresentation. Sometimes this reaches my children through friends who do not understand the general subject or my professional relations to it. 
and I have to make efforts to correct the false ideas so that one who occupies such a position as I do has to encounter what he never has to meet in situations where no religious prejudices or religious hatreds are involved. Curtis's efforts to cultivate religious understanding came at a cost, both for himself and for the church. But Curtis continued to petition on behalf of the church and became a vocal proponent of Utah's push for statehood. He died in 1894, two years before Utah became a state. Forces outside of his control, including the anti-polygamy legislation and legal decisions that Curtis critiqued, paved the path for statehood. Those same forces have obscured Curtis's efforts. And yet during a short time, the saints held him in high esteem for standing in the inner circle of their feelings and convictions. As a writer for the Deseret News put it in an 1888 article, the name George Tickner Curtis is now almost a household word in Utah. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for reading um, Brett's uh, paper. We have limited time for questions, so what I think we'll do is um, have people line up here. We'll get the first um, few questions and then have our responses, and we will end promptly at 10. So bring them on. Please. Hello. Can you hear me? I don't think this is on. Does yeah, we can on? hear it. Well done. So I enjoyed both papers, all three papers, so much. Um, and I wondered um, uh, for uh, Jeff whether he had considered the White Slavery Act, the Mann Act of 1910, um, which of course drew on language that was um, created originally in opposition to polygamy um, and was sustained uh, sustained in, I think it's 1947, in a case called Cleveland against United States, which prosecuted a Mormon polygamist for violation of the Mann Act. And I, I think there's a nice sort of um, internal match bringing um, women across state lines, not just into the country, but across state lines. And I, there's a nice match between the immigration and the Mann Act, and I thought that might uh, be of interest in your in your work, um, and then with George Tickner Curtis, who was a a, um, a, a, a an eccentric individual. Um, I think what's so interesting is that he didn't pick up on the real weakness of segregating um, convictions, um, but um, the fact that Lorenzo Snow won was a profound blow to the ongoing prosecution of polygamists, a really big victory, um, and one that was sorely needed by a church that had had a lot of victories in the 1860s and 70s and fewer in the 80s, but they still had really smart lawyering. And I just, Tickness, uh, uh, Tickner Curtis maybe not among those, honestly, um, but, I, but I think sort of um, highlighting this clever legal strategy and the successful legal strategy would give some balance to Curtis's failures. So anyway, thanks. Thank you very much. And we have one question over here. Yeah, Dr. Watkins, <clears throat> just as a curiosity actually, um, did, in your research of, uh, of Mr. Curtis, did you come across any Hegelian Influence? Did he talk about that at all? I mean, I see a lot of, of similarities there. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I've still got quite a bit of work to do here. Um, before we, yeah, maybe I should say the mic. Um, I've got quite a bit of work to do here on Curtis Steele, um, and, and one is to investigate more fully um, some of that intellectual context. I don't see it there. Um, if he's getting it, he's getting it um, not directly, indirectly. It would be from other thinkers, including perhaps some, some Unitarians or some people in and around Boston. But I don't see him engaging with Hegel directly. Um, just related to that point, the other question I want to pursue further is, is he talking about 
Latter-day Saints and the Mormon question before this period. I do see, find, I, I find one place in 1859 where he talks about the potential problem um, that Congress and the United States is going to have in Utah territory. And he's actually saying, we may need all of the force uh, of, of of the, that the Constitution gives us to deal with this issue, right? And then a couple of decades later, he finds himself sort of arguing against some of that. I think he's only making that point for political reasons in 1859. But um, that's not really an answer to your question. It's just more what I'm thinking. So I'll stop talking. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're out of time. Um, but I want to, again, thank these presenters and, and thank Jordan again for taking the extra or making the extra effort to read uh, Brett's paper. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the wonderful comments. And thank you very much.
Well, welcome to this session of the Church History Symposium. Uh, this session is called uh, Exploring Religious Rights and Responsibilities in the U.S. Legal System. My name is Brian Passantino. I'm a research uh, consultant at the Church History Library, and I'm really excited to be moderating this session. We have a great slate of presenters today. I'm going, ahead and, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, all three of them and in the order that they will be presenting, and then uh, we will go from there. So first we have uh, Brett G. Scharfs. He's a Rex E. Lee Chair, a professor of law at, J. at the J. Reuben Clark Law School, and was appointed director of the law school's International Center for Law and Religion, Religion Studies, effective uh, May 1st, 2016. He had served the center as associate director and regional advisor for Asia since 2009, and the law school as both associate dean of academic affairs and associate dean for faculty curriculum. Formerly Francis R. Kirkham Professor of Law, Professor Scharfs was appointed on September 1st, 2017 to the law school's Rex E. Lee Chair. Rex e. Chair. Rex e. Lee Chair. Professor Scharfs' teaching and scholarly interests include law and religion, legal reasoning and rhetoric, philosophy of law, and legislation and regulation. He's a graduate of Georgetown University where he received a BSBA in international business and an MA in philosophy. He was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, where he earned a B.Phil in philosophy. He received his J.D. from Yale Law School, where he was senior editor of the law, uh, Yale Law Journal. He's married to Deidre Mason Crane Sharfs and has three children, Elliot, who is married to Whitley, Sophelia, and Ella. He enjoys golf, skiing, mountain biking with family and friends. Our next presenter is uh, Michael, Michael T. Warley. M Warley. Michael Worley is an attorney, and from 2019 to 2020, he served as a member of the inaugural class of law clerks for Judge Howard C. Nielsen, Jr. of the District of Utah. Before that, Michael worked for a D.C.-based Supreme, uh, Supreme Court boutique, litigating disputes regarding the First Amendment, Title VII, and other issues. A graduate of Brigham Young University's Law School, Michael also spent time working for the school's International Center for Law and Religion Studies and interning in the chamber of Justice Christine M. Durham of the Utah Supreme Court. Our final presenter is uh, William C. Duncan, goes by Bill. Um, he is a Sutherland Institute, uh, he's the Sutherland Institute's Religious Freedom Policy Fellow. He formerly worked in the Law and Religion Program at, at Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law and has taught college courses on religion and law. So we'll go ahead and turn the time over to Brett for the first uh, presentation. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. It's uh, my honor and pleasure to be here. This is the first time I've uh, participated in the uh, Church History Symposium, and so it's a special uh, pleasure. I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, this year's topic, which is right in the wheelhouse of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies. Our mission is to promote freedom of religion and belief for all people in all places. And we do this in part through uh, advocating for human dignity of everyone everywhere. The title of my presentation today is The Journey from Persecution to Inclusion. And uh, this arose several years ago when I was invited by Baroness Emma Nicholson of Winterbourne from the House of Lords in the United Kingdom who's also the chair of the Amar Foundation, a charity that strives to build and improve the lives and livelihoods of some of the world, world's poorest and most disadvantaged people, to participate in a conference in Baghdad, Iraq, focusing on the latest wave of persecution faced by the Yazidi people, a minority religion that has suffered a long history of misunderstanding, persecution, and even attempted genocides. Along with several ecclesiastical and humanitarian leaders from the Church of Jesus Christ, we were asked to share the experience of the journey from persecution to participation and inclusion of the Latter-day Saints in America, with the hope that there might be ideas or insights that could assist the Yazidi people in navigating their journey. Elder Anthony D. Perkins of the Quorum of the Seventy of the Church and Sharon Eubank, President of LDS Charities, also participated in the conference in Baghdad. And my thinking about the journey from persecution to inclusion is deeply indebted to and builds upon the presentations they made at that conference. Elder Perkins began by telling the story of the church. Uh, 
the revelation to Joseph Smith in 1820, the persecution that soon followed, and the founding of the church in 1830. This history is not need, does not need uh, elucidation, elaboration for this uh, uh, audience, but it's clear that over the next 17 years, intense religious persecution resulted in, depending on how you count, four or five major forced migrations of church members. Thousands of people walked thousands of miles to find refuge from religious persecution and to exercise religious freedom. In 1831, church members were forced to move westward from New York and settled in Ohio, where work on a sacred temple began in Kirtland. Persecution of church leaders and members soon became intense. And in 1838, church members uh, remaining in Kirtland fled to Missouri, where other day, 1835, I think uh, I have a, a misprint, uh, Church members remaining in Kirtland fled to Missouri, where other Latter-day Saints had begun to gather in 1831. However, by 1838, the Saints in Missouri had already endured much violent persecution by hostile neighbors who had driven them from their land, destroyed their property, and physically attacked them. In October 1838, Missouri Governor Liburn Boggs issued the extermination order, declaring the Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state. Emboldened by the sanction of law, persecution in Missouri increased. And a mob massacred 17 Latter-day Saint men at Hans Mill. Joseph Smith and several close associates were imprisoned in the ironically named Liberty Jail, where they suffered a bitter winter while church members were forced to flee the state. In 1839, church members began to turn a marshland on the bank of the Mississippi River into a beautiful city, Nauvoo. Once again, work began on a sacred temple. By 1844, persecution raged anew. The governor of Illinois placed Joseph in jail, where he and his brother Hiram were murdered by a mob covered in blackface, while ostensibly under state protection. Latter-day Saints considered Hiram and Joseph to be martyrs for their faith. In 1845, in the face of continued persecution, church members abandoned their homes in Nauvoo and traveled west under the leadership of Brigham Young. Their forced migration took them to Utah, where they arrived in 1847. Over the next two decades, tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints migrated by wagon and foot to the Utah Territory. Because of the hardships and deprivations of the trail, many buried family members on the prairie. And so what we see is over the first 20 years of the church's existing, uh, existence, the church was uh, forced to migrate uh, time and again. Even after arriving in Utah, the church and its members suffered persecution at the hands of the U.S. government. In 1852, based upon false rumors, the President of the United States sent the U.S. Army to Utah to put down an alleged but non-existent rebellion. During the late 1880s, Congress passed laws to break the church financially, due partly to some church members' practice of polygamy, placing church leaders in prison, culminating in a Supreme Court case upholding the seizure of the church's property and assets. Really, it wasn't until the Smoot hearings in 1903 through 1907 that the process of integrating Latter-day Saints into the United States really began to take place, about 75 years after the church was officially organized. As this brief sketch illustrates, uh, the answer to the question, uh, the church suffered uh, about 75 years of severe persecution. The answer to the question is why, why is complex and mostly beyond the scope of this presentation. Factors included differences of religious belief, differences in religious practices, and some fears of political influence by the church. At this conference in Baghdad, uh, I learned a lot about the Yazidi and their history of persecution. It is an ancient, non-Abrahamic faith that blends elements of Islam, Christianity, and ancient Persian traditions. They have falsely been uh, characterized as devil worshipers, an accusation, interestingly, that was also made against Latter-day Saints in the early history of, of, uh, the, of the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, in 2014 and 15, there was the latest in a long line of attempted genocides at the hands of uh, ISIS. And at that um, conference, I heard testimonies from 
a number of uh, people who had suffered from that persecution, including a Yazidi girl who had been sold into sexual slavery. Under Islamic law, you can have more than one wife, and one of the things that happens is uh, men will uh, pass along wives uh, from one uh, man to another uh, uh, in time. And uh, this girl had uh, been uh, handed to about the fourth uh, husband, and uh, uh, while she was being raped, she had this sense that she recognized him, and she couldn't figure it out. But several days later, she realized he was the family dentist. Uh, this is someone who, prior to uh, the escalation of antagonism, uh, had been a neighbor, uh, someone who had uh, uh, been uh, uh, provided services uh, to the family. And uh, this story had a, a really big impact on me because I, I think, had a tendency to think of persecution as something that is distant and far away. But it turns out that persecution takes place mostly close at hand. And so I began focusing on uh, some of the main institutions that are uh, involved uh, with, the, with religious persecution. And today I'm going to just briefly mention seven of them and the experience that the Church of Jesus Christ has had with these. Um, as you look at these institutions, uh, the question that I'm most interested in are, are these institutions the cause of persecution or the solution to persecution? And as we've already seen illustrated by some of the presentations we've already heard yesterday and this morning, the answer, of course, is both. And uh, it's this answer that I'd like to explore briefly. By the state, I mean local, state, national governments, presidents, governors, senators, politicians, political parties. Historically, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has experienced persecution and prejudice by the U.S. government at the local, state, and federal levels. In the early years, local and state governments perpetuated per persecution against the states either by failing to provide legal protections or by illegally wielding institutional powers against them. Uh, here we have uh, an image of the appeal to Martin Van Buren. Uh, we have uh, the Supreme Court state which sort of gives away its holding by referring to the late corporation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, also uh, the, the Smoot hearings. I'm sorry, my slide didn't advance. Uh, I need to try a different button. Uh, that's the slide I was just talking about. But despite the historical failings of the state, time and mellowing demonstrated that governments also have the power to be a vehicle for eroding prejudice. Uh, nat national temperature towards the saints settled by degrees as saints continued the exposure and uh, had in uh, improved public perception. Uh, uh, significantly, uh, today, Latter-day Saints are well represented in, uh, uh, in, in government and in legislatures. What about majority faiths? It turns out the majority faiths can be one of the primary instruments of persecution. Recall that for the first, the first abuse that the young Joseph Smith received for his claims of divine revelation was from the clergy of other denominations. Religious prejudice and persecution are not synonymous, but majority faiths have perpetuated both against Latter-day Saints. Sometimes these are overt and serious. Sometimes they are less overt, but still quite serious. But majority faiths can also be a powerful instrument of inclusion. Here I've just included a couple uh, examples, including uh, Richard Mao, the president of the Fuller Theological Seminary, and his book, Talking with Mormons. Uh, also, just in 2019, not very long ago, uh, the first president of the Church of Jesus Christ uh, uh, met with the Pope. The media is a very powerful instrument both of persecution and of uh, inclusion. It's interesting that even as recently as uh, Mitt Romney's presidential campaign, some media outlets used 
photographs that were designed to create a sense of uh, sinister, shifty, untrustworthiness. Um, we also see still uh, popular uh, uh, entertainment uh, that uh, blasphemes uh, what uh, uh, church members hold sacred. And of course, the, uh, the, the depiction of the church in the media, uh, especially in the first 75 years of the church's history, was uh, very hostile. But the media is also a force for inclusion. Uh, uh, there are you know, some significant milestone moments, such as the 60 Minutes interview uh, with President Hinckley, uh, also his appearances with uh, Larry King, uh, but also a very different type of uh, publication that has become uh, uh, prominent, where a more fair-minded and even apologetic uh, 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 literature has, uh, ha has been embraced. The persecuted can also uh, contribute to their own persecution. This, of course, is a very uh, sensitive topic because it's all too easy to uh, sort of blame the victim uh, for uh, persecution. Uh, but I think the reality is that there were certain things uh, that the Latter-day Saints did, uh, most prominently, of course, the practice of polygamy, but also some of the political insularity and the fear-driven uh, 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 violence, uh, such as the, the Mountain Meadows Massacre, that I think contributed to uh, the, uh, the persecution of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, the Persecuted faith can themselves also be an agent for uh, seeking to improve their inclusion within society. Uh, this can be everything from uh, church leaders shaving their beards so they would look more like uh, uh, Americans, uh, but also uh, being involved in service to others. Uh, it turns out that one of the ways that persecuted groups find their voice is by standing up for others who uh, suffer persecution as well as the, themselves. Uh, business, of course, is another instrument both of uh, discrimination and persecution. Uh, the early history of the church, of course, is filled with uh, examples of uh, business interests that were uh, hostile uh, to the church and uh, its, its members. And uh, this may be another area where some of the insularity was self-generated as well because the church wanted to try to create its own independent economy so that they wouldn't be susceptible to the um, uh, 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 harm inflicted by others. But over time, there's been a much more inclusive uh, attitude. Uh, indeed, uh, today, uh, there is probably an overrepresentation of Latter-day Saints in uh, uh, high uh, areas of, uh, of business influence. The last two interest me the most. One is neighbors. One of the most disheartening features of religious persecution is that while we think of it as a distant problem controlled by distant forces, a large part of persecution occurs near at hand with neighbors persecuting neighbors. Uh, this, of course, is something that is somewhat familiar to us even today, uh, but uh, neighbors can also be important instruments of inclusion. Here I have highlighted the church's initiatives and partnerships with the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as well as uh, the Utah Compromise. Academics cuts especially close to home. Academia has spread both notoriety and appreciation of Latter-day Saint tradition, both through positive and defamatory academic writings and the reputation spread by prominent Latter-day Saint scholars. Much of the early uh, academic literature, uh, if you look at uh, 19th century encyclopedias and academic treatises about the ch uh, church, were very inflammatory and uh, uh, it would be hard to characterize them as uh, fair-minded. Uh, this has changed noticeably over the last 50 years, and perhaps especially in the last 25, as uh, high-quality uh, scholarship has, uh, I think, shifted uh, uh, significantly. So in conclusion, I try to think about this issue quite personally. Uh, my thinking about persecution was forever changed when I heard the story of that young Yazidi girl 
who recognized the man raping her as her family's associate. This suggests that at times of stress, neighbors who have lived together peaceably can turn upon one another. It also illustrates how close to home religious persecution can be. It was in the aftermath of that conference and reflecting upon the experience of Latter-day Saints that I saw in an instant of clarity, a little like a light being turned on in a darkened room, that the sources and the solution to persecution are one and the same. Here I have focused on the state, other religious communities, majority religions, the media, the persecuted themselves, business, neighbors, and academics. The roles they play in both persecution and in, and in inclusion. I concluded with academics because I want the implications of the analysis to be personal, since I am an academic who studies law and religion from an international and comparative law perspective. Each of us, from whichever institution we inhabit, is capable, intentionally or unconsciously, of being either a part of the problem or part of the solution. My hope is that those uh, that, that I will be on the side of those who come to the aid of minorities, including religious minorities, who suffer persecution, just as there were those who came to the aid of my own religious community at a time when we were particularly weak and vulnerable. Thank you. Good morning, I'm honored to be here today and appearing alongside Professor Sauss and Professor Duncan, or if they'll forgive me, Brett and Bill today. They have both been serious mentors for me for quite a long time, and I'm grateful for what I've learned from both of them and the opportunities they have provided me. Um, who, each, each of us has chosen to get through the topic of religious liberty in the United States through a different lens. As you just heard, Brett talked about how individuals went from being persecuted to being included. Bill, of course, will explain next what his topic is. My framing stems from the structure of the United States Constitution. As most, if not all of you are aware, the Constitution structure is three branches of government, legislative, executive, and the judiciary. Why, you might ask, does this structure provide a lens for examining larger the same history regarding religious freedom? I answer, larger the same history is repeat with statements by church leaders regarding the importance of this constitutional structure. Reverend conference talks over the speeches, or persons you might not expect, such as dedicatory prayers for our sacred temples. Now, I don't pretend this to be a comprehensive presentation of all relevant quotes on this topic.
topic, well, listen, I do have a captive audience today. I've, most of the quotes I've selected are linked to stories I find intriguing, so you're going to have to put up with a few stories as well. Well, Nathan Norman yesterday gave a much more complete presentation on this topic. I also have a word or two to say about respect for the rule of law. Be that sacrificed by legislators, judicial opinions, or executive action. Before I begin, four housekeeping items. Bear with me, we'll get to the meat. Um, first, I'd like to thank my wife who suggested the reading that prompted the, this entire talk. So, uh, she's helping with our kids today and got him first time, but I wanted to note her for the source of the talk. Second, I'm aware of my cerebral palsy and that our time together is valuable, so if it all works out, I'll remove from the side some of the quotes I selected will be read to you. And I'd like to thank both my f a friend of mine for reading some of them and my father, who's here today, for editing some others. Last thing, I want to note that I am speaking in my own personal capacity, and I am not speaking on behalf of any entity. There you go. All right, now, if there's a thesis statement here, it is this. Rather than think leaders view the structure of the U.S. government as a protection for religious freedom, independent of the rights secured by the First Amendment. Let's start with, let's begin with a very subtle reference to the Constitution structure. Found, this is found in the revelation given to Joseph Smith that at least hints at this importance. For the other descent, we read this passage is Jesus Christ himself speaking directly? I'll go ahead and read this one. It is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. And for this purpose have I, this is Jesus Christ talking, established a constitution of this land by the hands of wise men whom I raised up unto this very purpose and redeemed the land by the setting of blood. Now this isn't a riddle to me, indeed Brother Ahmad Corbett of the Church of the Men's General Presidency spoke in much greater detail on this topic earlier this year. Please note how this revelatory passage linked a crucial civil right, the freedom from slavery, 
to the structure of the Constitution. This was not a reference to the 13th Amendment ban in slavery because that amendment didn't come till 20 or more years after the revelation. At the time the passage was written, slavery was still legal in the southern states. In my view, this revelation view the Constitution structure as a catalyst for the larger development of civil rights. We can see more traces of a respect for civilian and powers <coughs> as we move to the second half of the 19th century. Now, I'm not a historian and I haven't studied the history of polygamy as intently as Professor Soft or the other presenters at this conference who are experts on the topic. But relevant to this respectful rule of law, respectful judicial experience is a journey that involves two Supreme Court cases. In Reynolds, the United States, a major Supreme Court decision that others have and will discuss in more detail, the Supreme Court held that there was no constitutional right to, to, no constitutional right to practice polygamy. For religious reasons. After this decision, President John Taylor, then President of the Church, gave a more defiant attitude. It now becomes a question whether we should obey God or man. Again, I don't mean to be a super historian on this point, but the Taylor presidency was dominated by persecution <coughs> and defiance, efforts to somehow find a solution that would eventually allow polygamy to continue to be practiced, even if it meant defying the law, which many Latter-day Saints did. A subsequent um, decision in 1890 that worked mentioned the late court president of the presiding bishop. Sorry, the late court president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Valerian That case, in 1890, disincorporated the church. But this time, the response was different. Let's see if this audio works. It does not. Okay, that's fine. As you can see on screen, it is what the laws have been enacted by Congress for bringing plural marriages, presidents, Woodruff deters 
his intent to submit to those laws. And really, when it comes down to it, statements that this are compliant with what facilitates Utah State and the start of that transition from persecution to inclusion that Brett talked about. <laughs> Even for working behind and returning to my earlier theme, the next reference comes at the Salt Lake Temple dedication. I'm sorry the recording's not working correctly, but at the Temple dedication we see we fight the the oh God of Israel that fight fits laid the foundation of this great American government, they find a good constitution and laws which guarantee equal rights and privilege to worship the worship God. And now this is the key part, that the officers, both judicial and the executive confer abundant favors upon the president, his government, and Congress. So imagine this for 40 years, <coughs> it took 40 years to build this temple. And one of the things President Woodruff chose to mention after all that struggle was his gratitude for not just the rights that the Constitution provides, but the structure itself. I'm running short on time, but I got to note that Other dedicatory prayers, such as the one in Logan, and had mentioned the Constitution before. I chose this one because it highlighted the structural <laughs> nature of the Constitution. Huh. Well, that's annoying. Uh, I see I can't pull it the next side. But also was just there we go. Um now this is me to talk about Girl Down Rick Smith and here you're getting a bit of a story. <laughs> as me, this, as Mary Jane Woodruff has vividly written, soon after being called as an apostle, Elder George Howard Smith not only suffered from depression, but suffered a debilitating illness that would today be diagnosed as lupus, or something useless, assuming which he was diagnosed with later in life, or was classified as a disease which is still less understood, such as chronic fatigue syndrome. By 1909, even attending one session at general conference, left him, quote, too fatigued for the rest of the meetings, end quote. Subsequently, he was basically unable to function for years, 
been on bed rest at times, taking six months rest bites to both California and St. George and doing very little in terms of tips of us compared to any calling you can name. All of this brings us to his first full length talk in two and a half years and what he said at that talk. After making an appearance and speaking briefly in April 1911, at that conference he gave this full proper sermon in 1911. I think, can you click on that audio button? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Down? There's an audio right there. Uh, it's right there. Okay. The point is, and I'll try. Did that do anything? Oh, good. Well, I try to be concise. The point is, and I'm not going to read this all for the sake of time, but he says, let us stand by the lawmakers and encourage them in the making of just laws and stand by the executive departments and the judiciary in the administration of those laws and so forth. So again, there's a lot one could speak about after two years of chronic illness, but for some reason, he returned to this was starting to be a theme of respect for the Constitution structure itself. He was not a lawyer, he wasn't, as far as I know, classically trained to say of the Holland of Eldergon is today, but he found this important enough to speak on. Let's go forward to 1972, and in some respect, my hometown of Provo, where we got the Provo Temple dedication. President Joseph Friedman Smith read dedicated the temple and the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at that time, President Harold Brady, read this prayer. And again, as in Top Lake, Will the rest the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of our government that each may find some value and courageously in its respective field. Again, this is another sacred, significant occasion and Time is being taken to be grateful for constitutional structure. Now we got another story. This, I selected the approval fair in particular, not just because of the, that the quote illustrates my thesis, but because of its proximity in time to a significant separation of powers event. 
and we can start to do things how to grow in that. Water gates, the water gate scandal fitted the executive against the legislative. <coughs> in the years after the approval, temple dedication, Judge John Speaker hired two eldest law clerks, the Tarquist office in Indian Water. And the Christopherson service was when the Watergate text were released. He was one of the first to hear those tapes. And, and Mr. Wardle served as a doctor afterwards during the trial of some of the co-conspirators of that scandal. And, of course, most of us know that Elder Christopherson went on to become an apostle, and, of course, some of you know that Lynn Wardle went on to be Professor Wardle, Bill and I both worked for him at BYU and Brett was a colleague. Anyway, just a story I thought was relevant given the latter descent, influence and the proximity to that full temple dedication. Later on in the 1970s, and this is where we really, I'm going to have to skip over this for time, but in 1976, then the Edward F. Benson spoke at length about checks and balances, and he went into some detail about what the balances were and their significance. Again, this was a general conference talk, so a very prominent freshman, you see what I'm pointing to, reference to the veto, the Supreme Court's power, and other fine laws and so forth. And that's basically all I have as kind of a footnote to this. I want to talk briefly about something for Daniel the Darwin A. Church start in 2014. That I think ties well with the quote from Frederick Woodruff I said earlier. In, in this conference talk, President Oates talked about various mm, issues that the latter descent today disagree with larger society on. After explaining the judge's stance on several moral issues, he said, when our positions do not prevail, we should accept unfavorable results graciously and practice civility with our adversaries. In any event, we should be pushing the good towards all rejecting persecution of any kind, including persecution based on race, ethnicity, religious belief, or non-belief, and differences in sexual orientation. Time does not permit me to really delve into the significance to me of this quote, but 
Suffice it to say the timing of this quote allowed for, it was significant in the larger <coughs> context of the church's position on same-sex marriage. I'm out of time. Thank you. I'm grateful also for the opportunity to participate, and uh, it, it's fun to have um, one of the few benefits of getting older is your younger colleagues do uh, amazing things in, in their careers, and to, to be a part of watch that happen is pretty inspiring. I'd like to just present kind of a, maybe make a case that um, through the history of uh, religious freedom in the United States as it's developed and, and uh, 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 flourished in some ways, and the, I don't want to give away the ending uh, too fast, but the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has had an interesting interaction with uh, the history of religious freedom in the United States. One thing uh, that I, I, I think I see developing is a kind of a consistency in the claims that the, that the Church has made for religious freedom, but also a slightly uh, a different um, uh, the nature of the claim is a little different than we sometimes hear uh, in, in um, legal arguments for religious, his, uh, religious freedom specifically. And I'd like to kind of describe, uh, take, take my uh, thesis from a piece that I wrote for the Sutherland Institute about uh, kind of a popular essay on uh, r religious freedom and how it's developed in the United States. And, and to do that, I'd like to kind of divide the, that history into four sections that are, they're rough, but I think it, it can illustrate what I'm trying to describe. The first period, I think, is what I would think of as when the aspiration for religious freedom develops in the United States, when it becomes a kind of a part of our, our, the fabric of our, uh, of our nation. Um, they begin, of course, famously during the colonial period when uh, a number of the colonies are developed, uh, at least in part, as a way of providing a setting for um, of uh, religious freedom to occur. The most obvious example, of course, the Plymouth Colony where the Puritans came after being persecuted in uh, England, but also uh, Maryland with the uh, English Catholics who'd undergone uh, horrible uh, persecution and came uh, to the United, St United States, or well, I'm sorry, came to the colonies, what would eventually become the United States, uh, as a place of potential religious tolerance. Um, other examples could be given, but I think the key thing to understand in this um, period is that they were struggling to extend religious toleration uh, to others. I mean, in other words, the, the, and this is, I think, well known, that, that uh, they claimed religious freedom and, and wanted to uh, practice their beliefs you know, according to their conscience, as we talk about, but they did not, um, they didn't always do well at extending that same privilege to others. Um, but having said that, this, this, the, the, the development is very positive over time. Uh, I, I just, one of the kind of uh, positive stories that I love is in 1775 when uh, colonial officials in New York are, are creating a military draft to help uh, um, support the uh, Revolutionary War effort. Uh, the the uh, state decides to exempt Quakers from the draft. Uh, that actually uh, was codified in the uh, state's constitution in 1777. Uh, I think that that suggests that there's an, indi there's an indication, at least, that increasing value is being placed on religious practice in the early uh, 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 colonial period. Uh, there are challenges, of course, both ways, and we all are aware, I think, of the uh, famous situation in Virginia with the jailing of Baptist preachers, and, but then again, on the, on the more positive side, the Act for Establishing Religious Freedom that Thomas Jefferson writes that ends those legal penalties and sets up a, uh, an important um, precedent for the, the U.S. Constitution, which comes uh, shortly, uh, or the First Amendment, which comes shortly thereafter. Um, the, the high point as a matter of uh, 
law as a matter of a, a legal document, of course, is the uh, ratification of the First Amendment in 1791, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And that is where I think, in, as, a, as, a legal, as a matter, again, a, a, of documents, that the uh, aspiration for religious freedom becomes uh, codified. Uh, although I think it's important to recognize that there are some other uh, developments still to come, like the ending of state establishments that comes uh, shortly thereafter. Um, as this period, um, uh, well, yeah, as this period comes to a close and these aspirations are being developed in our founding documents and in the practice to some degree of uh, the states, uh, the restoration process is beginning. Uh, it resulting in, at least in the institutional church in 1830. The early church um, interacted with this formative experience, of course, in different ways, uh, because it comes at, at, essentially at the end of this, uh, of the period that I think of as the aspiration period. But they're very interesting. For instance, the Book of Mormon provides a prophetic endorsement of the providential narrative of uh, the establishment of the Americas as a haven for uh, religious freedom. Uh, Nephi sees and vision the Gentiles coming to the land and being delivered by the power of God out of the hand of other nations. The 1835 Declaration of Belief regarding government and laws in general that's, that's uh, um, contained in Doctrine and Covenants section 134 specifically endorses this, the First Amendment language. We believe that rulers, states, and governments have a right and are bound to enact laws for the protection of all citizens in the free exercise of their religious beliefs. So using that, the language of the First Amendment. Uh, perhaps most interesting to me, though, is that the Latter-day Saint scriptures that Michael's referenced this already include a, re a revelation providing a doctrinal justification for the constitutional rights, including free exercise. Uh, in it, the Lord says that he allowed the, the laws and constitution to be established and that they should be maintained for the rights and protections of all flesh according to just and holy principles. But here's what I think is interesting, that every man may act in doctrine and principle pertaining to futurity according to the moral agency which I've given unto him, that uh, every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. So there's a theological reason why religious freedom is important um, for Latter-day Saints. Uh, for this reason, and, uh, to, and to end the practice of keeping others in bondage, as Michael's described, the Lord explains he, he's established the Constitution. Um, interestingly, these doctrinal endorsements of free exercise not only make the claim for the privilege to worship all, Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience, as the article of faith says, but specifically endorse the same privilege for others. Let them worship how, where, what they may. So from the outset, Latter-day Saint teachings coupled the right of religious uh, free exercise with the responsibility to um, preserve that right for others and respect that right of others, uh, both in the article of faith, but I think impl implied in section 101, all flesh. Um, the declaration in section 134 specifically recognizes how well-established, what I think now is a well-established legal uh, uh, rule, that even constitutional rights such as free exercise can be limited when there's a compelling interest. Uh, of course, Section 134 doesn't use that language, but I think that's applied in this language. So long as a regard and reverence are shown to the laws and such religious opinions do not justify sedition nor conspiracy. And we see uh, an interesting episode in, uh, during, in Nauvoo that was talked about yesterday in the presentations where uh, the church uh, or, or church leaders endorse a very strong uh, statement for uh, religious freedom in municipal law. The second period in U.S. history, I think, is the struggle to honor that aspiration. We have an aspiration of re free exercise, but of course it doesn't actually come off all that well in practice. Uh, we've, we've heard today and, in, and throughout the conference about the persecution of Latter-day Saints. Uh, we, the, we, we should note the persecution of Jews. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, in, in my notes, I thought about um, the fact that uh, Ulysses Grant, as a, a general uh, during the Civil War, specifically uh, ordered expelling Jews from a district that was controlled by the military until Abraham Lincoln revoked that order. Um, the persecution of Catholics uh, is also well known and um, com coming closer to our time period, 
the Jehovah's Witnesses, which I'll refer to in, in a moment uh, a little more. I, so what's the, church, what's the church doing during these times? Well, clearly it's arguing for religious freedom and trying to, to secure some space to, uh, uh, for members to live out their religious beliefs uh, in, in peace. Um, including by following, in, in some ways, the precedent of the colonial period of having, uh, of going to a different location where that would be more likely to happen. Um, but I think, despite this persecution and with some ups and downs, as has been described, the church did continue to um, recognize the responsibility to extend the rights of uh, of uh, religious freedom to others. Um, in the test case that challenged the polis- Polygamy persecutions, uh, sorry, prosecutions that uh, Michaels described, Reynolds versus United States, the church's proposal uh, for uh, a, a way of understanding the First Amendment is very robust, uh, far ahead of its time, of course, uh, because the Supreme Court unanimously uh, rejected that, uh, and in their ruling endorsed a very narrow view of, of the Free Exercise Clause. Uh, Congress was deprived of all legislative power over mere opinion, but was left free uh, to reach actions which were in violation of social duties or subversive of good order. Uh, so that was the Supreme Court's um, reading. But, this, but, the, but, but uh, it's important, I think, to, to recognize that the church's proposal was much broader and would have been more protective of many religious minorities, including those who were persecuted throughout the rest of the, uh, of the 1900s, 1800s and uh, the early 1900s. Um, the... Another indication, I think, of the church's effort to try and be open to uh, the, the beliefs and practice of others was the uh, effort to uh, in, ensure in the different constitutions proposed during the legislative period and then the, the constitution that actually uh, became the law uh, when Utah becomes a state to secure, uh, this is a, a quote I like from a, an old law review article, every imaginable protection for religious freedom. And you do see that in the Utah Constitution, you know, many mentions in various uh, settings of religious freedom. Though certainly, of course, this is imperfect, right? The Latter-day Saints, uh, as, as human beings and as, uh, uh, as a state, the, the, there, was, there was tension occasionally, uh, in, in some cases, extreme. Um, with those who were outsiders. But I think there's evidence that there, was a, there really were good faith efforts going on by church leaders to facilitate uh, the religious practice of other faiths. I noted an article from Dan Peterson who described um, how uh, in May 18, 1873, a Catholic uh, high mass was sung by a Latter-day Saint choir in the St. George Tabernacle. An example, I think, of a good faith effort to try and facilitate the beliefs of others while claiming those beliefs for themselves. The aspiration for religious freedom begins to be embraced, I think, more fully in the 20th century uh, with uh, the well-known cases uh, involving uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses that to result in uh, the, um, uh, I, I think pr- primarily the, the, the one that stands out most probably is the Barnett case where Jehovah's Witness students could not be forced to say the a Pledge of Allegiance or to join in the Pledge of Allegiance, but in other important cases, and ultimately, as we know, uh, or well, uh, the Sherbert versus Verner case where the free exercise clause uh, is interpreted by the court in a way that was, was more consistent with what the church had argued in Reynolds versus United States. What's happening during this period, uh, we, we, we see the well-known uh, examples of the Jehovah's Witnesses and other minority religions to, to uh, practice their beliefs and have those respected. Uh, we, we know that there's a social change beginning with the uh, um, ultimately unsuccessful campaign of, for, of Al Smith to be president, although he was Catholic. But... Some of those things are, are, are creating an opening and some changes. I think that the Reed Smoot hearing could be understood as a, a little bit of an, a legislative version of the same thing, allowing, a, again, a little bit of room uh, for uh, religious minorities to have a place in the, in the um, governing structure. And uh, I think that was also significant. But there are some smaller things that are happening that, that I think also are really important. Uh, the church secures in Utah uh, the recognition of released time religious training, uh, right, in, the, in uh, very early, early on, uh, in the 1930s. Um, uh, 
after meeting with um, uh, President Lyndon Johnson, Elder Boyd K. Packer managed, or as a result of that meeting, uh, managed to, to have uh, chaplain services uh, include Latter-day Saints. That had happened in, during wartime, but did not become permanent until uh, the 1960s at that point. Um, I think often we think of, and, uh, and for good reason, that, a, that these developments are, are kind of could be described as a way of the church entering the mainstream. I think that one thing we're supposed to all could also learn from this, at least, is that there's a the careful, persistent, respectful effort of the church to secure specific protections is actually a is of a piece with their commitment to uh, religious liberty for all people, and they're making uh, careful, measured, not necessarily dramatic uh, claims, and those claims are being respected, and I think that extends the boundaries for others as well. Our current period is the most challenging one to both to describe and to think about its implications because I think uh, we, we, we often imagine history moving in a certain direction and always kind of ineluctably in a certain direction. But in this case, I don't think that's true. The aspiration is established uh, as a formal matter. We struggle to, to meet the aspiration and then we seem to embrace the aspiration and uh, have a period of, of great protection for religious freedom, certainly in the courts. But now that's changing. We see streams uh, that they seem to be converging to make this a period where uh, the specific uh, or the, the exact nature of how religious liberty will be uh, respected in our time is, is now in uh, some doubt. Uh, certainly as a public matter, as people wonder whether or not uh, religious uh, practice actually is worth respecting, many sometimes perhaps because uh, there is less affiliation with religions. Uh, some of the Supreme Court rules have changed, although you know those, there's good and both bad, good and bad news in those changes. But also in the, just the increase in regulation, more things that churches do are going to be legally regulated, and so that creates the opportunity for more conflicts than existed before. So during this period, though, the church's position is, again, consistent but also inclusive support for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the amicus briefs uh, that the church has filed in important religious freedom cases that the, was described yesterday, uh, I, the, the really inspiring ministry of uh, apostles to uh, make a clarion call, often in concert with those of other faiths, for religious freedom and the, and the respect for religious freedom. Um, again, what I hope that we'll see is that the church's claim to uh, that its own religious re liberty would be respected has been consistent throughout time, but it's also been characterized by uh, great respect for the beliefs of others. I'll reference an, another uh, quote from Elder Oaks. Uh, this one also from 2014, it was a presentation he gave at UVU. Uh, and, and I think it's a, a good way to conclude perhaps a, a way of looking forward. He says, I, I believe one important way to move forward on religious freedom is to minimize talk of rights and, in, and to increase talk of responsibilities. From the standpoint of religion, I urge my fellow believers to remember that the scriptures uh, continually talk, uh, or uh, rarely talk, uh, include talks of, talk of rights, only commandments that create responsibilities. Um, and that those who, who maybe have a more pragmatic approach uh, to religious freedom might want to remember that we strengthen rights by encouraging the fulfillment of responsibilities. I believe that's been one of the consistent and important contributions of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to religious freedom is to, uh, is to emphasize both the, the rights of religious freedom but also the responsibilities. And its example has been effective and points a good way forward as we continue to try and secure those rights. Well, thank you. Uh Brett, Michael, and Bill for those uh, fantastic pre presentations. We have a couple minutes for questions. If you'd like to uh, come up here and, and speak in the microphone and ask questions to our presenters, uh, please go ahead and, and do that. I guess I'm... I'm curious to, to hear 
feedback on what the current climate holds as threats to religious freedom and what kinds of safeguards or, or safety measures can we take in our current environment to, to protect reli religious freedoms. Uh, I think uh, there's a very broad consensus uh, politically and legally in the United States about the importance of religious freedom as, as a, a constitutional right and also as an important American value. Um, there are several trends that give those of us who think about religious freedom all the time pause. Uh, let me just uh, mention uh, a couple of those. One is, uh, in contrast, even as recently as the late 1990s, there is a politicization of religious freedom along party lines that is disconcerting. Uh, there used to be a very broad-based um, uh, bipartisan uh, support for religious freedom. This was seen in the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It was also seen in the passage of the International Religious Freedom Act in the, in, in the 1990s. Today, polls show that there's a much greater uh, divide between Republicans and Democrats with respect to uh, religious freedom. And this tracks, to some extent, political divisions on uh, social issues, uh, including same-sex marriage and uh, transgender rights. The second thing we notice is a generational uh, difference. Uh, if you look at the public polling on religious freedom, uh, let's call it the uh, post-World War II generation, the baby boom generation, is much more favorably disposed towards religious freedom than the subsequent generations. And it appears, it appears that the support for religious freedom goes down through uh, Gen X, millennials, post-millennials. Post and so the long-term uh, health of uh, social attitudes towards religious freedom uh, is uh, somewhat worrisome. The third thing I would note is um, a decline in religious affiliation. Uh, this is uh, something that is happening ac across uh, US society. Um, the uh, percentage of people who identify as religious uh, continues to go down, and that's especially acute among uh, younger generations, but not just younger generations. And so, as you might imagine, uh, the interest in religious freedom is higher among those for whom religious is, religion is an important part of their identity than for those uh, for whom it is not. The, uh, the, the last thing I'll mention is in the post-World War II period uh, until the end of the 1990s, the most powerful institution politically in the branches of government that supported religious freedom was Congress. Uh, 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 the support of Congress was stronger than the support of the courts, and the support of Congress was uh, stronger in many cases than uh, the uh, executive branch. That has changed significantly. Today, the institution that is most protective of religious freedom is the Supreme Court. And uh, uh, executive branch interest varies based upon uh, party affiliation of uh, the president. And uh, uh, Congress's support for religious freedom has gone down. I view this as a, a very negative and worrisome trend, because I think it's actually when the people's branches of government, uh, Congress especially, has a robust and a dynamic appreciation for religious freedom, that it's most likely to be uh, vindicated and valued. Uh, uh, we have a backstop of a Supreme Court that is uh, quite protective of uh, religious freedom, but 
Supreme Court justices all have an expiration date. Uh, they do have lifelong uh, tenure, so we don't tend to feel the thrust of those changes very uh, dramatically. But I worry that we are increasingly reliant upon courts uh, for protecting religious freedom and less reliant upon uh, 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 legislatures. So I think for those of us who care about religious freedom, what we want to do is uh, be mindful of each of those trends to try to find a consensus that is bipartisan, that's cross-generational, uh, and that moves beyond just litigating. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, so I like litigation, but we want to uh, protect religious freedom, not primarily through li litigation, but primarily through uh, the culture and uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the political culture and the social culture that we seek to cultivate in our own communities and in our own spheres of influence. Thank you so much. We're actually out of time, but um, just want to give one more round of applause to the presenters. Um, right now we're going to break for lunch um, for the participants, uh, for the presenters and moderators, if uh, we could just meet out in the lobby. Um, and for anyone else who's coming, there's a lot of great options nearby. You have City Creek just across the street, and down below we have the church cafeteria. So uh, thank you, and we will reconvene at 1 p.m.
Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Nelson, and I'm an associate historian for the Joseph Smith Papers at the Church History Department, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's session of the Church History Symposium. The theme of our session today is Voting Rights Denied, Polygamy and the Idaho Test Oath. At the start of this session, I will introduce our speakers in the order in which they will present their papers. Given that each presentation is finished within the time allotted, we should have between 10 and 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, for anyone that would like to text a question, both in this audience and then um, for any online viewers, uh, please write this number down. It's uh, similar to the numbers that we had earlier today and yesterday. It's 385-799-5772. I'll keep that screen up and we can uh, have some of those questions when the time comes. As a gentle reminder, please make sure that your cell phones and computers, laptops, all those alarms and sounds are turned off if you can. All right, and here are our speakers for this afternoon. John C. Thomas has been a faculty member in the Department of Religious Education at BYU-Idaho for over 20 years. In addition to teaching, he has published research about Latter-day Saint history and BYU studies, the Journal of Mormon History, the Religious Ed Educator, and other venues. His graduate training and early career uh, were in international relations and political science. With colleagues from other disciplines at BYU-Idaho, he developed and continues to teach a general education course on religious freedom. He and his wife, Maria, are the parents of three adult children. John S. Stinger is a graduate of the S.J. Quinney College of Law, University of Utah in Salt Lake City, where he was an editor of the Utah Law Review. In addition to a Juris Doctorate, he holds degrees in political science and history from the University of Utah. He has published in the Journal of Mormon History, John Whitmer Historical Association Journal, Idaho Law Review, and Utah Law Review. He is presently a deputy, excuse me, a deputy prosecuting attorney for Ada County in Boise, Idaho. And Hannah Young is a doc doctoral con candidate at Brandeis University. She studies the intersection of families, law, and religion. Her dissertation examines the ways that polygamous families kept secrets about their families as the federal government, and then the church itself tried to end the practice of polygamy. Hannah received several grants to further her research, including from the, the Mormon Studies Fellowship at the Tanner Humanities Center at the University of Utah. And with that, John Dinger, or excuse me, John Thomas. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, happy to be on a panel that seems like we're going to give you three good slices and an important question. Uh, I'll begin by sharing with you some of the terms of the Idaho Test Oath while you think about the purposes that may lie behind this particular method for crowd control. Uh, Harvey Smith, when he defended this law before the Supreme Court, described it as a law enacted to discourage the practice of crime. His friend and ally, Fred Du Bois, described it a little bit more uh, politically. It was to end the time when John Taylor and his lieutenants would smother the independence of men's individual actions with impunity. For Du Bois, it was a law about orthodox politics. For Smith, at least before the court, it was a law about crime. When Governor Bunn of the territory signed the law, according to Du Bois, he commended the legislators for their wisdom and broad Americanism. Nonetheless, this law created some problems for Latter-day Saints. Uh, one of whom is Samuel Deere Davis. Here in 1887, he's pictured with his wife Mary Jane and their children. In 1888, he with 16 other Latter-day Saints from the, uh, 17 Latter-day Saints from the Samaria Ward, uh, resigned their membership in the church in an effort to register and vote. Uh, five months after the election, they with another group of men from two neighboring wards were indicted for the crime of conspiracy. Between indictment and trial, Davis had the good or bad fortune to be called as a counselor to the bishop in the Samaria ward, and he was the only man convicted under these charges in September of 1889. That conviction led to a writ of habeas corpus. On denial of the writ, the court went directly to the Supreme Court for what would be the third attempt at constitutional review of the law's validity. My focus is going to be on the arguments put forward on both sides, but especially those on behalf of Davis and the church, and how they failed and yet have had staying power in the years since. This is the team that would be representing Samuel Davis. Uh, Franklin Richards, the son of an apostle 
a young but already experienced lawyer arguing with some success and failure. Cases before the Supreme Court was joined by two DC veterans, both former congressmen uh, who were helping the church on this brief. Uh, Jeremiah Wilson would join Richards before the court at oral argument. Representing Idaho was a 32-year-old Kentucky transplant, also the author of the law, who would represent the state before the bar. This 32-year-old man, Harvey Walker Smith, won 9 nil, a unanimous decision from the Supreme Court. Uh, how that happened, uh, I hope to explain. I want to suggest it has less to do with his lawyer abilities than with the standard of review the court adopted for reviewing the arguments. Looking back, Du Bois said that Wilson made the others look like pygmies, and he wasn't, he wasn't downgrading their skills. He just thought Idaho won with a slam dunk. But, <laughs> As you'll see from the briefs prepared by each side, uh, there was more going on than a simple oral argument. Uh, I draw your attention to the length of the brief for the appellant for Davis's side, more than two and a half times the length of that for Idaho. This doesn't just mean they were verbose, it meant that they were fighting a battle. They already knew the court had approved many measures to reduce and eradicate uh, the crime of polygamy, and the burden of proof was heavy on the side of Davis and the church to show that the territorial legislature had not acted unreasonably when it decided to disfranchise a whole class of people in the name of monogamy. Uh, I'll show you briefly what the partisans thought of the arguments. This Tribune was confident that Smith would win. The Deseret News thought Richards did a very fine job. It really doesn't matter what they thought. What matters is what the court decides. These are the challenges that the Council for Davis would put forward, a First Amendment challenge, a 14th Amendment challenge, and a unique challenge suggesting that Article 6 of the Constitution was also violated by the letter, if not the spirit, of the law. I'll remind you of the wording of those relevant clauses in the Constitution. Uh, I'll be summarizing briefly um, each of the sets of arguments, some of the problems they encountered, Idaho's rebuttal, and then try to take you uh, closer to our day. So on the First Amendment, the great constraint upon Davis's team was the precedent the court had already created. Uh, Reynolds was the key First Amendment interpretation in play. Reynolds was a case declaring it completely lawful for Congress to criminalize polygamy. And the, the great contention before the court was if being a member, joining a church, should also be subject to civil uh, liabilities. Uh, within the constraints of Reynolds, the council pointed out that the court had, had not simply said, you can believe anything you want, but once you act, you'll be regulated. The court had actually used Jefferson, somewhat dubiously. They'd used Jefferson as a First Amendment authority. And Jefferson's statute, his Virginia statute, had reminded government that they should act only when there are overt acts that break out against peace and good order. So Richards and his colleagues pursued the line that church membership did not seem to fit that definition. It had certainly never been criminalized. They also quoted the whole Virginia statute to emphasize Jefferson's point that civil rights have no dependence on religious opinions and that religion, not just Protestant Christianity, stood equal before the, the law. They also quoted a lot of founders, a lot of scholars, and a lot of state constitutions, all to make up for the fact they didn't have much on their side when it came to actual case law. One thing they wanted to do, besides making the point that no one had yet specifically criminalized membership in a church, even a church that taught things that had been uh, regulated, was that Congress had done things against polygamy that Idaho trans uh, transcended. Idaho went further than Congress. The 1882 Edmonds Act specifically prevented registration officials, election officials, from discounting the votes of those who had favorable views 
toward polygamy. As long as they did not commit the crime of polygamy or unlawful cohabitation, they were eligible to register to vote and have their votes counted. The 1887 law uh, said a little bit more. It had a specific oath in section 24 uh, that those who vote may not directly or indirectly aid or abet, counsel or advise any other person to commit the crimes of polygamy or unlawful cohabitation. From the point of view of Idaho, they were simply enacting that policy, but uh, counsel for Davis tried to show there was a difference. In fact, they quoted an exchange between Senators Hoar and Edmonds in regard to the 1887 Act. When Senator Hoar asked if Edmonds intended to disfranchise all members of the church, Edmonds frankly replied, no. I do come out and say, frankly, I am not in favor of anything of the kind. And yet it was for 26 pages, 27 pages of argument about the First Amendment, an uphill climb. The appeal based on the 14th Amendment in some ways anticipates developments in the law um, more fully. Here, counsel wanted to show that Idaho's act had created a, a suspect class, in essence. They had created discrimination against a certain class of citizens, and though the 14th Amendment had been inspired by the fight against racial discrimination, they argued that religious groups should also be protected by its promises of due process and equal protection. If it was a fundamental principle of government and liberty, then that implied that religious claims should be considered, and here they actually did have some case law on their side. Previous decisions of the court had extended protection beyond black Americans to whites, uh, at least in theory, Irish Americans, and specifically that year to Chinese residents who had been impacted by the administration of what seemed to be a neutral law. Uh, the core idea here was that if you had been franchised, you could not be deprived of it without the due process of law. And they even went so far as to cite a case that would be used by the other side regarding Virginia Minor, a Missouri woman who had tried to register to vote back in the 70s because she was a citizen. Unfortunately for her and for them, the court had specifically said, no, you may not. Uh, citizenship did not equate to a right to the franchise. But as they made this 14th Amendment claim, they wanted to emphasize how far-reaching the language of that amendment was and that it had implications for the way we read other uh, core protections of the Constitution. This report from the Salt Lake Herald just emphasized this deep equality claim being put forth by Richard. Surely it is unlawful discrimination that a person takes the sacrament or is baptized and thereby loses the right to office or voting. Their most novel claim for the, or against the law, was that it violated Article 6 of the original Constitution. Uh, here the specific language wasn't so much the key as the principle that all consideration of religion should be excluded in fixing the political rights of citizens, in some ways an echo of their 14th Amendment argument. Um, they spoke of the anomaly of being able to run for the highest office in the land, yet not able to vote in the same election. And they made the point that Idaho's law seemed to be written in such a way to exclude one particular membership, uh, one particular organization, the one that taught the doctrinal right of celestial marriage, if you know which one that is. So, it was in some ways a way to leverage their claims under the 14th and First Amendments about the need for equal protection of religious groups under the demands of those amendments. Ready and waiting was Harvey Smith with his response. Uh, an unusual situation to have a 32-year-old lawyer defending a law he wrote before the highest court of the land, but that's what he did, and he did it well enough. The core of his argument was that the, the right to vote simply was not protected by the 14th Amendment. It was not equated with the rights of citizenship, with the privileges and immunities. 
In connection to the First Amendment, he had the comfort, or I should say on the 14th, he had the comfort of a recent Supreme Court decision, Murphy v. Ramsey, which had specifically allowed the exclusions made by the 1882 Act, and unfortunately for the church, had also said legislatures have wide discretion in setting qualifications for the vote. For example, it could be limited simply to married men. Uh, he used that, by the way, to say, if you were a Catholic clergy and could not vote, or you were a shaker and could not vote, you surely wouldn't win a First Amendment claim because it happened to exclude you on religious grounds. He also was comfortable citing anti-Chinese statutes to say if Chinese were Confucians and they were barred from political participation, surely we wouldn't expect them to win a First Amendment or 14th Amendment uh, argument. Most of the First Amendment uh, argument was met simply by invoking what Reynolds had said. Polygamy is a crime duly regulated by the law. If you belong to an organization that teaches and practices polygamy, you are at least in some ways implicated in a criminal class, not a religious class. And therefore, Idaho had simply cleaned up some of the loose ends in regard to congressional policy it had not uh, violated any constitutional limits. When he was done, uh, I think it was something of a formality, <laughs> but it was clear that Idaho was vindicated. In his ruling, Justice Stephen Field said there was not any <laughs> constitutional or legal objection to the terms of Idaho's law. The legislature had exercised legitimate power and had used reasonable a reasonable method, reasonable qualifications for those who would vote, including excluding from the vote those whose advocacy essentially might protect crime or the laws that criminalized it uh, by defeating those laws. Most of the arguments put forth by Richards and colleagues, I would say, were simply ignored. At times, the, the court simply quoted case law and arguments put forth by Harvey Smith. So what changed since then? Uh, the court slowly would adopt its role as a protector of minority rights, and that began with a case about milk, which really has nothing to do with what we're doing here, except that in a famous footnote, Justice Stone suggested that there were times when the court would not be deferential to uh, legislative authority. If a discrete and insure the minority, or if liberties in the Bill of Rights were impacted by the law, a government should expect more exacting judicial scrutiny or searching judicial review. That very year, uh, this famous footnote was put into effect when members of communist organizations found relief for the first time. The court reversed itself, asserting that um, Membership in an organization that either advocated or even had members practicing crime would not automatically expose you to the penalties of the law. In coming decades, that far-reaching 14th Amendment would come to protect religious minorities, sexual minorities, racial minorities, and even racist minorities from the penalties and sanctions of the law. If we had time, it would be fun to talk about each of those cases, but I will just highlight crucial moments in the 1940s when Jehovah's Witnesses uh, won relief from general laws by showing the burden that those placed upon their religious practice, followed in 1963 by relief for an Adventist woman who, as the court said, had been placed in a position where she must choose between following the precepts of her religion and forfeiting benefits. As Professor Gordon mentioned yesterday, this is an important moment. Uh, that decision was announced the same day as a decision that ended Bible study to start the day in Pennsylvania schools. Some people were outraged that this court could do such a thing, but the court in both cases, the free exercise and establishment case, was responding to the needs of minorities burdened by laws made without them being in mind. 
Uh, that, pro that trend continued into the 80s before hitting a serious bump, even a reversal in 1990 in employment division versus Smith. Here, two men who'd lost their jobs for the sacramental use of peyote sought relief from the government, uh, specifically unemployment benefits like Adele Sherbert had in the 1960s. To the surprise of many, Justice Scalia said that was a luxury the court could not afford to impose. He, with four other justices, rolled back the expectation that strict scrutiny, the compelling interest test, would be used when neutral laws of general applicability burden religious exercise. He encouraged religious minorities to petition for relief and accommodation at the political branches, which is not the most reassuring suggestion. However, as bad as it might look, to have a law that basically now has removed special protection or just constitutional protection for First Amendment complaints. Uh, as Smith has been applied, it actually led to the official demise of the court's reasoning about the Idaho law. Three years later, uh, Santorians who wanted to perform animal sacrifice found themselves essentially hedged out of a city by the, the ordinances in place. As the court reviewed their complaint, it found that this was not a neutral law of general applicability, and therefore the government must show interests of the highest order were being met by means very narrowly tailored to accomplish their purposes. Just as Anthony Candy said, they manifestly failed to do so, and in fact the law showed evidence of hostility, although it was covert. Importantly, in this unanimous decision, the author of Smith, Justice Antonin Scalia, reminded us where he stood. He was confident that such a law, a law that singles out religious practice for special burdens, could not be characterized as neutral. And though he was less confident than Justice Kennedy that one could track down judicial hostility, uh, he was sure that not being neutral was enough to be a problem. Three years after that, a gay rights case, an important, one of the first important gay rights cases, uh, led to a specific reversal on Davis versus Beeson. Uh, a Colorado amendment had made it essentially impossible for lesbians and gays to get relief from non-discrimination statutes, and the court found that law wanting on many 14th Amendment grounds. Uh, Justice Scalia dissented. His dissent obliged the court to say specifically about what was wrong with Idaho because Scalia had said, Idaho did something much worse and we unanimously approved it 100 years ago. These were the two key flaws in Idaho's law according to the court in 1996. Um, Advocacy should not be the basis for exclusion from the vote and the, group, the action and status distinction, which Harvey Smith had blurred, which his law had blurred, and which the court had blurred, uh, was not enough to, uh, was actually suspect and would be subject to strict scrutiny and most likely fail. Uh, as I conclude, I just want to talk about the death of Harvey Smith and the birth of his law and think about what it means. Uh, this young man at 35 was appointed to Utah's territorial Supreme Court having successfully defended Idaho's statute before the Supreme Court, having defended Idaho's constitution, which adopted the statute before the United States Congress. He then continued his winning streak as an associate justice in Utah, then died in office at the tender age of 38. At his passing, his success in defending the law was respectfully noted. 35 years later, Part of the birth of the law was revealed for the first time in what the Idaho statesman called the most dramatic incident in Idaho's history. As I conclude, I'd just like to draw your attention to two things. I'm not sure the gun would have made that much difference in the way the Supreme Court reviewed the Idaho law in 1889. Cole Durham has said the central drama in religious freedom is about something kind of boring, the standards of review. But the standards of review make a great difference. And though Idaho's former attorney general thought perhaps publicity about the means by which the bill became a law could have affected its validity, it's all about the burden of proof. In 1889, 
a very deferential Supreme Court assumed that the territory, like the nation, had good reasons for eradicating a crime, though often they failed to distinguish between the crime and the church, between the practice and the people. But once that law was subjected to stricter scrutiny, it was going to be dead. Thank you. So any attorney will tell you that in trial, you start with a really good witness, you bury your so-so people in the middle, and then you finish off with a superstar. And so I feel uh, right where I should be in the middle. <laughs> in an Idaho State Conference in May of 1885, Heber J. Grant told the assembled crowd, the Constitution guarantees us freedom of faith and religious action as long as it does not interfere with the rights of others. This statement was made a few months after Idaho disfranchised all Latter-day Saints. The passage of this law in 1884, known as the Idaho Test Oath, prohibited Saints from voting, serving on a jury, and holding public office. However, the Idaho Territory was not the only jurisdiction to attempt to disfranchise their citizens through a Test Oath. A Utah oath was passed in 1882 through the Edmonds Act, and an 1887 oath was passed through the Edmund Tucker Act. Uh, the, the state of Nevada also passed an oath resembling Idaho's in 1887. While many saints were um, uh, avoided prosecution by hiding, uh, they were also told by George Q. Cannon to make a fight in the courts. And so these legal fights over these oaths took place in federal, state, and territorial courts where the saints had varying le levels of success. Through their efforts, the Nevada law was ruled unconstitutional in 1888. The saints were able also to mitigate the harshness of the federal law. However, they were unable to do anything in Idaho. The saints attacked the law through many lawsuits, but it was continually upheld as constitutional by the courts. In the Idaho case, Davis v. Beeson, which was eventually appealed to the US Supreme Court, the test oath was once again upheld. And this caused the church considerable worry as the saints could then be disfranchised in all territories, including Utah. When President Wilford Woodruff abandoned plural marriage, one reason he gave was that the anti-polygamy laws, quote, have been pronounced constitutional by the courts of last resort. And this was done in part because of the holding in Davis. In 1882, Congress passed the Edmonds Act, which created the new law of unlawful cohabitation. It prohibited jury service of certain individuals and disfranchised polygamists. Regarding voting, the act stated that no polygamist, bigamist, or person cohabitating with more than one woman would be permitted to vote. This did not prohibit those believing in the doctrine of polygamy, just actual polygamists. And it should also be noted that this law did not specifically impose a test oath it simply prohibited the right to vote of certain individuals. Prior to the Edmonds Act, the right to establish voting guidelines was granted to the Utah Territorial Legislature through their Organic Act. So since September 1850, it was the, legislator, the, the legislature uh, who would prescribe those voting qualifications in Utah. However, in that same Organic Act, the supremacy of federal law was also declared quote, that the Constitution and laws of the United States are hereby extended over and declared to be in force in the territory of Utah. So thus, federal law prevailed. The Edmonds Act also created the Utah Commission, a board of five individuals whose job it was to enforce voting requirements. Uh, they got right to work and they passed a test oath requiring all voters uh, to take an oath where one had to swear in part I am not a bigamist nor a polygamist. So this oath did not uh, sit well with the people of Idaho, I'm sorry, with Utah, and many challenged the law in court, uh, including the voting provisions. So the Utah saints, polygamist and non, registered to vote, um, and these attempted registrations and registrations led to many lawsuits, which eventually uh, went up to the Supreme Court in a case called Murphy v. Ramsey. So on March 23rd, 1885, Justice Matthews delivered the decision in Murphy v. Ramsey. George Q. Cannon was actually present at the Supreme Court uh, and described it as, 
partly favorable, though the general tenor was unfavorable. And uh, his description was spot on. Uh, it was something of a mixed bag. It upheld the Edmonds Act uh, as a whole, but found that the test oath was unauthorized. In explaining the overreaching nature of the oath, uh, the Supreme Court declared that the commission was not authorized to, pre to prescribe any qualifications for voters as a condition of registration, and that it was without force and of no effect. So had the decision stopped there, it would have been considered a great win for the saints. But sadly, it didn't. Uh, after declaring the oath itself unauthorized, the court found that the act was constitutional, specifically the section that held that no polygamist shall be entitled to vote. So in discussing Congress's authority to pass such laws, the court declared, the people of the United States as sovereign owners of the nas national territories have supreme power over them and their inhabitants. So it's these reasons why territories, especially Utah, wanted statehood as soon as possible. The court continued, stating that it was Congress who decides who shall participate in the election of its officers in the territories. And uh, they also reminded the saints that they may therefore take from them any right of suffrage it may have previously conferred. So Congress listened uh, to the Murphy decision because in 1887, when they passed the Edmonds-Tucker Act, they included a test oath for polygamists requiring anyone who planned to vote, serve on a jury, or hold office to swear to it. Uh, they also, in just an absolute fit of meanness, disfranchised all women. But the oath passed by Congress required the individual to swear several things, including that they would obey the Act of 1882, uh, as well as they will not, directly or indirectly, aid or abet, counsel or advise, any person to commit any said crimes, referring back to polygamy. Now, this oath, the 1887, was never challenged in court per se, but in Anderson v. Tyree, a women's suffrage case in 1895 before the Utah Territorial Supreme Court, they did hold that, quote, the oath of the Edmonds-Tucker law applies to all territorial elections. So while the federal test oath and voting pre prohibitions were difficult for Utahns, male and only male, Utahns were still largely able to work around them. 90% uh, of Latter-day Saint men were still able to take the oath and vote. Thus, the use of federal law in disfranchising the saints was not particularly effective. So in 1886, Washington wanted to annex Northern Idaho into its territory and Nevada wanted to annex southern Idaho into its state. So Nevada, believing that this would happen, felt the need to pass a test oath similar to Idaho's so that when they stole southern Idaho, uh, those saints would continue to be excluded from politics uh, as soon as they were in Nevada. So at first it was proposed to do this by constitutional amendment, uh, which was the right answer, but they believed that that process would take too long. So in March of 1887, the Nevada legislator passed a law disfranchising all Latter-day Saints and passed a test oath. And this oath stated in part, I am not a bigamist or a polygamist, that I neither teach nor practice bigamy or polygamy, that I am neither a member of nor belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly called the Mormon Church. So as you'll notice, this oath did not only focus on the crime of polygamy, but also prohibited membership in the church. Nevada's oath was the only one that said the name of the church by name. So on March 3rd, 1887, the bill became a law. <clears throat> so the annexation bill, splitting up Idaho, passed Congress on the same day, March 3rd, 1887. All that was left to do was President Grover Cleveland needed to sign it. Idaho lobbied hard, and the president did not sign the bill, electing the pocket veto, saving uh, Idaho territory. So while annexation was dead, the test oath was still law, but it was never really enforced. Even though it was never enforced, uh, Latter-day Saint George B. Whitney arranged a test case where he tried to register to vote. He told the registrar that he was qualified to vote under the Nevada Constitution, but he could not take the 1887 oath as he was a member of the church. But then he made clear to them that, quote, this was the only reason why he refused to take the said oath, or in other words, I'm not a polygamist. 
So on October 8, 1888, the Nevada Supreme Court found the test, lo test oath law unconstitutional and inconsistent with the Nevada Constitution in State v. Finley. The decision looked at the right of suffrage granted by constitutions and held that it is not in the power of the legislature to deny, abridge, extend, or change the qualifications of a voter as prescribed by the constitution of a state. So in very harsh language, the court noted that if the legislature could simply pass a law disfranchising Latter-day Saints, quote, it could by like methods exclude from the elective franchise all persons belonging to any other church or members of any political party, social organization, or benevolent order. They went, into, went on to talk about how in effect it would make the Constitution worthless as voting rights, quote, would be placed entirely at the mercy, will, and caprice of the legislature. So because Nevada was a state and there were constitutional guarantees of suffrage, disfranchisement didn't work. Though test oaths Th thus, test, test oaths would be ineffective in states unless done by a constitutional amendment. So on to Idaho. Unlike Utah, the saints in Idaho had to fight for the right of suffrage on two fronts. First, they had to fight laws passed by Congress that applied in the territories such as the Edmonds Act, but they also had to contend against local laws passed by the Idaho Territorial Legislature. It was these local laws that ultimately led to the US Supreme Court decision in Davis. Idaho, like other territories, uh, were given the right to determine voting qualifications through its Organic Act. When a new territory is formed, Congress would pass an Organic Act that would sort of function as a constitution of sorts until the territory could earn statehood. And Idaho's act stated that after the first election, uh, the legislature would then decide those qualifications. So the Organic Act also set up a system that led to severe distrust of the federal government. The act stated that the governor, secretary of the uh, territory, the judges, the US district attorney, and the marshal would all be appointed by the president. So because they were political appointees and not elected, they were not accountable to Idahoans. The only positions that could be held by actual Idahoans were the territory legislative seats, but under that same organic act, legislative acts could be vetoed by Congress, theoretically voiding home rule, and they were. So other problems faced by the appointments were the fact that many of the federal appointees were inefficient or just plain corrupt. One secretary of the territory fled the territory with the legislator's entire financial budget, a governor also quickly, quickly left the state, taking with him over $45,000 uh, allocated for Native Americans. Another governor was removed when evidence was shown of his absences, his theft of public funds, and the selling of pardons. And so Idahoans just really disliked these carpetbaggers, as most were also appointed by Republican presidents, whereas Idaho was gen generally a Democratic state during its territorial period. And so this led to a severe distrust of the federal government, which is still felt in Idaho today. Both political parties in the territory also largely agreed they wanted home rule for Idaho. Further, non-Mormon Idahoans also felt they would never become a state with the Mormon problem unresolved. And so the non-Mormon citizens of Idaho felt the government, federal government was not doing enough with the Mormon problem. So when the Edmonds Act was passed, <clears throat> Idahoans were not impressed. Um, while this act was unpopular with the saints, just like Utah, uh, it became clear that they could work within the system as there were many saints but few polygamists. And seeing the ineffective nature of the Edmonds Act, non-Mormon legislatures in Idaho attempted to strengthen these laws for years. So the Idaho Test Oath was finally passed by the territorial legislature in 1884 disfranchising all Latter-day Saints in the territory, prohibiting them from jury service and from voting, as well as holding public office. And this law was only passed after two Mormon legislators lost their seats in a disputed election in which forged telegraphs were sent, purportedly from President John Taylor, and forged ballots were used. So with the Saints losing these seats, an oath was passed that disfranchised not only actual polygamists, but any, quote, member of any order, organization, or association which teaches, advises, counsels, or encourages its members, devotees, or any other person 
to commit the crime of bigamy or polygamy. So after this test oath, George Q. Cannon told the Idahoans to fight. He told them, it was cheaper and better for us to make a fight in the courts than to have the same treatment meted out to us that we formerly experienced, namely having mobs drive us from our homes. So the first major case challenging just the voting aspect of the test oath appeared before the Idaho Supreme Court in Enos v. Bolton. And this case dealt with a Latter-day Saint in Bear Lake who attempted to take the oath. Uh, the case was argued before the Idaho Supreme Court in February of 1888. Ultimately, the court held that <clears throat> the right of suffrage is not a natural right, nor an unqualified personal right. Rather, they said, it is something that can be granted and taken away by the government. Thus, they found the act constitutional. The next major attempt at invalidating the law was Woolley v. Watkins in September of 1888. Uh, Woolley sought to register in Bear Lake County. He offered to take and subscribe to the oath. He felt that he could sincerely do this as the church in Idaho had been silent or quit teaching polygamy since 1886. Uh, they just didn't teach it. And so at the district court level, he was ruled against. The judge found that the doctrine of polygamy had not actually been discarded. Quote, these doctrines and teachings have not been repealed, and that membership in such organization is inconsistent with the right of such member to vote under this law. Eventually, the Idaho Territorial Supreme Court heard the appeal on whether the test oath violated the free exercise clause of the First Amendment and whether it due whether it violated due process. The court cited United States v. Reynolds for the doctrine that the government cannot interfere with mere religious belief and opinion, but they may with practices. They found that the support, teaching, advocating was more than a belief. Regarding the due process claim, the court rejected it holding, the right of suffrage may be granted, abridged, or taken away by the government in its discretion. The third major attempt resulted in Davis v. Beeson a case that reached the US Supreme Court. In April of 1889, Samuel Davis was indicted along with 55, under, 55 other individuals for a conspiracy to unlawfully pervert and obstruct the due administration of the laws of the territory. Specifically, he withdrew from the LDS church, voted, and then rejoined at a later time. So in September 1889, Davis's trial was held where he was conviction, convicted. And his actions after the trial show that this was an intentionally created situation where he would be arrested uh, so he could apply for a writ of habeas corpus, which when denied would require, or I'm sorry, which would create an additional appealable issue. So church lawyers made arguments regarding religious liberty, mainly uh, arguing that membership in the Mormon church should not lead to being disfranchised. Uh, as you heard a minute ago, they argued the free exercise of religion, the application of the 14th Amendment, Article 6 of the Constitution, and they also tried to argue that Congress has already legislated on this issue, so Idaho can't. Idaho Saints didn't have to wait long for the court's decision, as it was delivered by Justice Field on February 3rd, 1890. And the opinion cannot be viewed as anything other than a blistering rebuke of Mormonism. Field discussed Reynolds, uh, Reynolds and distinguished it from Davis. Uh, Fields reiterated the holding of Reynolds, saying that laws are made for the government of actions, and while they cannot interfere with mere religious belief and opinion, they may with practices. He then gave an example of impermissible religion, uh, I'm sorry, he gave an example of impermissible religious belief and opinion, human sacrifice, and asked if one would seriously consider that the government could not interfere to prevent a sacrifice. He asked, can a man excuse his practices to the contrary because of his religious belief? In answering himself, Justice Field said, to permit this would make the professed doctrines of religion, religious belief superior to the law of the land, and in effect, to permit every citizen to become a law unto himself. Crime is not the less odious because sanctioned by what any particular sect may designate as a religion. The opinion then turned to the Idaho test oath and, their, and the ability of the territorial legislature to prescribe voting qualifications. They looked at the Idaho Organic Act and found that really the only limitations it placed on the Idaho legislature is that a voter had to be 21 years of age and that they could not deny voting based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. 
Beyond that, Idaho does have the power to, quote, prescribe any reasonable qualification of voters, including the Idaho test oath. So the Idaho test oath was upheld and ruled constitutional. There was nothing that would prevent the other territories or Congress from passing a similar law. And so the fact that the Idaho test oath could be passed in all the territories was not lost on anyone. The Utah Commission planned to impose an Idaho test oath on Utah. Congress looked at imposing an Idaho test oath on the territories. Years later, attorney Franklin S. Richards recalled that after Davis was decided, quote, Senator Cullum and Congressman Strubble presented bills in Congress providing that no person being a member of any religious organization that sanctions the practice of polygamy should vote, serve as a juror, or hold office in Utah. Candidly, Richards went on to admit that Davis was one of the major reasons for the manifesto. He continued, quote, the imminent danger of these bills passing Congress was the immediate cause of the issuance of the manifesto. I was in the president's office on the morning of September 25th, 1890, when President Wilford Woodruff came in and stated that the Lord has made manifest to him, after much prayer and supplication, that our people must submit to the law inasmuch as they had exhausted every legal means of showing its unconstitutionality. And so in conclusion, I'll argue, it was not the federal government or the Utah Commission's work that led to this. Rather, it was the citizens of the Idaho Territory, distrustful of the federal government and wanting statehood and home rule, who worked through the systems of territorial law to accomplish their purpose. Thank you. Set up here for a second. All right, well, thanks for all coming out, sticking with us to the end of the conference, um, or close to the end at least. Um, I've appreciated my uh, co presenters' real deep dive into the Idaho test oath. Um, I'm gonna do a much more uh, skimming type of, type of action as I, as I move forward. Um, and what I'm interested in talking about, my presentation is called Mere Opinion, Polygamy and the Reach of Law in the United States. And I became really interested in the idea that Congress um, or any kind of legal power could have uh, control over what, what they call in Reynolds, mere opinion. All right, so in 1879, the landmark Reynolds v. United States case, Chief Justice Waite articulated a framework for how to understand the free exercise of religion clause of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. In his decision, he created a distinction between religion as, quote, mere opinion and actions which are in violation of social duties of good order. Congress, in other words, did not have the power um, did not have power over religious belief, but could legislate it over actions done in the name of religion, especially if those actions were harmful to the order of society. The example of Mormon polygamy, therefore, set an important precedent in ruling on important religious freedom-related cases in the past 125 years. Yet a closer look at the Mormon case after Reynolds, uh, Mor yeah, the Mormon case after Reynolds, broadly speaking, reveals a much more complex legacy than what we have perhaps assumed. The distinction between religious belief and religious practice is not as clear as Waite initially assumed. Furthermore, both lawmakers and the people who administered the law continued to police religious thought in addition to action. Federal and state officials were, after all, not only wary of men who practiced plural marriage, but anyone who believed in the practice as well. A closer look at the ways that Mormons interfaced with federal law, judges, and courts can show scholars how difficult it is to separate religious belief and religious action. So on face value, Justice Wade's differentiation between belief and action seems not only valid, but also necessary. 
Exempting any religious action would, as Waite tells us, make the professed doctrines of religious belief superior to the law of the land and in effect permit any citizen to become a law unto himself. Yet in many cases, it was not merely enough to police a religion based on the actions of its adherents, but also American Protestants cared deeply about governing and disciplining those with nonconforming beliefs. Scholars of secularism have taught that religion, religions must demonstrate themselves as consistent with, quote, the basic requirements of modern society, including democratic governance, unquote. Um, they must demonstrate themselves as compassionate, forbearant, as adhering to the senses and awe of the wonder of the universe, organizing charitable, charitable impulses, and directing ethical um, conflict and nourishing the spirit. That's the role of religion. So to many 19th century detractors, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints propelled adherence into a blind faith and barbaric family practice. Justice Field wrote in his 1890 Supreme Court opinion that the spread of the practice of polygamy is in measure a return to barbarism. It is contrary to the spirit of Christianity and of civilization which Christianity has produced in the Western world. So returning back to, secularists, um, to secularism studies, uh, Peter Coviello has written that religions that fail to demonstrate their compatibility with, with the modern or the secular nation as Mormon, Mormonism had in the end of the 19th century do not appear as religions at all, or at least re legitimate religions. Instead, they appear as bad belief. He uses this term, bad belief. Religious beliefs, not merely actions, made certain people dangerous to American society. What follows then is a series of examples of, of moments where Mormons faced exclusions or penalties based on their belief in polygamy, or more broadly, their membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Some of these examples come from federal laws, such as the Edmonds Act, and others from state laws, such as the Idaho Test Law, or um, Test Oath, and as my, my colleagues have so eloquently talked about today. But in the spirit of what Sarah Berenger Gordon yesterday called lived law, I'm going to make an attempt at, at talking about some of that as well. All of this creates a picture of a legal system with a mar, uh, far more complex relationship to religion than what Justice Waite dictated in his Reynolds opinion. There was no guarantee of protection for religious action from the Constitution, but there was an assurance for the protection of religious beliefs. All right. So excluding people on the basis of, of their beliefs was exactly what Congress had in mind when they passed the Edmonds Act in the spring of 1882. The Reynolds decision three years prior had given the green light to the federal government to pass the legislation that would, be, would give more teeth to the previous ineffective Anti-Bigamy Moral Act of 1862. In order to effectively prosecute polygamists, they knew that they needed to exclude anyone from the jury who was sympathetic to the practice. The Edmonds Act therefore disqualified any juryman who not only is or has been living in the practice of polygamy, bigamy, or unlawful cohabitation with more than one woman, but also for any man who believes it's right for a man to have more than one living and undivorced wife. And yet, I wanna be careful here. What the Edmonds Act did was facilitate the exclusion of Mormon jurors. Justice Blatchford can confirm this in the um, Claussen Supreme Court case um, challenging this section of the law that the whole scope of the law is to describe what should be the sufficient causes to challenge, um, uh, to challenge, sorry, the whole scope of the law is to pr prescribe what shall be sufficient co um, cause to challenge um, a jury member, basically. So excluding people from jury service based on their beliefs was and is common practice to ensure a more just trial outcome. The Edmonds Act just empowered the district court to filter out um, people and act within their powers of exclusion. Choosing a jury is normally a mundane exercise, but it became something the, the Utah newspapers regularly reported on. Though admittedly not front page material, court reporters still preserve some of this drama. Three men, 
quote unquote, fell before the Dixon sickle because of their belief in a man having more than one living and undivorced wife at this time, remarked one reporter rather dramatically in 1886. The belief of, of another man disqualified him from the honor and glory connected with the seat um, in the jury box. In contrast, another man did not believe in plural marriage, and as he was not a Mormon, he was accepted. All right, so the, the application of this new exclusionary law was something that the Mormon press also lost no time in protesting. The Edmonds Act, wrote, um, wrote one journalist, is a bold reversal of the maxim that a man should be tried by his peers. Mormons also took aim at the idea that the federal that federal prosecutors excluded Mormon jurymen in grand juries convened for the purpose of indicting a number of different types of cases, not only crimes related to polygamy. Should Mormons not also have the ability to weigh in on cases unrelated to polygamy in their community? The Edmonds Act was a tool for district courts to sift Mormons out of the jury box, not just for polygamy, but for other ones as well. All right, so now I wanna talk about judges and their discretionary power and how belief factored in um, to their decisions as well. So another form of, of vulnerability for Mormons in this time period was the process of naturalization. As a result of long-term missionary work all over the world, but especially in Europe, Utah had a large immigrant population. Naturalization laws in the 19th century meant that judges got to decide whether the applicant has, quote, behaved as a good man of, or behaved as a man of good moral character, attached to the principles of the Constitution of the United States, and well disposed to the order and happiness of the same, unquote. Utah judges during the 1880s were, however, unconvinced by applications for citizenship among Mormons. The trickiness of presenting one's belief played out in court one day in June 1889 as a number of Mormon men came before Judge Henderson to be naturalized. The first man, Peter Ellis, according to one court reporter at the Deseret Weekly, was, quote, about to be sworn in when one R.D. Winters interposed asking if Mr. Ellis was a Mormon. To this, the reply was affirmative. Do you, believe in the, do you believe the doctrines of Mormonism to be true, was the next question. Mr. Ellis replied that he did. This was followed by, do you believe polygamy to be moral, morally wrong? To which Mr. Ellis's reply was, no, sir. And, it was made, and this was the basis of the rejection of his application. The next man, Hugo Peterson, was a bit more prepared. He admitted to having, um, he admitted to believing in polygamy, but he said that it was not right under the law. The judge persisted, asking Peterson if polygamy was, quote, morally wrong independent of any law, unquote. Peterson conceded, that he, um, conceded and said that he did believe that it was morally wrong. The judge was, was still not satisfied, though. At this moment, Peter's lawyer interjected, saying that his client had answered all the questions regarding his allegiance to this government and has done so satisfactorily. What this man may believe has nothing to do with it, but it is actions and the sincerity of his intentions um, that has to be ascertained. Peterson was finally admitted as a citizen, but only after he testified that he would vote to convict a polygamous husband of unlawful cohabitation and would not take a second wife even if his church commanded it. Scholars of Mormon history have long debated the true effect of Wilford Woodruff's 1890 manifesto calling Latter-day Saints to quote, quote unquote, obey the law in regards to polygamy. It took over a decade for the Latter-day Saint community to settle on a definition of what the manifesto actually meant. Yet only a few days after it was ratified in the October General Conference, Judge Zane pronounced that his approval, pronounced his approval of this recent statement by Wilford Woodruff. He continued, perhaps a little prematurely, that he understood that, quote, members of the Mormon church hereafter must regard plural marriage or polygamous marriage as violation of the creeds and the doctrines of their church, unquote. In light of this new change, Zane declared that he would not make the simple fact that an applicant is a member of the Mormon church a bar to admission as a citizen of the United States. 
The good news for men seeking naturalization had a downside for polygamous men who had sentence hearings after the manifesto. Days after the manifesto was ratified in general conference, a man named Michael Clark stood before a judge in, Ut in the Utah federal courts waiting for his sentence. Clark had, had pled guilty to the charge of unlawful cohabitation and furthermore had said that he had divorced his first wife and legally married his second wife. So there's no problem here, right? And certainly before the manifesto, there wouldn't have been a problem. He would have received a pretty light sentence and moved on. Judge Zane, however, was not yet satisfied with Clark's resolution. He asked Clark if he, quote, understood the manifesto recently put forth by the church was against polygamy and that hereafter it would be against the creed of the church to practice polygamy, unquote. Creed, er, Clark agreed that it was his understanding and left the court with only a small fine. Five years earlier, it would have been sufficient for a man to merely promise to obey the law and receive a lighter sentence. After the manifesto, judges wanted to hear men give an interpretation of the church's re most recent statement and say that they no longer believed in polygamy. The men that pled guilty, um, the men would plead guilty and then often prompted by judges offered that um, they considered polygamy or quote, considered polygamy right to a certain extent, but since the recent action taken by the church renounced all such beliefs, unquote. So it was no longer sufficient to just have stopped practicing polygamy. Obtaining a lesser sentence meant that you also had to make a, a pronouncement that you had stopped believing in it as well. And in this moment, I just want to take a moment to uh, recognize Jeff Turner in the audience uh, because he presented earlier this morning about some really interesting uh, stuff related to this topic in immigration law and specifically the ways in which um, immigration law and immigrants would also be asked as to their practice and importantly for this, for my topic, their belief about polygamy. And so, oh, I don't know who that was. Um, so yeah, I just want to recognize that there's also some immigration, Im um, there's implications here for what's happening in immigration history as well, although I don't really have time to cover that in the moment. So the last thing I want to talk about is, um, the Idaho Test Oath. The Edmonds Act passed in 1882 had already barred polygamists from voting, but anti-polygamists in Utah and Idaho felt that they could go even further. Idaho had the Gentile majority that Utah lacked, and after a brief debate, the Test Oath went to, into effect in February 1885. The law dictated that no person was entitled to register or vote at any election who is, quote, a member of any order, organization, or association which teaches, advises, counsels, or encourages members, devotees, or any person to commit the crime of bigamy or polygamy. Um, and it goes on for a little bit, but I'll just cut it off there. The Idaho Test Act was aimed not just at polygamists, but also the Mormons who believed in the practice. And I think this is really important, right? And this is a distinction that, as I've looked I would love to hear from my fellow presenters because I didn't, in my kind of review of the Davis Beeson case, I didn't see anything about the fact that Davis was a monogamist. And, and that seems really important to me because, um, you know, the, the opinion shared by the judge, um, the chief justice, uh, was just all about how the evils of polygamy and how that needed to be legislated against. But there was not as much of a recognition that they were taking aim not just at polygamists, but also at believers um, or members of the church. So I think that that is a really interesting, important distinction that gets a little lost, um, at least in the documents that I've read so far about Davis Beeson. Um, so I'm going to conclude now so that we maybe have a little bit of time for questions. Um, I want to return back to Reynolds and how Chief Justice Waite asserted that Congress was deprived of all legislative power over what he called mere opinion. Yet, as we have seen, opinion matters. Congress also had no qualms, um, in the, especially in the 19th century, against le legislating against um, racial identities, institutional affiliation. And that's something that I think is really important about the Davis-Beeson case. Um, 
is that is that it's what they're really taking aim at is an institutional affiliation or a membership, um, even if even if they wouldn't frame it as a belief. There's a the fact that your identity is as a Mormon in this moment. That's that's what matters. Um, but but we can look at a ton of different moments in 19th century history and early 20th century history and find that actually identities have have very few protections. <laughs> you know, the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, um, later institutional identities such as um, in 1903 excluding anarchists from entry and then communists in 1920. All of those, um, you know, identities was not, it was a more precarious uh, protection. Um, so in conclusion, I have, I still have a, a way to go with processing and making sense of these historical and legal examples. The presentations of this morning, um, but also today, or our current panel, convince me though that there really is something to be written about the messiness of belief and the way that belief has been policed, both in formal bills, but also on juries, voting registration, sentence hearings, border encounters, naturalization proceedings, and so on. The secular and Protestant impulse in America meant that belief not only mattered, but could be almost as threatening as religious action. Thank you. All right, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. These mics here in the aisle should be on, so uh, you should be able to come here and, and, and um, state your question. Thank you. Okay, this might be a silly question, but has the Idaho test off been repealed? Yes. <laughs> so what are the circumstances of that? Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, after the manifesto, uh, Latter-day Saints in Idaho thought, okay, we can vote, um, but the Democrats blocked them again, passing even more strict laws, basically a law in 1892 kind of saying if you've ever been a Mormon, you don't get to vote. Um, however, shortly after that, Republicans started making inroads with the, the Mormons who were mostly Democrats. Um, they decided, hey, they, they didn't have our back, let's, let's link up with the Republicans. And so the Republicans started um, helping them get the, uh, their vote back. So legislation was passed, so by 1896, they were able to vote. However, the test oath was put into the Idaho Constitution, and it was not removed until, until 1982. And uh, to show how we uh, are viewed, even in 1982, uh, only two thirds of uh, the voters uh, voted to remove it. So there was still a third of Idaho who wanted it left in. My, my question might be for Hannah or someone else that uh, I was doing my family history and in uh, South Dakota and I came across naturalization documents for someone and there's a line in there that says, are you a polygamist or practice polygamy or whatever? Do you know the history or anything about how that ended up in the naturalization documents f anywhere in the, in the country? I don't know if you could answer that question. I would like to call Jeff Turner to the... <laughs> No, actually, so Jeff Turner is writing his dissertation about about this. Um, and so just, you know, briefly, we know that that um, the United States really cared about uh, letting polygamists in. And they still ask people today whether they're a polygamist when there are um, questions about green cards or coming into the United States. And so, yeah, that's... Uh, so that question is not, it doesn't surprise me. Maybe since it was happening in a naturalization space, it's a little bit different, but yeah, I would recommend going to talk to Jeff Turner if you want more. Yeah, go for it. Just, just to, to add to that, and I, I agree, Jeff Turner's probably the authority, but as soon as the 1879 case is decided, uh, the executive as well as Congress begins to actually blur the distinction. And in 1879, in a cabinet meeting, Secretary of State Everett said, we actually need to issue a memo around the world suggesting that the need to tap down Latter-day Saint missionary work and immigration from other countries in the interest of enforcing the, the anti-polygamy laws. And so from 1879 through the next few decades, really, 
there is this sense where the law actually doesn't maintain weights framework, uh, not just discretion of individuals, but things enacted in statute, in formal policy, executive orders, uh, basically begin throughout, it isn't actually in the interest of the government to make a nice distinction. Having poor distinctions maintains pressure on the church to get compliance. So I have a couple of related questions. One, uh, just coming at the whole belief action distinction, which, which can't be the real definition of religious freedom. It's just because if, if you would then maybe have freedom, in the, you could still have freedom in the gulag. I'm sorry, I can't stop my watch from ringing. Uh, uh, so, uh, but interesting in international law, what you typically see is people talking about the distinction between forum internum and forum externum. And one of my questions is just uh, as people write about this and talk about this, and as we've talked about it today, no one has mentioned that. I wonder if that sort of if that distinction is something that crops up explicitly in in the in the cases like the Idaho cases that you're talking about. Uh, then the, the other part of this is, and it's really more at, directed at Hannah. I mean, obviously, it, it seems like you're saying, uh, gee, if we look at these cases, it's hard to tell action apart from uh, mere thoughts. And, and this is true all over the law. I mean, we have mens rea requirements. We have all kinds of mental requirements. And since we don't have access to other minds, these are always dealt with by behavioral standards. But it, seemed, but it, it almost seemed to me like you were saying, well, look, uh, we have to, this is a messy distinction. And so uh, the law takes uh, mere thought into account all the time. I think it's a really important legal point that it doesn't take that. And this was a mistake, a constitutional mistake in those cases. Uh, do, I, I mean, and, and that we've got beyond that, which is very significant. And I just, what, where, where do you stand on, on that issue? Do you think it would be a good thing to, to blur this distinction, or should we really have something like the forum internum, forum externum distinction and abide by that very carefully? Well, well, you know the international law better than we do, but I'll, I'll just say this. Um, Richards makes the case before the court that belief is absolutely free. The inner forum cannot be constrained in any way, but he is explicitly, they spend a lot of time, and so did other advocates in the Idaho cases to say, it is not simply belief versus conduct. Lots of conduct is protected. Membership in a church has never been criminalized. If it's never been criminalized, how can it be an overt act against the peace and good order, which again is not constitutional language, it's Virginia statute language. But they made that case again and again, and it's not really until the 20th century that you begin the court using new verbs, right? Burdened, uh, impeded, um, a costly trade-off, talking about external behavior right, conduct religiously inspired, which is being met by some sort of civil penalty. Tr tr to try to have a fairer distinction than this initial one. So when I see Reynolds glossed, as it is in the things my students read, as a belief action distinction, it's, hope, it's perfectly useless. Because as you've said, you'll be free in the gulag to believe all you want. You have to have some line drawn, and of course what the court does is it says, let's make the case for why polygamy is beyond the line of overt acts that, that threaten peace and good order, and the case they make for why it's such an act is racist, it's xenophobic, it's Christian, um, it's a poor case. It wouldn't be used today. The arguments used to show why polygamy met that standard would not work today. So it's good to begin with the distinction, but it's, that's not even where they drew the line. And how they drew the line is subject to, you know, criticism. I have nothing more to add to that. <laughs> Uh, 
I just have some, uh, I'm, I'm curious about how uh, the Davis versus Beeson is argued, right? Because it's interesting in the polygamy cases because um, uh, they're, invoking the, they're invoking the 14th Amendment. Um, and I am wondering is, uh, do the civil rights cases or the slaughterhouse cases, which had recently been decided, are they showing up in the, in the arguments uh, over the scope of the 14th Amendment and how are those being used or interpreted? Short answer is yes. The, the, uh, the brief for the church for Davis cites them. It also cites Cruikshank. It cites Yik Wo v. Hopkin. Uh, it cites things that give hope that the 14th Amendment is not just about barring racial discrimination. But nothing happens with those citations. So we've got to national origin by 1889. Nothing else will happen until the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It's not till the 60s that the Supreme Court agrees that the vote is a fundamental right where restrictions, you know, lots of restrictions could be subject to strict scrutiny. So they really are ahead of their time when it comes to 14th Amendment. The difference is they at least have a little case law to buttress their, their argument, unlike the First Amendment. All right, so we've reached the end of our time here. I wanna thank all of our uh, panelists again, please. Uh, Join me in applauding the, their efforts today. And um, yeah, thank you again for coming.
Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this uh, uh, panel session uh, for our Church History Symposium. Uh, my name is Scott Esplin. I'm the Dean of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. I'm grateful to be partnered, we're grateful to be partnered with the Church History Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and for their hosting us here uh, at the church office building today. Uh, this panel is entitled, Anxi is entitled Anxiously Engaged in a Good Cause, Religious Freedom at Home and Abroad. Uh, we're grateful again for your attendance. Uh, I will uh, just take a minute to introduce the panelists and the moderator. Um, but before we do so, we'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, President Dallin H. Oaks, uh, First Counselor in the First Presidency of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, together with Elder Garrett W. Gong, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We're grateful for your presence. Our panelists include uh, Sister Sharon Eubank, uh, Sister Sharon Eubank is the first counselor in the first presidency, or sorry, in the, in the first, sorry, <laughs> different person in the room. Uh, Sister Sharon Eubank is the first counselor in the general presidency of the Relief Society of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At the time of her call in April 2017, Sister Eubank was employed as the director of Latter-day Saint Charities, the humanitarian organization of the church, and she continues in this role while serving in the Relief Society. Born in Redding, California, she served as a full-time missionary for the church in the, Finley, in the Finland Helsinki mission and received, and received a degree in English from Brigham Young University. Since 1998, she has been employed by the church well, church's welfare department, and in 2011, she was named the director of, of Latter-day Saint Charities worldwide. Michael O. Levitt served in the cabinet of President George W. Bush, first, at, first as administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, and then as Secretary of Health and Human Services and as a three-time elected governor of Utah. As a member of the Church Communication Committee, he has been actively involved with religious freedom issues for more than a decade. In August 2021, he became president of the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. He and his wife Jackie grew up in Cedar City, Utah, and now reside in Salt Lake City. They have five children and 15 grandchildren. Elizabeth A. Clark is an Associate Director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies at Brigham Young University. Professor Clark is an expert on religious freedom in Eastern Europe and comparative law and religion. She has written over 40 chapters and articles and edited several books on comparative and U.S. law and religion issues and religion in post-communist Europe, including co-editing religion during the, during the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Prior to joining the law school, Professor Clark practiced law in Washington, D.C., where she was a member of an appellate and Supreme Court litigation group. She graduated summa cum laude from Brigham Young, from Brigham Young University's Law School, where she served as editor-in-chief of the BYU Law Review. W. Cole Durham, Jr. is an emeritus professor of law at the J. Urban Clark Law School at Brigham Young University, where he held the Sousa Young Gates University professorship. He is founding director of the law school's International Center for Law and Religion Studies. From its official organization in 2000 until 2016, Professor Durham was director of the center, which was organized to provide an institutional base for long-term initiatives in the field of law and religion throughout the world. Professor Durham holds a degree in philosophy from Harvard College, and he joined the faculty at the, of the law school in, in 1976, just one year after he received his, his own Juris, Doc, Do, Juris Doctor degree from Harvard Law School, where he was a note editor of the Harvard Law Review and managing editor of the Harvard International Law Journal. Throughout his long career, he has been heavily involved in comparative law scholarship, with a special emphasis on, co on comparative constitutional law and religious liberty. Our moderator today is Gary B. Doxey. Gary B. Doxey is an associate director of the International Center for Law and Religion Studies at the J. Urban Clark Law School at Brigham Young University. He joined the center in 2005 and serves as regional advisor for Latin America. He has authored several commentaries on, on draft legislation and a number of amicus briefs in Latin America. He also teaches in the History Department at Brigham Young University. Professor Doxey's career has been divided between academia and public service. Prior to joining the BYU Law School, he was General Counsel and Chief of Staff to Utah Governors Mike Levitt and Olean Walker and served as Deputy Commissioner of Financial Institutions and as Associate General Counsel to the Utah Legislature. He has a PhD in History from Cambridge University and a JD from Brigham Young University. We're grateful to have such a distinguished panel today we're grateful for their willingness to take their time to share their insights and expertise with us. Uh, at the conclusion of their panel, 
uh, uh, Professor Doxey will conclude the panel. At the conclusion of their panel, we will take a brief break uh, for uh, approximately 15 minutes, after which we will assemble for the final session of our conference, where we will be blessed uh, by a message from Elder Garrett W. Gong. Uh, we turn the time over to Professor Doxey and their panel. Thank you. Thank you. What a pleasure to be with you. It really is an honor. I'm so glad that we're having this symposium as a part of church history to reflect upon religious freedom and religious freedom's role in church history. I myself, as a historian, both a historian and a lawyer specializing in religious freedom, have often reflected on the close connectedness of our history as Latter-day Saints to, to the quest for religious freedom. You can think of many of the panels, many of the people have spoken about different aspects, but it really is quite incredible, and I think it's fair to say that um, religious freedom, the quest for religious freedom, is in the DNA of the Latter-day Saints uh, as part of our history, as part of who we are, part of our core doctrine as well. Well, with this distinguished panel, we thought we would reflect on, on various areas of religious freedom questions, <clears throat> as well as the history of the church and the, the current situation of the church as well, and a, a future prospective look we have such distinguished panelists. Um, I, I want to open with a question about, um, about what have been effective mechanisms, effective efforts in helping to build and strengthen religious freedom. And I thought perhaps first we could ask the question in the context of interfaith activity. And, and uh, we are blessed with panelists who have significant experience with interfaith dialogue with respect to religious freedom, with respect to humanitarian work. So let's start first with Sister Eubank, if you wouldn't mind. I'd like you to, to help us understand what you have learned in your humanitarian work, interfaith or interreligious humanitarian work, and what have you learned about religious freedom? And what do you think is the essence and the, the benefit of interfaith work with our, for our Heavenly Father's children? Well, let me say I'm so grateful to be at the part of this distinguished panel. I sometimes feel like that Sesame Street thing of one of these things isn't like the other, but thanks for inviting the humanitarian <laughs> to come along. And I'm especially grateful for this uh, chance. Uh, I guess I would start out by saying it's, it's so multifaceted, but uh, I, I was thinking about last August, there was, a, there was a newspaper article about in one night, three Latter-day Saint chapels in southern Utah, there was some arson. And you know, it just went by in the news for me. But I started getting uh, emails from friends that I had in the Middle East who were saying, we're so sorry that this happened. We, I don't know how they saw this about southern Utah. And I kind of smiled. I thought, this must have looked bigger in the news that they saw than it actually was in real life. But I couldn't quit thinking about that. And I started thinking about their experiences and, and what it meant for them to reach out to somebody of another faith and express solidarity as something big like this had happened. And I started thinking about institute, I mean, things that I had known about, like when ISIS was sweeping down into uh, Iraq, and you've got the vicar of Baghdad who lives across the street from the humanitarian missionaries, and he suddenly got 5,000 people of, of various Christian and Yazidi faiths in the courtyard of his church. And he said, I don't have any food. So he came to the, to the one person that he had made friends with who lived across the street, who was a missionary from Salt Lake City, and said, I, I need help with food tonight. And because of that little friendship that they had, something great happened. Similar thing with the Chaldean priest in Mosul. He's trying to bring families back, and they don't have a school. And he, he contacted you know, members of our church and said, can we do something? Uh, lots of different instances. I was with, I, I just followed President Nelson when he went to the imam from that terrible shooting at Christ Church in New Zealand and, and held him by the hand and, and said he would pray for his doctor. I guess my point is it's those relationships that get built that allow these interactions to happen. When religious freedom is, is blown apart, it's a failure of, of these relationships. And when it works really well, when we're able to do something like we're doing today, it's, it's, we're, we're building up relationships that will help us 10 years from now, 20 years from now, in friendship. So that's, to me, what this is all about. And it's, it's tremendous that, to be a part of it. I'm really grateful. 
Thank you. Others, others wish to contribute. You've had experience interfacing with, with members of other faiths, other religions in the work of religious freedom or in aspects that could influence uh, how, how well religious freedom is respected in the world. Experiences you'd like to share? Sure. Yes, Elizabeth, please. Well, in our work at the International Center for Law and Religion Studies, we've seen what Sister Eubank said, that it's a matter of connection, of working with people of all faiths. I've worked with Anglicans, Zoroastrians, and everyone in between. Um, but what I find is I learned so much from them, and together we can make a principled stand for everyone. Mm -hmm. That it's not just a matter of, I have a problem, come help me, but to reach in solidarity, to reach in love for our brothers and sisters of other faiths, that at its best, religious freedom is about the principle. It's about caring for all people to be able to worship as they choose. Cool. So my experience for the last eight years has been working with the G20 Interfaith uh, Forum project. And this is a project to try and make religious voices uh, meaningful in global policy formation processes. And it's interesting in a number of ways. Uh, there's been, the G20 is fundamentally about economics and financial problems that grew up after the 2008 crash and so forth. But country, the, each year, one of the G20 countries is the host country and they choose priorities. And the priorities, in addition to the financial issues, tend to include uh, some of the UN's sustainable development goals, which are goals that religious communities have always had. And religious communities work together to, to help. And so it seemed to me that uh, the idea of trying to formulate global policy objectives without taking religious voices into account is, is a problem. And so it's, it's been a remarkable opportunity to work both on these larger global issues, among which religious freedom is one of the key issues. And I think one of the things I've sensed is, first of all, just the strength of relationships as uh, Sister Eubanks is talking about and as, as Elizabeth was. But also, uh, we live at a time when people are starting to lose the sense of why religion is so important. And one of the things that's very persuasive is when you see some of the positive things that religious communities do in terms of health care, in terms of education, in terms of uh, dealing with poverty issues and dealing with just a whole host of issues. And uh, it's a tremendous opportunity to be able to work with other people to really try and prioritize and find things that can really be done and, and be done together. We've had in the past couple of decades, I suppose, an increased awareness in news stories and elsewhere about religious freedom. And um, part of that is because we are facing, in both in our country as well as in, in some other countries, we're facing challenges we hadn't anticipated before. Um, there are a number of challenges that are out there, the things that we need to worry about. Um, as, as we reflect on those issues, I, I wonder if we could start with one, but then let's broaden it. One of the f first challenges that comes to mind is that there is increasing politi politicalization or partisanship when it comes to religious freedom conversations. Governor Levitt, I wonder if you could reflect on that a bit and maybe help us understand, if you have a perspective, how that partisanship came about and maybe is there a solution on the horizon? Are there ways to alleviate that partisan divide? I'm happy to respond to that. I would like to um, offer a thought on the previous question. Oh, please. Uh, I think what unites us is a sense of our common pain. It is uh, our common interest in being able to defend something that is extraordinarily important and valuable to us. I think the commonality of that experience draws us together and causes us at that point to begin to realize we do have things in common. But at, at the root, it is a, a common defense of something dear to us. As respects to politics, um, I think uh, matters related to uh, the issues that are often in dispute are about a difference in values that people have. 
And there's nothing that makes for good politics like differences in values, <laughs> uh, particularly when you get into uh, partisan politics, where the rule is you win by drawing extreme positions and drawing as many people as you can to those positions. Uh, differences over the existence of deity is a fundamental basic value on which there is difference. And it is a means, therefore, that it becomes very political because it becomes the means by which uh, people are able to draw extremes and then use those extremes uh, to uh, draw out their political ambitions because it really means something to people. And uh, I think that at the root is why this has become such, uh, or will always be a political issue. It's about our core values. Are there ways we can alleviate the, the partisanship? I'm thinking, for instance, in, uh, in response to the, to the Smith case in 1990, for those who've listened to some of the panels about that case, in response to that, we ended up with the Religious Liberty, uh, I'm going to get it right, Restoration Act, <laughs> Religious Freedom Restoration Act, that was passed nearly unanimously by Congress and signed by President Clinton that sense of unanimity, the universal um, appreciation of religious freedom seems to have slipped. Is there a way we can get back there? Well, I, my own view is that it, it is a reflection of the fact that we are in a nation that is divided in terms of our core values. And uh, again, then you add then the dimension that this is the way you maintain or keep, get and maintain power is to polarize and to draw as many people to you, it's not likely, in my view, that absent substantial hardship that begins to create a sense of, our, of common pain that goes across politics, it's unlikely that we will. However, history is re replete with situations when uh, nations are divided and hardship comes that we begin to then turn to things that have greater substance than the politics of the day. And I think that is likely what I hold the greatest hope in. Thank you. Yes. So I, I would say uh, you're probably right, Governor, unfortunately, that it's very tough. Uh, and polarization in the current social media context and so forth is, is likely to uh, uh, continue. Uh, it's, I think it's very threatening. Uh, but I, I do think there are things that, that where religious freedom can really make a difference. After all, Religious freedom historically is the, the value, it's sort of the time-tested value about how you deal with deep difference. It's been more successful than any other social remedy we know about. And uh, so it's important, that, and it's important that we sort of constantly remind ourselves of that. I think uh, some of the empirical work that's been done that shows the high correlation between protecting religious freedom and all kinds of other social goods, uh, I think that's uh, very helpful and needs to be more reinforced. Uh, uh, I, I think we need to, I, I think one of the problems, well, I think we need to find ways to be civil and to come together and to remind people of uh, just how much good religion does. One of the problems we've got right now is that uh, people associate, too many people associate religion with problems, and uh, they need to be reminded just how much uh, uh, religion contributes to the life and well being of our society. And then to be reminded that it can't really serve those roles unless it can operate freely. Thank you. Yes, please. I just want to build on something that Cole said because so many people under 30 years old are really motivated right now by social good and doing what is good and healing divides. And I think there's some work to be done to, to link those desires for social good back to religion, which is millennia tested in ways that we can bring people together and fight against that idea that it's not the problem. It is the solution to the problem yeah. if, if we can talk about it in productive ways. So I appreciate that, Cole. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. These are wonderful comments. It, it sort of leads to a more general uh, question. Uh, Cole mentioned um, that religious freedom is the, the best way we know for helping people in, in society to live together with deep difference. Um, it leads to a, a, a probably a more encompassing question. 
Do any of you have any reflections you'd like to share about why religious freedom is important, other than those, obviously, that you've already shared? Yes, yes. Elizabeth. Well, one thing I was thinking as listening to my co-panelists is that religion in the U.S., religion anywhere in the world, touches people at the core of their identity, um, whether they believe or not. Um, and I think one thing is helping to people to understand not only the tremendous good that religion does, which I think definitely needs to be more carefully and better explained, but the sense that religious freedom is about opening a space for everyone to be able to have identity about their beliefs in God and transcendent things or not, that it gives a space for freedom. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights described it as sort of that this is a privileged right for the atheist as well as the believer, that if without the space to make those choices, you don't really have religious freedom. Uh, I, I would say, I mean, there are a lot of things I would say about this, uh, so I've got to restrain myself. But number one, uh, I think it's important to look at the concept of dignity. At the center, we've do, been doing a lot of work on the basic role of dignity. Dignity is a concept that all kinds of, all sides of the culture wars are trying to capture. The good thing about the idea of dignity is it's not totally capturable, and it has the virtue that it tends to point our vision upward, reminds us of our identity, uh, but, it, uh, but, but it's very significant. I've, I've also thought uh, over the years, and I, uh, uh, I'm conscious of a speech that President Oaks recently gave in which some of the key ways that, uh, that religious freedom is foundational, uh, it's historically foundational because most of our other rights actually trace back to religious freedom issues. It's philosophically foundational because it really uh, it defends the right to have the world views that shape our other that are, shape our other philosophies. It's institutionally foundational because it shapes and protects the institutions that really protect the seedbeds of uh, our ideas and our values and our hopes and, and dreams. And it's empirically foundational because we know a lot more now than we knew 200 years ago when religious freedom was just a, a social experiment. Uh, by some courageous pioneers, <clears throat> and, uh, our founding fathers. Uh, but it's, we know a lot more now that it really works. Uh, it really generates stability in society. It, it, within a broad range of pluralism, it protects the stability and working of society. It's, it is a remarkable uh, and somewhat miraculous institution that we need to protect. Before you move on, yes. can I say one thing? Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think about the angle. People always want to know, well, what's your angle with religious freedom? You know, what, what's in it for you? What are you really going for for your own population? And there's something really powerful when you can give evidence that there, there is no angle for me. This, is actually, this, this probably doesn't benefit me, but I'm standing up for it. Yeah. And the examples that I like to give to people are, Thomas Kane, Alexander Donovan, the citizens of Quincy, Missouri, there's nothing about their standing up for this minority religion uh, in, in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s that benefited them. They could have been court-martialed for it, but they were willing to, 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 to die on the principle of it. And when we turn around and do that like Quincy or like Alexander yeah. Donovan, then we give evidence, I care about this as a principle. This is a foundational, philosophical, core part of my truth. It's not an angle for my religious segment or you know, my yeah. segment of, of, of society. I care about it for everybody, and I'm giving evidence by my action that I do. So this, would you say that uh, among the approaches then for defending and upholding religious freedom should be this outreach? We've talked about the interfaith aspect of it, but also this sort of universal sense that this is, this is a common heritage, and I need to help you if you're in trouble. That would be an important thing that we, as Latter-day Saints and, and supporters of religious freedom, ought to engage in. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say over the years with the work of our uh, center, uh, it's, I, I think virtually everything we've done has been done with other groups. 
Uh, now, sometimes this is like in the in the in the 90s when we were working with the sort of transformation of Europe or of Eastern Europe. Uh, it was bringing people together from multiple countries. So you would get, uh, as people were working on legislation, that you would get not an American view, not a, a German view, but, but you would have a, a people able to see a, how this is coming in from a lot of different perspectives and to be able to uh, join with Catholics, with uh, Jews, with Muslims, uh, you just have much greater credibility if you're doing things with other people because then it's not just self-pleading. It is something that, and, and people don't believe it at first, mm -hmm. but when you do two or three things with them and they really get it, that you, it really runs all the way down, uh, that's really significant. I, rem I have to say, I remember we had this really close Norwegian friend. He used to come over to try and get me to work faster, which was sort of a failed vision. But uh, <laughs> I remember he came up to me one day, and, he, and he'd come over here. He was supposed to get me to work faster, but he kept reading Mormon stuff. And one day he came to me and he said, you guys really believe in religious freedom. You really believe all the way down. Uh, and uh, he's been one of our great friends ever since. Thank you. These comments raise so many uh, interesting thoughts in my mind. Uh, we've been talking about religious freedom challenges, including sort of the, uh, sometimes a, a partisanship that takes place in, in, in discussions of religious freedom. We've talked about, about so many of these things, but I wonder if we could reflect and, and let's say we know the challenges of the 19th century. Those are pretty obvious by now. They've been recorded. In, in church history, are there more recent challenges we ought to be paying more attention to? Are there more recent events or developments that we ought to be thinking about and church historians should be paying attention? Do you have any thoughts? Elizabeth, please. I think some of the challenges that we're seeing globally now um, are dealing with reactions to religion either on the basis of security, where religion is seen as somehow making the country less stable. Um, I know particularly in the US and Europe, a lot of Muslims have experienced that, but other religions also in other parts of the world. There's um, reaction simply because of the secularization pressures where um, it's more inadvertent than anything. Governments are growing, they have more restrictions, more legislation, and it has an impact on religious organizations. And because fewer people are religious, they may not think about the impact that it has on religious groups. You know, a school administrator decides to set up a schedule for football or whatever, and to go ahead and schedule practices on Saturday without thinking of the fact that for many people, that's their day of worship. So you've got secularism and, and um, security, but you also have challenges coming from nationalism and authoritarianism where this sense of religion and identity gets pulled really, really close together. And so that if you're not part of our nation, if you're not part of our core identity or core religion, then somehow you're a threat to the country. And so we see that around the world. Thank you. And on the theme of challenges, I welcome any comments you might have, challenges we faced recently, challenges perhaps that you foresee and we ought to be preparing for, as well as this notion of is there a role for people interested in church history to, do, to delve a little deeper and help document and um, elucidate some of these issues? I'll just say that if I look back on church history and I think about the current day, uh, the challenge is that people for their own reasons, uh, often that are political, some that are economic, sometimes it's uh, geographic, uh, are just not prepared to respect the divine nature of the right that we have. And it becomes very political. Uh, I, I think about where we are today, trying to protect in all faiths uh, uh, the, 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 some things that we would never have considered 40 or 50 years ago would be threatened. Uh, the ability to uh, control the, uh, the, who we choose our clergy to be for example. Now we see that in China, 
We see that to a limited degree in Russia and other places where there are uh, communist regimes in place. But we see it playing out in the United States, but n not because they reject necessarily uh, the, our own religiosity. It's they just don't think it should matter as much. Hmm. And, and, and why do, it's not that they have an objection necessarily to uh, us believing. It's just that they, would, they don't want us standing in the way of their point of view. This becomes very much a political exercise in exercising priorities and getting one's way. And we're in a world now where uh, there's just more and more people uh, who feel differently than those of us who hold our faith to be a core a part of who we are. Thank you. This is a different tack, but I was reading a couple weeks ago about Joseph Smith meeting uh, President Martin Van Buren and and you know, they, he said, I can do nothing for you. Your cause is just. And it was at that moment, I think, that the church realized uh, we're sort of on our own. And so Joseph Smith, I'm not the historian, but he, he starts to run for president. And I don't think he ever thought he would ever win. But he wanted the platform to be able to talk about issues that were important to the church, including religious freedom and equity and you know, the issues of slavery and uh, poverty and all of those things that all the revelations that he had had that would move us toward Zion. And, and he's using that prophetic reach to look way into the future because it obviously wouldn't happen in the 1840s. But I look then at the ministry of President Oaks of the 12 and how of all the things that they have to do, they are reaching out to talk about religious freedom over and over and over again and reaching their hands across aisles to build these relationships with other faiths. And if I were a member of the church, I would ask, why are they doing that? Why would they spend so much of their prophetic energy putting time into that? Because lots of times I hear people say, my, my, my freedom of religion isn't threatened. You know, why does the church care so much about this? Because there's nothing that's really bothering my freedom of religion. I think it's a made up issue. This is the opportunity to write, find out why it's not a made up issue. And some of the things that we've talked about today that we don't pay attention to until it's almost too late. I think the prophets are helping us pay attention to things that is part of a long trajectory, but we have the, the right, the responsibility, the privilege to care for this for ourselves and for the entire world. And we're being led in that way but with inspired leaders. Thank you. Cole, I'm going to, this, this brings to mind uh, an interesting thought about some of the efforts you have made, and, and you could maybe describe for us a little bit more about the center that you established, helped establish, and approaches you've taken that have helped reach out, that have helped, and we've talked in generalities about it, but can you give us a little more concrete picture? I think a lot of people don't understand some of the things you've been working on. I, I'm, I'm actually very good at not doing concrete things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, but but let me let me try to respond to that. I mean, I, I, two or three things come to mind. I mean, at a very abstract general level, one of the things I remember reading, and I was sort of moved to think about this morning, listening to Michael Worley, uh, and uh, as he was trying to, he quoted a number of like temple dedications, things like that, where you see scriptural passages talking about the importance of things. And one of the things that's been important in my life is this is a quotation from President Harold B. Lee, which you can find in the bicentennial issue of the Ensign, remember 1987 and it's September. And, and then it has a, an article that quotes what each of the prophets have said about the, uh, about the Constitution. But, uh, this is President Lee. He says, I have often wondered what the expression meant that out of Zion shall go forth the law. This is quoting Isaiah 2. Out of Zion shall go forth the law. Years ago, I went with the brethren to the Idaho Falls Temple, and I heard in that inspired prayer of the First Presidency a def definition of the meaning of the term, out of Zion shall go forth the law. Note what they said. Quote, we thank thee that thou hast revealed to us that those who gave us our constitutional form of government were men wise in thy sight, and that thou did raise them up for the very purpose of putting forth the sacred document, the Constitution of the United States. Then, we pray that the kings and rulers and peoples of all nations under heaven may be persuaded of the blessings enjoyed by the people of this land 
by reason of their freedom under thy guidance and be constrained to adopt similar government, similar, not the same, similar governmental systems, thus to fulfill the ancient prophecy of, Zion, of Isaiah, that out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So that is, of course, a very famous prophecy that has all kinds of multiple uh, fulfillments. But remember that the Idaho Falls Temple was dedicated in September of 1945. All of modern human rights has been adopted since that time. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, all of the key instruments have been adopted since then. All of the constitutions of the world, except 10, have been adopted since that time. And in some ways, our own constitution has been significantly transformed since that time. So that the constitution as we know it today is not what Davis versus Beeson was in 18. 78 or 90, whatever the year was. It's a much cleaner, more comprehensive notion. So now how does that connect with what we've actually been doing at the center? I mean, I, th I think it's important that we have a deep understanding of the significance of the notion of religious freedom and then that we understand that we need to understand it, not just in American law, but legal systems across the world, we need to be able to be able to enter into dialogue with other people. We've had the opportunity of working on laws dealing with religion in, well, if you count things that are like markup sessions of, on constitutions or laws in about 50 or 60 countries. And we've had easily 120 or 130 leaders come here and we do, we do conferences on these issues. At this point, I'm looking at some of the legal counsel office people from Africa and from Latin America, we often get asked to work on these things with other people so that there are real opportunities uh, to, to make a difference. And uh, we feel sort of very blessed to, to have been part of that. I just to mention, uh, to, give, to, to flesh out just a little bit some of the stories, mm. um, Cole's been very modest. He's been working in this field for over 30, 35 years, and I've been with him for 21. And the, the really unique opportunities that come. I remember Cole was in Kazakhstan working because the Hare Krishnas were being, having their buildings bulldozed by the government. And Cole was serving on a board for the uh, advisory panel for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. And going very quiet behind the scenes, lots of discussions, lots of negotiations, trying to speak up for another faith. Or when we've had here someone from the uh, uh, government in Eastern Europe that doesn't allow conscientious objection for military service, and spending spending long conversations just talking with them about, and trying to understand where they're coming from and what some of the concerns are um, for the for Jehovah's Witnesses and others who for whom that's a conscientious issue that they can't serve in the military, um, and so a lot of it is is quiet, it's law reform projects, it's working and getting to know stakeholders. I think when you start looking at religious freedom issues, what you see is that it's an interdisciplinary effort. We need historians, people who do religious studies, people, I loved what Sal said yesterday morning, right? We need all of these groups together. We need people who are in politics or in humanitarian. We, because people from religious communities, it's an interdisciplinary effort because it's so core to who we are as human beings. And it spills out into all these other areas. You asked about how historians can help. I think of the work that we're doing right now trying to document sort of the impact that religion has in the public sphere and what happens when religion is repressed. Being able to cite history, I've used a number of historians' work to say, look, this is what happens when, as a factual matter, when groups are driven underground because governments are afraid of them. And so I think the more we document this and be able to articulate it and work together, I think, can really make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the, um, it, it brings to mind another question. We've, we've heard a little bit about some international ways of doing things, some approaches. Has the church been active domestically 
um, in ways that we need to remember and to document. I mean, what comes to mind is uh, fairness for all, for instance. Um, I'm wondering if other panelists could reflect on some of those um, aspects of our more recent church history as we approach religious freedom issues, as we look for methods or patterns of ways we can combat some of these challenges. I can speak to that. Um, the church has played a prominent role in both drawing together coalitions of people of faith to defend a common interest in being able to preserve religious freedom in a modern era when it's very much under attack. Uh, I think it, one uh, should not have this conversation without reflecting on what has occurred just in Utah in the legislature when they developed what's known as the Utah Compromise that's now slowly being put uh, into legislation in other states around the country, and which is very seriously being taken now in Congress as legislative uh, action begins to move toward uh, dealing with this issue. Uh, there, there are those who do not uh, feel a need to protect religious freedom that are looking to pass legislation, the Equality Act, which would have uh, quite dramatic impacts on uh, on the church, on all churches, on faith uh, generally in the United States. And our church has been, uh, I think, a powerful advocate, often behind the scenes, often doing the kinds of uh, coalition building that's required, often being uh, financially supportive, uh, looking to put forward ideas, showing by example here in, in Utah. Uh, those are very prominent examples of the way the church has led and will, I think, continue to lead. We have... Uh, assets that allow us to do that. And I'm talking now about the commitment of our people and the ability to actually execute on the ground politically, uh, to actually get things done in a system that requires us to, uh, in order to get things done, have 51 votes at the right moment uh, in the Senate and 218 votes uh, in, the, in the House at the right moment. Those are very practical things that the church has and I think will uh, continue to do that not only works towards specific legislation, but also the, the protection of an important principle. Thank you. W reflect on this point. Uh, it, you know, we often talk about the Latter-day Saints as being the leaven in the loaf, not necessarily the loaf itself. It, it, do you, I, I think what you're saying, what you're describing, is an illustration of how the Latter-day Saints have, can be or have been the leaven in the loaf in the defense of religious freedom? I think we've been in a, a vitally important part, and some of it is, ref, a, 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 is a reflection of the way we're organized. We're a hierarchical organization made up of people who are highly committed and who will do things when asked. If you look across the uh, uh, religious world, there are many congregations that are substantially more federated than we are, and hence it's more difficult for them to actually bring themselves together uh, in, in action, in which there are substantial differences in the way people feel. Uh, you can take, uh, uh, you can go denomination by denomination and apply that, uh, uh, that analysis, but it becomes very clear that a church like ours that is hierarchically organized and has uh, people who are devoted to a set of core principles and have committed themselves to it will always have more success in being able to get the kind of thing done that's required in a democracy, at least, to protect religious freedom. And hence, we will have an outside, uh, we will, to use a, a, a phrase, we'll punch uh, bigger than our weight uh, because we are committed and because we do have those resources and because we're well organized and we know how to do it. He's mentioned a lot about resources, but uh, I have to say one of the really significant things is we have a culture that's used to doing things for nothing. Well, of course, for blessings, I suppose. But but uh, one should not. But I think one of the, the, there are one of the hard things is to talk about what what people can do. I think one of the better things that, uh, and I don't think we came up with this, we've been involved with it. I'm looking around at some of the people who've worked on, there's a series of 
pamphlets. The, the history of these goes back to some people, well, Melissa Rogers, who's now of the White House Council for Neighborhood Partnerships, but uh, she and some other people were, were concerned with what happens in the schools. And they put together a very broad coalition and to the breadth you can appreciate when you realize it included the ACLU and it included some very conservative groups. But they were able to figure, they, they were able, among other things, to identify some areas where they definitely did not agree. Uh, but there are a whole range of issues in the schools, for example, where parents and teachers and administrators agreed. After all, administrators mainly want not to be sued. Uh, so, uh, if, so, but anyway, out of that came a series of pamphlets that are very practical, how you deal with various kinds of situations. Uh, and so there's some people who are here who have worked very hard on getting these, so they're now available uh, for Africa, for Latin America. Gary's done some. I've, uh, there are a lot of people who've been involved in this project. But that's getting hold of those, and I'm sorry I don't know the Again, I'm not high on the actual bottom line detail, but where the but these are available electronically. Uh, get those and think about them, and think how they apply in a school district, in 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 places like that. I mean, I think there are really ways that some of these very abstract principles can really be brought down to the to the grassroots level. And I think what you're saying is we need information at the grassroots level. We need greater understanding. Maybe that's one of the approaches we take uh, going forward to help, uh, to help defend and uphold religious freedom. These pamphlets, by the way, there are a series of pamphlets dealing with religious freedom in the US. They're, they're in question and answer format. There's, there's one about religion in the public, religious freedom in the public schools, another one, religious freedom in the workplace. Uh, religious freedom in the public square. It just, they just have basic, in a question and answer format, uh, basic answers to you know, what, what is legal, what isn't legal. Uh, try to, trying to um, reduce abstract concepts to more practical approaches. And they're available at, on our website, the center, which is iclrs.org, iclrs.org. You can find those pamphlets there. We also have uh, there are a series of pamphlets uh, for different countries that take the basic, same basic format and just outline religious freedom law at its most basic elemental level in, in each country for which there's a pamphlet. We've got a number of those pamphlets. You can also find them there. Um, well, um, we, the past couple of weeks and a little more, our attention has been riveted on the tragedy unfolding in Ukraine. And it raises, uh, you know, Eastern Europe, a beautiful place, I have to say, uh, a wonderful place in so many ways, has had serious religious freedom challenges through the years. And uh, I wonder, Elizabeth and Cole in particular have a, uh, have a history there of working on those issues um, in Eastern Europe, and really, Elizabeth Clark has dedicated her professional life to these questions. And I wonder if you could just outline briefly for us maybe the, the, the challenges through the years, the, the growth of the church in these countries and reflect also on present circumstances. Sure. And I'll invite others to pitch in. Absolutely. No, I mean, it's heartbreaking to see what's happening. Um, One of the things that may be a helpful place to start for this group in thinking about it is some of the uniqueness of Ukraine. Um, in some ways, it's sort of like South Korea and Asia or Chile and Latin America in that it's much more religiously diverse than most of its um, other countries in the, in the region. It's always been so. And because of that, um, it's had a deep commitment to religious freedom, or at least no one group has been able to sort of capture the religious scene. Um, and so religion has flourished there. They have a large number of Protestant minorities. They have Jewish president, Jew, had Jewish prime minister. They've had a Protestant. And no one's very phased by these issues, which in many other parts of the former Soviet Union, um, nationalism and identity with a strong national religion became an important part of um, self-definition after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, I, 
uh, as you say, I, it's very personal to me. I was a, a student in 1991 in the Soviet Union. I studied Russian and um, was in Kiev, which tells you a little bit about the time because they're not teaching Russian there now. Um, and then was able to go back and see the first stake in Eastern Europe created there in 2004. Um, no, 2000. Shoot, I'm losing it. I'm losing my, my dates. Um, but this religious freedom became an important space where people could receive the gospel. And the, culturally and legally, there was an opening. And then it was also the place where the first temple in Eastern Europe was built. Um, there's, there remain serious concerns. We have members in Russia. We have members in Ukraine. Our hate heartaches for all of them. Um, but I think this highlights the importance of religious freedom. Um, in wartime, um, national feeling runs especially strong, and religion is often identified with that, and religious minorities suffer. You've seen that in other parts of, um, of war conflicts, and certainly where in other parts of Ukraine. Um, I know, Cole, you've been working when, right when the Soviet Union fell, it did a lot of work in that part of the world as well. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, and and Ukraine has been a place where I mean, I used to go at least every year. Some of my very best friends are. I, I, I in fact, I have to confess. I, there was this place, this group of scholars that we worked with, and at one point, President Samuelson wanted to come over, and I took him to see this place with some fear and trembling because this place you could fit in my office. They had about five, five offices in this little tiny space. And out of that little tiny space, they were generating all kinds of publications. They were helping all kinds of churches all over Ukraine uh, become recognized, including ours. Uh, and, uh, and, and you just walk in the streets and have a kind of spiritual feel about the place. Uh, so, uh, and, and for me, I mean, much of the, the 90s was spent in this initial euphoria with uh, the, the collapse of the Iron Curtain and with uh, uh, new constitutions emerging, new, it's just, I mean, it was, imagine what most of the countries were doing is not just having a normal legislative session. It was like having a legislation, legislative session in which you adopted the whole code. And if you're a lawyer, you would appreciate that it's not just a few amendments here and there, it's a set of books. Uh, and the, the, the sort of the integrity, the courage, the passion with which people worked on these things all over uh, Eastern Europe was incredible. And, and, but what we learned from that is that uh, there are things that, there are things that scholars can do that others can't do. Uh, in fact, I, I remember early in my career, this is when, this will tell you how old I am, uh, when uh, President Kimball was talking a lot about praying that the doors of nations would be open. One day I was sitting in my office and I realized, they're open to me, I can go study. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the reality is there are ways that we can build relationships with people in a lot of different countries. We've had. There was an extraordinary period, I think, in Eastern Europe, but I think one of the things we've learned is that every country, there are about 200 countries on Earth, right? And I would say 10% of those change their religion laws every year, something on that order. This is, and they're, they're not persecuting Mormons, they're not, well, sometimes they are. But generally, that's not the problem. It's just that religion is so central in culture, and it's important in politics. And so there are changes. And the difficulty is we're a little offbeat, and so the changes always affect us. And yet, if we can be in touch with people, if we can have friends in the countries, uh, we can make a difference that can be important for us, important for, for other people. And you can't change some of the overall politics often, but often you can fix little details. I, I mean, here's an example of a little detail. Chile was changing its law one year, and they had basically finished the change. And our 
lawyers in Latin America happened to notice that it was all great, but the church was going to have to reorganize under the new law. And then they'd have to change the title of all the churches. And there would be a tax on every one of those transactions. And for us, that would add up to a million or two dollars. And uh, we pointed that out to the people drafting the law and said, oh, we'll fix that. And they did. Thank you. Governor Levitt, you mentioned um, how we punch above our weight. Uh, and it would be interesting, I think, uh, to document and uh, for historians looking at the history, the, the more recent history particularly, but also earlier of the Latter-day Saints to see how we have punched above our weight or been at a crucial juncture at the right time to help influence or help with the defense of religious freedom. Of course, we, be, we would believe that that's the Lord's intervention. We see the Lord's hand when that happens. Is there, on the other hand, however, can we lead out too stridently? Can we do, should we, should we be out leading the charge? Should, when is it appropriate to, to speak up? How do we speak up? Could, could you reflect on that? Well, as Latter-day Saints, uh, we are both saints and citizens. And uh, often uh, we are acting as saints in our role as citizens. But the key role in the defense of religious freedom isn't our role as saints, it's our role as citizens. And what makes the church, uh, what allows it to punch above its weight is that there are Latter-day Saints in virtually every congressional district in the United States. Uh, no other organization, particularly religious organization, uh, well, there are those who, who, who can, but they're not, they're not uh, as well organized or, hi or, or hierarchically organized as we are. And so our ability as an institutional church isn't driven by our ability to act on our, on our own. It's our citizen, our, the saints acting as citizens in their role as citizens. And that allows us to have substantially greater influence than we would if we were simply uh, trying to act on our own without that sense of organization. It, it, yes, oh, I was just going to add to that. I think I'm grateful for prophetic leadership on these issues. Um, I've heard that from so many other Americans, a sense of you all are so lucky. <laughs> um, you can cut through some of the culture war issues. You have people who are willing to follow a leader instead of having sort of very fractiousness. But I think you're right. I think that what we do as a community has to be in our role as citizens. We need to partner with other people. Uh, our, we can't do it alone. Another key important point here is our clear commitment to stay out of partisan politics. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we, are, we deal with issues as they would affect the church and the capacity of the church to carry out its essential and sacred and unique mission. Uh, the ability to stay out of partisan politics is vitally important because to a large degree, as you pointed out with your first question, issues like this suddenly become partisan. Uh, and they're, they're used to drive a wedge to an extreme between groups of people. That's not been our approach. I think you can look at the current issue. You mentioned fairness for all. Uh, our approach is to recognize that the Savior uh, would protect all people, would not deny anyone the capacity for shelter or food or employment, and would love them. And hence, we should be looking after our, our fellow citizens who may be LGBT. And hence, we can protect them as both saints and citizens. Uh, if we were in a partisan discussion, that would be difficult for us to do because we would be representing one polar view or the other. So the combination of being able to focus on truth, focus on conscience, focus on what we read in the scriptures as the, protect, the protection of conscience, and to do it as, citizens, as saints who are also citizens and who happen to be located in 
every village uh, uh, and state uh, in the United States, if we step forward and advocate, we can in fact have a profound impact, not just on, for our own, but for all those who have deep sense of faith and value in, in its importance. I, I want to build on what Governor Levitt just said, because to me that is the key message of the entire plenary that we've just talked about. <clears throat> The, you talked about the yeast that the church brings to some of these things. I think there's three ingredients in that yeast, and one of them is our ability to convene because of our structure. But I don't just mean at the, at the big level, but our ability to convene at a family level, at a congregational level, at a community level. We bring that order. Sometimes we lead out, sometimes we don't, but we have that ability to bring people to the table because we aren't partisan. We try not to be partisan. I think another ingredient is our as our global look. We are hierarchically uh, organized, but we are not a United States church. We are a global church. And these issues are happening in many places in the world, and we can share best practices. We can draw lessons across countries and regions that are very helpful in the work that you and Cole and others have done, which is very, very important. And the third thing I'd like to bring up is we're also relentless. We know that this is the issue of this dispensation, and it will go forward until this dispensation is over. And we, it's not a passing fad with us. It's core. It was fought you know, for in the, in the Council of Heaven. It will be at the very end of the world. And we are relentless about this issue. And it goes back to what Governor Levitt said. People have inherent rights and privileges just by being children of God, and we'll protect those. Yeah, I wanted to just pick up. It's not just this dispensation or our time. These things go back. They're, they are, they are my, my, my Norwegian friend, I think part of what he realizes, this is not just this world. This is the pre-existence. This is, this is a really fundamental thing that life is about. And, it, and it, it, it can be abstract. It can be political. It can be very personal. I have to say one of the hardest things for me has been having a son-in-law who checked out of the church and how do I, what does religious freedom mean when it's your family? Uh, but it, it's a true principle and it's linked with love for our global neighbors but also for our family and, and, uh, and it's a true principle, it's, it's the way uh, and it's a principle also of civility, and that's part of how we have to relate to people. We're would you well, I was just going to tell a quick story. Um, after the state of Utah passed, with support of the church, what is now known as the Utah Compromise, I participated in a gathering at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. to talk about what had occurred. Uh, and it was a good forum, but after we had a meal with others who had been on the panel, including uh, leaders of the LGBT community. And in the course of it, we began to ask the question, is what happened in Utah valuable in the sense that could it happen other places? And we began to talk about where, where can we find a way, how can we find a way to protect your rights as, as an LGBT community and how can we protect religious freedom? And um, one of the members of our church who was there talked a bit about the way that debate had occurred and said to them, that piece of legislation did not pass automatically. It was a big lift. And we, referring to the church, defended your rights now, he said, the question is, will you defend ours? And that was a very important moment, I believe, because it portrayed the moral high ground. Yeah. It could not have occurred were we part of a church that was on one partisan interest or another. It could only happen when we were talking directly about human beings and human rights and a need for us to join together to solve a common problem. Because we have common pain, we can act together even though we have different values and approach life in a much different way. Thank you so much for that. 
We are approaching the end, and as before we finalize, I want us to reflect for a minute about what can you and I do? What can a person, a non-specialist, a non-academic, a non-politician, where can we be engaged? And I, I want to, and, and how, what should we be doing? Are there things we should avoid, things we should do? Is it right, for instance, to speak up at every, every threat we, we find? Those sorts of questions come to my mind, but I want to start, if we can, I ho hope you can reflect, each of you, for a moment on, on what can I do, what would be effective. But if we could, Sister Eubank, I'd love to start, if you could reflect on the power of lived faith. Be thou an example of the believers. What is the power of that, and how does it influence these discussions and, and these values, religious freedom? I often tell human, uh, couples that are going out to serve a mission, I said, whatever your mission call is, people are watching you as a couple. They want to know, how do they stay married for 50 years? How do they solve issues? You know, what you're bringing is, is that power of your example. And I think in this case, as I was thinking about the questions today, I thought, I'm going to choose five things that I would talk to the 20-year-olds in my family about. These are things you can do. So here are my five things. Are you ready? Discipline your humor. Don't accept jokes that poke at somebody's ethnicity or faith or anything. That seems like the tiniest thing. But people pay attention to that. And we can lift a lot. And, and of course, we believe in humor. But we believe in, in the, the gentle kind of humor that lifts people up. So that's my first one. Find ways to build bridges. I don't have to define that. It's easy enough to do. But when we get busy, we don't reach out of our bubbles and our circles. And I think there's great power in doing that. We've talked about. My third one is don't be a troll. <laughs> Be civil. Be the kind of person that your grandmother thinks you are. Don't, whether you're anonymous or you're in person, but we have to be examples of civil society and be civil. The, third, the fourth one is find concrete ways to get to know other faiths. And the easiest way I think of is to celebrate their celebrations with them. Invite them to have fast Sunday roast beef with you or have an iftar dinner with them or celebrate Advent or give up something for Lent, but, but find ways to build relationships with good people of other faiths. We desperately need that. And the fifth thing is use the internet and social media to talk about what we have learned today. What did you learn today? Post something about that and be an example of the believers. It's my five. Thank you. Governor Levitt. I just want to adopt, I want to be associated with Sharon's uh, <laughs> five points. We all do. Uh, they were extraordinarily good. And I will simply say I've reflected the fact that we are all saints and we are also citizens. And we need to be good saints and good citizens. And when we are good saints and good citizens uh, and we are representing uh, uh, not just our own interests but the interests of all God's children, uh, I think uh, democracy will be preserved and freedom will endure. Thank you. Elizabeth. Sure. Three quick things. One is the idea of, maybe if I could add to, in addition to being saints and citizens, we're also sinners. <laughs> and I think that a little bit of humility is really vital in this sphere. Um, it's easy to be proud of accomplishments in our church or our country or other people's countries or other people's experiences. Um, but I think it, working with people of other faiths gives a great opportunity to learn from them. And I know I've been incredibly blessed by my friends of other faiths. Um, one is to do whatever we do in our faith. Right? I've seen this where so many, um, I had someone from public affairs in the church telling me that most of the relationships that we hear about on the news where church leaders are involved with people started because someone local went into somebody else's office. Right? If I, I know people who they're doing a youth activity, they find a way to do that youth activity with another religious group. Um, being able to stand up for people's rights, you need to actually know them first and know what their concerns are and have them be able to trust you. And this is a great way of building that trust. So staying humble, being, um, with other people. And finally to, uh, I think of the image of the Bishop's storehouse. Um, 
our current leaders teach us that Bishop Storehouse is more than just a building with food in it, that we're all part of the Bishop Storehouse and we bring what we have. I think on these issues, we all bring what we have. So many of you are historians. You can bring what you have that we all have parts to play, and we have parts to play together, and that those have to be done connect, in a connected way. So, so I, I would uh, say two or three things. One, uh, don't underestimate the importance of praying about these things and getting guidance. Uh, second thing is most of us here, if, if we're in academic posts or things like that, I, I am conscious that I have colleagues at the law school, uh, but a lot of the people I'm closest to are colleagues at other universities in other parts of the world. Uh, one of the extraordinary things about the internet is that you can stay in touch with people and, and you can do this without being pushy, without being, but, but you can find opportunities to work on common projects or, or share things that you're, you're doing. Uh, it's, it's, people often tell me I ought to learn how to say no to things, but the problem is you don't know where those relationships will lead. And so I think you have to be uh, sort of open and uh, better than I am at answering e emails, but, uh, but just uh, take advantage of just normal connections. I think a lot of the things we need to do will come out of normal situations. Uh, and then just, I think we all can afford to learn more. One of the things I've learned, I started 40 years ago teaching courses on religious liberty. I think I've taught courses every year since until I've retired, but uh, I don't think I ever taught the same course twice. There's a lot to learn. <laughs> so try to learn things. We, we've got a lot that's online at the center, uh, that there are other things. Uh, but we can all afford to learn no more. So we, because uh, we're inspired by what other people do, and we can uh, be more better equipped to help when things open up. If I might just add, I'll, I'll take the privilege of just adding um, perspective as someone who has been a, a professional historian at least for part of my career. Um, Part of our learning needs to be to learn about our history. Uh, the, the, the truth shall make you free. We see that illustrated information wars on what's the true narrative going on in Ukraine. That's just one instance. Uh, the truth shall make you free. And learning, understanding this core value that we hold as, as Latter-day Saints, we need to understand it better if we, if we are to defend it or uphold it better. And there's a role for for historians. Do you remember the revelation talking about there's much that pertains to futurity? Do you remember that? In documenting some of the things that had happened, in that case talking about some of the, the persecution that could, had occurred. There's a role for historians, <clears throat> historians of church history, not just to document the, the ills that befall people, but also the, the entire um, understanding and progress we make as we go forward in our, our quest, which is, in, in a sense, a historically defining quest of the Latter-day Saints, the quest for religious freedom, and our increased understanding today that it's not just for us, but for everyone, all of our Heavenly Father's children. We've been so richly blessed with this panel. These are people I admire, people that, whose examples we can follow and whose thoughts and insights have been so helpful to us. I hope you'll join with me in thanking them for their participation.
Well, good afternoon. I'll invite you to take your seats for our final session of this symposium. First of all, thank you for joining us and for participating uh, these last two days. We're grateful for those of you who have been able to join us in person and for the uh, larger number of you who have joined us virtually over the last few days. Uh, we also recognize uh, with us uh, President Oaks of, of the First Presidency and grateful for his interest. It's my pleasure to introduce our final keynote speaker, Elder Garrett W. Gong. Following Elder Gong's remarks, uh, Elise Reynolds, an archivist in the Church History Department, will give our closing prayer. Throughout his life, Elder Gong has had many opportunities to Consider the importance of religious liberty on the global stage. He holds a doctorate in international relations from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. After that, he served as, as a special assistant to the Undersecretary of State in the U.S. State Department, as a special assistant to the U.S. Ambassador in Beijing. He then served in positions at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., and then as a, an assistant to the President for planning and assessment at BYU. His global responsibilities uh, continued after his calling as a general authority. He has served as uh, in the area of presidency in our Asia area uh, as a member of the presidency of the 70 and then for the last few years as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. One of his current assignments, uh, speaking of historical perspectives, is to serve as an advisor to the church history department. We're grateful for his wise counsel and uh, leadership. Elder Gong. Thank you, Matt. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends, with appreciation, we acknowledge the faith, dedication, and experience of those who co-sponsor and participate in this church history symposium. We warmly welcome President Dallin H. Oaks. I think Sister Kristen Oaks is here, and I think Sister Gong may be here too. President Oaks is, of course, both a practitioner of church history and a champion of religious liberty. We also acknowledge and warmly welcome leaders and associates from BYU Religious Education, BYU Department of Church History and Doctrine, and of course, our church history department and each of you who are here today. Our previous panel's discussion on anxiously engaged in a good cause provides a natural lead-in for this concluding session on religious liberty in historical and global perspective. Even to the casual observer, leaders and members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are deeply committed to religious liberty, as we've been discussing. Indeed, for Latter-day Saints, the protection and promotion of religious liberty for all is not a casual matter. At the same time, Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty may appear to some to be current, American, and political. Current as in primarily a contemporary concern, American as in largely an issue in the United States, and political as in specifically intended to balance legal and political religious freedom and non-discrimination to provide fairness for all. This audience, of course, has taken a more nuanced look, but broadly, people may think that church commitment to religious liberty is focused on current American and political elements. And of course, by necessity, church commitment does include current American and political elements. But a purpose of my comments today is to place church championing of religious liberty in a broader historical and global perspective. That's my assignment in this topic. By necessity, I can only suggest in broad schematic fashion how deeply rooted religious liberty is in the core and longstanding doctrinal, historical, and global belief and experience of the Latter-day Saints, something we've already begun to touch on. First, doctrine. Moral agency, which requires religious liberty for its full effective expression, 
is a core doctrine in Restoration Scripture, including in the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants. We believe we, as God's children, can realize our divine identity and potential most fully only as we are able to choose freely between good and evil, right and wrong, and to experience the consequences of and accountability for our choices. Second, historical experience. Religious liberty, of course, is integral to the lived Latter-day Saint historical experience, including as articulated and championed from our earliest days by the prophet Joseph Smith and through our history by other church leaders. Those not of our faith are sometimes surprised that the Latter-day Saints, who have suffered as much religious bigotry and religious persecution as we have, have from the beginning of the Restoration championed religious liberty for all. Third, global experience. Religious liberty is a natural global need as Latter-day Saint members seek to honor, obey, and sustain the law and contribute to our societies and communities in nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples across the world. Therefore, in today's presentation, uh, I will touch on each of those three themes. I'll also invite five friends to share vignettes of religious liberty in historical and global Latter-day Saint perspective. By video, we'll hear from Alexander Dushku, Matt Groh, Kate Holbrook, Bill Atkin, and Robert Smith. You will enjoy and benefit from the passion and expertise of these individuals as I have. Let us then consider in turn the three themes of religious liberty, first in Latter-day Saint doctrine, second in church history, and in global church experience. Remembering this is an overall schematic. Let's begin with religious liberty and restoration scripture. Imagine the young prophet Joseph Smith in the early days of the restoration as he translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God and received the revelations which became the Doctrine and Covenants. Imagine Moroni instructing and mentoring the young Joseph not only on the doctrines of heaven, but on the necessary lessons of the Book of Mormon prophets who foresaw our day and knew our needs. Moroni, after all, had lived directly and vicariously through the rise and fall of civilizations where religious liberty was a central issue, to use the phrase, at all times and in all places, even unto death for his people. Moroni poignantly declared that because he would not deny his testimony of the Christ, he, Moroni, wandered whithersoever he could for the safety of his own life. In some ways, history was to repeat itself. The prophet Joseph and our people would experience similar poignant demands for faith and sacrifice, perhaps prepared and fortified by what the young prophet Joseph was learning from Moroni and the Book of Mormon about the need for religious liberty. To illustrate the life and death reality of religious liberty in Moroni's experience and in the Book of Mormon, let us review Book of Mormon passages that describe religious liberty in three somber words, put to death. In the Book of Mormon, prophets including Abinadi are put to death in cruel fashion for testifying of religious truth. Mosiah chapter 17, verse 1. When Abinadi had finished these sayings, the king commanded that the priest should take him and cause that he should be put to death. At various times in the Book of Mormon, those believing in Jesus Christ or found calling upon God were put to death. Fierce wars were fought over religious belief. 
Mosiah chapter 24, verse 11. And Amulon commanded them that they should stop their cries. And he put guards over them to watch them, that whosoever should be found calling upon God should be put to death. Here I pause briefly. Near Hans Mill last week, where I was on assignment, I recalled a passage I'd recently read in Saints, Volume 1, about conditions at Hans Mill in winter 1838. Quote, The women in the settlement held prayer meetings, asking the Lord to heal their wounded. When mob members learned about these prayer meetings, they threatened to wipe out the settlement if the women continued praying. Close quote. Back to the Book of Mormon. Alma chapter 25, verse 7. And it came to pass that those rulers who were the remnant of the children of Amulon caused that they should be put to death. Yea, all those that believed in these things. Third Nephi 1, verse 9. There was a day set apart by the unbelievers that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death, except the sign should come to pass, which had been given by Samuel the prophet. Ether chapter 11, verse 5. These are, of course, familiar verses to us, but I was struck as I read them together. The brother of Shiblon caused that all the prophets who prophesied of the destruction of the people should be put to death. Moroni chapter 1, verse 2, 3. Behold, their wars were exceedingly fierce among themselves, and because of their hatred, they put to death every Nephite that will not deny the Christ. And I, Moroni, will not deny the Christ. Wherefore, I wander whithersoever I can for the safety of mine own life. As mentioned earlier, Moroni and the prophet Joseph may have come to share a special experiential bond and fierce love for religious liberty. As in 3 Nephi, executions of those who held religious conviction were sometimes carried out extrajudicially. 3 Nephi 6, 23, many, quote, who testified of the things pertaining to Christ, who testified boldly, were taken and put to death secretly by the judges that the knowledge of their death came not into the governor of the land until after their death." Close quote. Religious liberty in the Book of Mormon includes examples of legal parameters in war and peace to protect believers and non-believers. Facing life and death realities, Moroni felt justified in putting Amalekiah to death and imprisoning the men of Pacas, but only according to the legal system with its established procedures for determining law based on the voice of the people, as we read in Alma 46, Alma 62, and Alma 51. Again, these Book of Mormon examples of what is at stake with religious liberty come from the single scriptural reference put to death. From the beginning of Moroni's instruction and the translation of Book of Mormon truths, the prophet Joseph would learn the doctrinal, spiritual, and physical life and death need for religious liberty and the serious consequences when religious liberty is denied. Religious liberty is also a core doctrinal theme in the Doctrine and Covenants, including in sections 98, 101, 109, and section 134, all well known to this group here. In these sections, the Lord declares six principles to the young prophet Joseph. First, the Lord teaches the prophet Joseph and each of us the need to protect and promote the exercise of individual moral agency and its related accountability. Quote, that every man and woman may act in doctrine and principle pertaining to fraternity, according to the moral agency which I have given unto him, that every man and woman may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment." Close quote. Says the Lord, 
I, the Lord, make you free. Therefore, ye are free indeed, and the law also maketh you free. Second, the Lord indicates these constitutional principles belong to all mankind. Quote, the principle of freedom in maintaining rights and privileges belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. Third, constitutional principles and laws reflect God's inspiration, but also require that good, wise, and honest men and women be sought for and upheld in order for constitutional principles and practices to be implemented. Fourth, do your business by the voice of the people. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Fifth, it is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. Finally, six, Doctrine and Covenants section 134 states our belief that governments were instituted of God for the benefit of man, that he holds men accountable for their acts in relation to them, both in making laws and administering them for the good and safety of society. We need not elaborate here. Each element related to religious liberty found in Doctrine and Covenants section 134, including free exercise of conscience, voice of the people, administration of law with equity and justice, not prescribing rules of worship to bind the consciences of men, nor dictating forms for public or private devotion, nor suppressing the freedom of the soul, while holding sacred the freedom of conscience. But we will now hear by video about the right to gather, which is both a doctrinal need and a basic right. Alexander Dushku is an attorney who focuses on religious liberty for the church. Alexander, will you please share your thoughts? The right to gather deals with the communal aspect of religious liberty. Elder Gong has taught about covenantal belonging, and that beautiful phrase has both a vertical component and a horizontal component to it, at least as I've understood it. Um, vertically, it, it relates to being connected with God individually. But horizontally, it also relates to being connected to each other, to being connected to our families and to our, our wards and our stakes. Um, this important aspect of connectedness really relates to the right to gather. Our Savior said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So gathering is a fundamental aspect of the religious experience and of religious liberty. As a practical matter though, um, the right to gather includes some simple but very important things. Um, for example, it includes the right to form a legal entity so that a faith community can, can purchase land and build a chapel, for example, build a meeting house or at least lease space in which they can gather. Um, but even more fundamentally than that, uh, it, it includes and must include the right of the faith community to define its own doctrine, to define its sacraments, its sacred rights, um, to establish who is worthy to participate in its sacred rights. So it's absolutely vital and critical, and there are many secular interests that are now pressing against that right to gather, that autonomy of religious organizations to determine who and what they are. In conclusion, Elder David A. Bednar said recently, and I thought this was great, he said, sooner or later, if we're not gathering, we're scattering. A strong right to gather lies at the very heart of religious liberty. Thank you, Alexander. It is said lightning does not strike the same place twice, yet divine inspiration struck twice with twin miracles at Philadelphia, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. For me, Constitution Hall is sacred ground, as is the Pennsylvania Philadelphia Temple. The two, of course, are now less than two miles apart. While principles of religious freedom are found in the Bible, doctrinal and practical concerns for religious liberty are interwoven in fundamental ways in Restoration Scripture. Contemporary Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty draws on these foundations, but to be clear, this is our theme, 
these theological and doctrinal foundations are long-standing and predate any current political, American, or political concern. This brings us to our second theme, religious liberty in church history. Concern for religious liberty is evident throughout Latter-day Saint history, as this group well knows, from the earliest days of the Restoration to the present. Joseph Smith, of course, was no stranger to issues of religious freedom, whether it was facing personal opposition to his early visions or witnessing intense and widespread persecution of Latter-day Saints. By 1843, the issue was so central to his religious and political thinking that he wrote all the candidates for U.S. president and asked if they would protect Latter-day Saints' rights. When the responses were unsatisfactory, the prophet mounted a pre presidential campaign of his own, centered on religious and civil freedoms. We'll now hear from Matt Groh, Church History Department Managing Director, and then Kate Holbrook, Academic Collaborations Director, Church History Department. Matt, even in private settings, such as with the Council of 50 in the 1840s, the Prophet Joseph spoke with deep conviction about religious liberty. What did he say? A few years ago, the Joseph Smith Papers published the minutes of the Council of 50, an organization that Joseph Smith had created to protect the temporal interests of the church and to prepare for the kingdom of God on earth. Scholars had not previously been given access, and there was a lot of speculation about what the minutes might contain. Along with several others, I helped prepare those minutes for publication. One of the things that I found most interesting was Joseph's statements on religious liberty. In this very confidential council, Joseph felt safe to share his candid views. His statements were not public posturing. Joseph invited three men to join the Council of Fifty who were not church members. He did this to demonstrate how he believed the kingdom of God on earth would work. Religious liberty for women and men was essential. For Joseph, the Latter-day Saint doctrine of individual agency explained the importance of religious liberty. God can save or damn a man only on the principle that every man acts, chooses, and worships for himself. Hence, Joseph said, the importance of thrusting from us every spirit of bigotry and intolerance towards a man's religious sentiments, that spirit which has drenched the earth with blood. For Joseph, the inalienable right of man to think as he pleases and worship as he pleases was the first law of everything that is sacred. Looking around the room at the assembled men, he said, I will appeal to every man in this council, beginning at the youngest, that when he arrives to the years of old age, he will have to say that the principles of intolerance and bigotry never had a place in this kingdom, nor in my breast, and that he is even then read, ready to die rather than yield to such things. Thank you, Matt. Kate, Latter-day Saint women, have long been dedicated to religious liberty, including First Amendment guarantees in the 1870s through the 1890s. Would you please tell us about that? The First Amendment guarantees two main principles, the right to religious belief and practice, and the fact that the government will not favor any one religion or non-religion over another. What the amendment assumes but does not elucidate is the necessity that religious and secular groups themselves support these principles as well. It is not enough for the government alone to do so. The fact that Latter-day Saint women have trusted in this amendment, even when government actors did not protect their religious liberty, strikes me as very important. This was the people who believed in the rule of law and could take the long view. Here are two brief examples. First, in 1870, when federal legislation was introduced to diminish the church's economic and political power, Relief Society members gathered in a ladies' mass meeting to discuss solutions. Chair Sarah Kimball, quote, spoke of the part our forefathers had taken in the struggle for freedom, how they had suffered and bled for the principles of civil and religious liberty. 
and she felt that we would be unworthy of the names we bear and of the blood in our veins should we longer remain silent." Close quote. For Kimball, the best way to combat an unfair bill was to participate in the system. At the end of the meeting, attendees proposed two solutions. Number one, women would demand of the territorial governor the right to vote. And number two, two Relief Society representatives would travel to Washington, D.C. Thus, their response to threats against their religious liberty was to sustain the rule of law, this time by demanding the right to participate as voters and by appealing to federal legislators. Second example, a month after that mass meeting, and partly in response to the threat of hostile federal legislation, women in Utah won the right to vote. They exercised that right for 17 years before it was rescinded as another infringement of religious liberty. To regain the vote, women formed the Utah Woman Suffrage Association with local associations throughout Utah Territory. At a convention, physician and acting chaplain Elvira Barney said a prayer, and her words display again that dedication to the rule of law and religious liberty. Quote, Wilt thou be with woman as thou hast with man? And may she serve to smooth the wrinkles of unjust laws as she does and has the pillows beneath the aching heads of thy soldiers and servants." Close quote. Thank you, Kate. Church leaders draw on our early experiences of persecution and our early devotion to religious liberty as we speak with political and religious leaders about the need for and benefits for societies to protect and advance religious liberty today. Indeed, we find inspiration in our history and believe that because of our own experiences, Latter-day Saints have a special duty to speak on behalf of religious liberty for all groups. For example, Elder David A. Bednar and I participated in a Brigham Young, a recent Brigham Young University conference on Muslims and Latter-day Saints understanding one another. We stated the strong interest of the church in religious liberty as a long-standing concern pertaining to ourselves and other religious faiths and groups, in this case, followers of the Islamic faith. In the presentation, we noted Again, things very familiar to this group. People of faith need to stand together for tolerance and dignity of people of all religious beliefs. Our 11th article of faith states, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men, women, the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. The prophet Joseph Smith declared, I am just as ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any other denomination for the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the Latter-day Saints, would trample upon the rights of the Roman Catholics, or of any other denomination who may be unpopular. Again, as this audience well knows, when Latter-day Saints founded the city of Nauvoo, we sought to protect religious freedom. Remember, this was part of our uh, broadcast on this topic for particularly our, our Muslim and other uh, viewers. And in 1841 Nauvoo City Ordinance, we who had suffered religious persecution sought to guarantee tolerance for all. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Nauvoo that the Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, Latter-day Saints, Quakers, Episcopals, Universalists, Unitarians, Muslims, and all other religious sects and denominations, what, whatever, shall have free toleration and equal privileges in this city, 1841. By the way, our church history department colleagues have assembled additional statements by church presidents and leaders regarding religious liberty from the beginning of the Restoration to today. These statements may be found in the proceedings of this symposium. This brings us to our third and final theme, the increasingly global Latter-day Saint experience with religious liberty 
as a worldwide faith with faithful members living among every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Founded on long-standing doctrinal, historical, and global concerns for religious liberty, Latter-day Saint concerns for religious liberty are necessarily global in nature. We'll now hear from Bill Atkin, Church Associate General Counsel. Bill will share a practical example of the Church's contribution to global religious freedom involving the Russian Parliament. In uh, December 31st, 1991, the Soviet Union was dissolved, and January 1st was the beginning of the Russian Federation. The Russian Parliament was, was uh, established at that point in time, and one of the very first things that was being done by the Russian Parliamentary Committee on uh, Freedom of Conscience and Belief and Religion was to enact a new piece of legislation that dealt with uh, the operation of foreign churches in Russia. The head of the committee at the time was a Russian Orthodox priest, and as you can imagine, foreign religions were a target uh, for coming into Russia. A church attorney at the time asked me if what we should do to see if we could impact if in a favorable way that Russian parliament uh, bill on religious freedom. I recommended that the church prepare a brief, analyze from a legal point of view, the provisions of the, tr of the draft legislation. That recommendation was accepted, so we organized and submitted on behalf of the church an extensive brief which analyzed the law under international treaty laws. Now, ultimately, that bill was not enacted for various reasons. But two years later, um, we had an opportunity. The Russian parliament was dissolved, and they reestablished the Russian uh, Duma. And the Duma had a new committee on religious affairs. And the head of that committee was not a Russian Orthodox priest. President Oaks and President Nunswander in March of 1994 came to Russia and they asked if they could have a protocol meeting with the head of that committee, which they did. At the end of that protocol meeting, there was a bearded gentleman in a business suit at the end of the table, and he identified himself and, as Father Pelosin. He had been the head of the previous committee in the parliament on religious, on the, on religious affairs. At that time, he said, I'd like to tell you something about your church and your contribution to our efforts to look at a new legislation on religious affairs and religious freedom. Father Pelosin told us that, in, that other religions had been very upset about the proposed legislation. They protested outside of parliament. They wrote hostile letters to members of the parliamentary committee. He said, but your church took a different tact your church submitted a brief that did the legal analysis of the legislation under international law, and that proved for us to be the most helpful single contribution that we had received with respect to that legislation. We thank Bill for that uh, vignette, and uh, Cole and Elizabeth and many others who are here, we thank you for the things that you did that made possible many of these kinds of incidences. From its humble beginnings in the United States, the church is now established in nations across the world. This process has involved working with national laws that have varying degrees of respect for religious liberty. As a result, we're continuing to learn much about religious liberty on the global stage. We talked earlier about the G20 Interfaith Forum. In the uh, June 9, uh, 2019, G20 Interfaith Forum in Osaka, Japan, uh, we noted that Pew Research states 80% of the world's population indicate a religious affiliation. This is an important element to acknowledge in practical international policy. We tried there in Osaka to use the language of the international diplomatic and development community to frame seven ways religious inputs and values contribute to practical, principle-based policy to lift communities and countries. First, religious communities help inspire and sustain human dignity and essential freedoms, aspirations, and core values attendant to human dignity. Second, religious communities offer important spiritual, philosophical, and moral capacities on which societies and communities can draw 
to achieve sustainable development. Third, religious communities are an important practical source of volunteers, professional resources, motivation, training, and funding for development. Fourth, religious communities have surge capacity to respond to specific immediate needs, such as natural disasters, and also staying capacity to address long-term human concerns. Fifth, religious communities offer unique connections between international and local organizations. Six, religious communities offer important diversity in interfaith experience and capacity. And finally, each religious and philosophical tradition, remember we're using the, the language of the international diplomatic community, offers its own unique experiences to the rich human storehouse of practical, principle-based approaches to sustainable development and invite mutual respect for religious freedom and core moral values. In his November 12, 2021 Remarks on Religious Liberty at the University of Virginia 2021 Joseph Smith Lecture, and particularly in his December 14, 2001 speech at Sapienza University in Rome, Italy, titled Religious Freedom in an International Context, President Dallin H. Oaks champions religious freedom in global perspective. President Oaks notes, first, freedom of religion and belief as an essential condition for a free society, protected as a fundamental international human right including in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and elsewhere. Second, as we heard earlier, freedom of religion and belief are historically, philosophically, institutionally, and empirically foundational for other important rights. To buttress these points, President Oaks points us to speeches on religious liberty given by elders Quentin L. Cook at the Religious Liberty Summit at Notre Dame University and Elder D. Todd Christofferson at an Argentina Religious Liberty Forum. Further practical society uh, benefits of religious liberty include the promotion of pluralism and peace, respect and unity, the proper separation of church and state, and the generous provision by faith communities of, quote, critical services to society and its most disadvantaged members, end quote. If you haven't carefully studied President Oaks' full messages at the University of Virginia and University of Sapienza, I encourage you to do so. All these examples lend historic and global weight to the reality that church and church member commitment to religious liberty extends well beyond current American or political concerns. It's time to summarize. Robert Smith, BYU professor of church history and doctrine, what are some specific ways church members can support and advance religious liberty in our communities? In my experience, many members of the church are eager to help support religious freedom and moral values, but they're not quite sure what to do. Let me share some things that our prophets and apostles have taught that can help us all be involved in promoting religious freedom. One of those things is to become educated on the issues. Being at this symposium is a great start. In addition, our church website has a multitude of talks and videos and other instructions on what each of us can do to be involved personally in our communities. It really is a wealth of information. In addition, we've been taught that we should engage in the conversations to find solutions. We need to listen to others, but we also need to not be afraid to speak our mind. Every opinion is important, and even opinions that are based in religion are valued and welcomed in the public square. We have to be careful not to overstep our bounds, but we also need to be careful not to be too in intimidated to speak what we really believe. The third thing that we can do is we can lift where we stand. In other words, if we're involved in education, if we're our children in school, we can be involved with school matters. In our work, we can involve, be involved with work. 
or if we're involved in a community in social media, we can be involved in that community. All of us can be involved to help protect religious values and the morals that undergird them. Thank you, Bob, and each of our friends for adding historical and global perspective to our long-standing Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty. Again, while elements of Latter-day Saint concern for religious liberty are necessarily a practical matter, appropriately current American and political, the depth and scope of Latter-day Saint concern for religious liberty is wider, deeper, and more long-standing. When seen in historical and global his perspective, Church commitment to religious liberty is rooted in our core religious doctrine, fundamental to God's plan. Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty is manifest in our lived experience, religious practice, and statements of belief and practice from the time of the Prophet Joseph to church leaders and presidents today. And Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty is a practical reality and need as faithful church members seek to honor, obey, and sustain the law and contribute as good parents and good citizens in our communities and countries across the world. How grateful we are for the ways religious liberty benefits societies, families, and individuals, especially when understood in historical and global perspective we recognize why members and friends of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have and will consistently seek to support, preserve, and advance religious liberty in appropriate times and ways now and for future generations. May the Lord bless us in these efforts, I pray. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that we have been able to gather for this symposium. We're grateful for all of those who contribute, contributed their time and talents and efforts and expertise to make this possible and for the knowledge and inspiration we have received through their efforts. We are grateful for the religious liberty that we enjoy and that we can exercise our agency in accordance with our knowledge of the gospel, and we are grateful for prophetic guidance that helps us know how to be good citizens and good disciples in exercising that agency. We pray that thou wilt bless us as we depart, that we will act on the information that we have received and the inspiration that we have received and become wise advocates and protectors of religious freedom for all thy children across the world. And we pray for these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.